The reality is that business is really pretty easy. It's about making things and selling things. It's not about matrixes and cows and dogs and stars and pigs and horses and MBOs and ZBBs and PPBs and quality circles and job enrichment. It's about people. Welcome to this Listen and Learn program filled with useful information. This session is designed to sharply increase your awareness on the subject and give you ideas and knowledge that you can put to work right away. As with all Listen and Learn programs, you hear from the experts, people who have already been there and who have had success. We've structured the program to run under 45 minutes, which our research shows is the optimal listening period, so we won't take too much of your time. Of course, we can't hope to present everything there is to know in a short session like this, but we will give you all the important highlights so that you'll have a good overview when you've completed the session. For more information, listen to the message at the end of this cassette. Okay? Let's begin. Listen, learn, and enjoy. To tell you more about the material on this tape, here's Tony White, chairman of AMR International. AMR is a leading-edge management education company that teaches top executives through high-quality seminars, courses, and research projects. Tony? Tom Peters is a unique man. He's the founder and president of Palo Alto Consulting Center and teaches at Stanford University Graduate School of Business. What makes him truly unique and so qualified to discuss this subject is that he spent eight years with McKinsey and Company, the international management consulting firm. With McKinsey, he studied the factors that have made the great corporations really great. He's worked with major corporate clients around the world and his articles have appeared in the Harvard Business Review and the Wall Street Journal. His clients include such forward-thinking companies as Apple Computer, Digital Equipment, AT&T, Hewlett-Packard, Citicorp, and American Express. His book, In Search of Excellence, sold 125,000 copies in its first month after release. We're sure you're going to find his insights and experiences very relevant to your life and your career. Tom Peters. Well, the number one proposition that I begin with, and it certainly shouldn't be a strange one, but it apparently is, if you look back at the last 25 years of management theorizing, is the proposition that management counts. If you look back at the last quarter of a century, it seems to be as though every time there's a problem, management reaches for the excuse box, and we got plenty of them available. In you know, three or four years, it's the Arabs, and then the oil price falls, and we can't talk about them anymore. So then we go after Mr. Volcker for three or four years. Uh, the old whipping boys, if all else fails and Mr. Volcker isn't reappointed, we can go for EPA, OSHA, EEOC, uh, you name it. And it's sort of the enemy of the week. And we went through, of course, four or five years that I think will continue in being mad at the Japanese as well. But one thing American management seldom seems to do is ever look in the mirror and suggest or examine the proposition that perhaps management itself is some part of the issue. And I'd like to start out by putting a couple of stakes in the ground that aren't directly relevant to what follows, but to me they help frame the overall conversation. The airline industry is in trouble. It's as hard hit as any industry has been in this recession, probably even including cars. Tens of thousands laid off, Braniff dead, Pan Am dying, TWA not far behind. And yet as we all read at Christmas time, over 20,000 Delta employees chipped in about 30 million bucks to buy the company an airplane to say Merry Christmas Delta and thanks very much for not laying anybody off. Same industry. Maybe if you're like me and you're a little bit skeptical, though your business on that dimension is perhaps to be a little less skeptical, you said, well, that's nice Christmas good news story. About a month ago, I was flying on a Delta flight, I was chatting with a flight attendant about it and said, come on, what's, you know, it's mainly hype. Tell me the real truth. To which she responded with tears in her eyes as she described the process in particular of the rolling out of that plane onto the tarmac in Atlanta. And then in sort of a can you top this situation, about a week later I was flying from Atlanta to Dallas talking again to a flight attendant, which must be my habit, and she said, you might like to meet the fellow sitting in front of you. He's Tom Beebe, the chairman of Delta. And in fact, I had not met Mr. Beebe in the process of doing the interviewing for the book, and so I thought that would be a terrific idea, and did meet him, and he's a marvelous guy. And his eyes clouded over, 
when he described this process of the people of Delta buying him an airplane. And then he pulled a, can you top this on me? He says, a guy I'd like you to meet. He's sitting in front of us, one row. And so we went up and met this fella. He happens to be a pilot who retired from Delta last year. And after chatting with him a while, Bibi and I walked back to our seats and Tom said to me with amazement in his voice again, he said, do you know when George retired last year, he took a full page ad out in the Atlanta paper to say, thank you very much, Delta, for a super career. Now that's an aspiration. I mean, the problem is it's a little tough because that means for all of us who have people who work with us, if when they leave, they don't take full page ads out, you have to write yourself off as a failure. So I'm not sure I'm happy with Mr. Beebe. So that's the benchmark, that's Delta. Same industry as Braniff, same miserable conditions, crippling on all dimensions. They got the same Arabs raising fuel price for them as American and United and Braniff have. And yet that's the difference in response. Other stakes in the ground. Tough business, low margin, high control needs, exotic stuff, candy bars, dog food and rice, Mars Inc. If that's what you're making, you're in a very tough environment, you've got to control the daylights out of everything. We know that. That's what management's told us for a long time. Mars Inc., candy bars, rice, dog food, 60 divisions, $6 billion privately held company, extraordinary margins. 60% of their sales overseas in every location you can imagine. And somehow or other they control that monstrous 60 division international corporation with a staff of 20 officers and 20 secretaries in a building that doesn't even have a sign on it in McLean, Virginia. That's what we mean by lean staff. When the Ford Motor Company, the General Motors Company and numerous other American companies are literally dying under the weight of their overhead. Six billion dollar, high control, low volume, multinational, 60 division companies being run by 20 people. Management can make a difference. We ought to start looking in the mirror. Well, my findings. The issue that led Bob and I to this was not an issue, but a question. Is there such a thing as a large adaptive corporation in America? We thought it was an honest question, unfortunately. But the good news was that the answer in our view is clearly yes. But my God, is it tough. The enemy is size. Bigness is automatically badness unless you fight it every single minute of the day. In fact, the bigness threshold that I've now arrived at is five people. When you get above five, that entrepreneur starts disappearing slowly, drifting into the back room and losing touch with his people and losing touch with his customers. I mean, the reality is that despite the fact management consultants academics, and I play both of those, have both of those hats, so I'm double to blame, despite the fact that we've been peddling a bill of goods about how tough it is to manage in a complicated world, the reality is that business is really pretty easy. It's about making things and selling things. It's not about matrixes and cows and dogs and stars and pigs and horses and MBOs and ZBBs and PPBs and quality circles and job enrichment. It's about people and selling things and making things. But as I said, when those people get to be more than five in the same organization, we tend to retreat from that simplicity into a world of acronyms and complexity. Well, there's one other framing remark I'd like to make. The simplest conclusion of academic research in our own explorations in large, often not so well-run companies is that one and only one thing is crystal clear that I will agree upon that the academics have said, and that is that big organizations are unbelievably dumb it is really, really tough for anything big to get anything done. And as I look at that, in fact, that's your bailiwick. Not being dumb, but the issue I'm going to talk about in a second. Because what's special about IBM, Hewlett Packard, Caterpillar Tractor, Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, and here in the Bay Area, Mrs. Fields Cookies, is that those companies acknowledge the dumbness, and therefore they focus on trying to get a simple, single message through to, in IBM's case, 370,000 people. That's their only special magic. They got the message through. The customers, employees, suppliers, the works. A simple message. IBM means service. Quality service, cleanliness, and value at McDonald's. Their only edge. 24-hour part service anywhere in the world or Caterpillar pays at CAT. 
And so, in fact, there are two things we have to keep in mind. Keep it simple, stupid, the KISS principle. And then the really tough one, which again is your bailiwick, is there's only one tool to deal with keep it simple, and that is overkill. It turns out that there's nothing more complex in the world than keeping it simple in a very large organization. Well, I will run through in about 30 seconds the eight findings from the book, just to reiterate them from those of you, sadly, who may not have read it. In taping for the Today Show a few weeks ago, Bob Waterman and I learned how to say all the eight in 25 seconds, so I'm going to get that out of the way. The eight, orientation toward action, what we call the do it, fix it, try it bias, as opposed to the analyze it, complicate it, debate it to death syndrome. Close to the customers. These are not institutions that are driven by exotic, clever, end-run strategies. Again, organizations are dumb, and they don't pull off end-run strategies and they're not driven by sexy, sophisticated technology. IBM has not been a technology leader for 50 or 60 years. Occasionally a year here and there, but not across the board. They're driven by their customers. They're closer to their customers than anybody else. The third, autonomy and entrepreneurship. And by that, I don't mean divisionalization or decentralization or SBUs. I mean grants of practical autonomy to act as an entrepreneur to thousands, if not tens of thousands of people in the organization. The fourth is productivity through people. It's a motherhood. Everybody signs up for it. Not a corporation in America that doesn't tell you they're people-oriented. And yet when you look at the practices of a Hewlett-Packard, an IBM, a Johnson & Johnson, you see that they're markedly different, particularly in the degree to which they treat individuals with respect and dignity, demand contributions from them, demand ideas from them, and then do this most marvelous trait of all, they listen when suggestions are made and act upon them. The fifth is hands-on value-driven. By that we mean they are institutions that above all pay attention to a single or two at the most dominant driving values. And there's only one way to inculcate those values. Not by memo, not by policy manual, but in the field. Visible, hands-on. It's the only solution. Simple form and lean staff, no matrices. It's as simple as that. The matrix structure has done more harm to the United States economy than the Japanese has in the last 10 years. There's no such thing as a human being with five bosses and one fourteenth of a responsibility for a task who got committed to it in the history of mankind. The world of matrix exists. Of course it's a complicated world, but the companies on this list have found out ways to deal with that multidimensional complexity without the formal messy sloppy structure that goes with it. Stick to their knitting. We are no fans of the unrelated conglomerate organization. Mainly their performance stinks. They don't add much value to the economy. We're not talking about simple companies. 3M has got 100,000 products. Kodak's got over 50,000 photographic products alone. So we're not talking about simple companies, highly complex companies, but companies that stay close enough to what they know how to do to, in fact, remain in control of their destinies and not give it over to the accountants and the controllers and the lawyers. The eighth one, loose tight controls. By that we mean on the one side of the coin, remarkable rigidity. Violate IBM means service at your peril. But unbelievable looseness and room and space to innovate within the set of framework which just constitutes a couple of values. So that's the eight. I'm going to focus on three, the action orientation, subsuming a little bit of entrepreneurship under it, the customer and people. The chicken test. I'm sure all of you know what the chicken test is. Turns out in the aircraft engine business that high performance engines have to ingest birds, which makes sense because they fly in flocks and they're disrespectful of aircraft shapes. At some stage of the game, before you get an engine certified, you have to go out to your local grocery store, buy 20 or 30 gross of chickens. You put them into a big gun with about a six-foot diameter like this, and you fire the chickens at the aircraft engines. Rolls-Royce spent a quarter of a billion dollars in five years on a very sophisticated airplane engine, at which point they shot the chickens at it, and it failed. The issue, the action orientation, is getting your chicken test done in the middle of the third week for $75,000 instead of at the end of five years for a quarter of a billion dollars. In other words, do it, fix it, try it. 
whether we're talking about missiles, whether we're talking about communications campaigns, whether we're talking about salad oil changes at McDonald's or Burger King, virtually nothing can't be tried quickly and inexpensively and in a hands-on way with a live customer under live field conditions. And that's what the action orientation is all about. Not hiding under thousands of pounds of market research before he ever tested. As somebody said to me the other day in response to a phone-in and a radio show, the Edsel is the most market research product in the history of American industry. Probably only second to that Rolls-Royce engine. Well, so in fact, what we talk about then is the experimenting organization. The magic of the 3Ms, the digital equipments, the Hewlett Packards, the McDonald's, the Bloomingdale's, the PepsiCo's, the P&G's, is they get an idea they spend 25, 50, 75,000 bucks, not 20 million, build a prototype within the first 90 days, get a campaign scoped out within the first 30 days, and try it somewhere and see what the live visceral market reaction is. As the whole point of the book of the process we've observed is people have lost touch from the five person business to General Motors. And the whole antidote is somehow or other learning to stay in touch, and that means test it quickly with customers, real people, to find out what the real response is. The product, communication, accounts receivable program, whatever it is. So it adds up to this then. Ready, fire, aim. More tries. Learning by doing. We used to call it the experimental method, but I guess we don't anymore because the experimental method now consists of analyzing for six months doing market research by the thousands of a pound and then and only then testing it. And that's not the way to go. Well, the reason for this, the reason we argue for the experimenting orientation is just this. The Secretary of War in Britain said, we do not consider that airplanes will be of any use for war purposes in 1910. Some snide member of an audience last week suggested to me that the same guy said the same thing in 1940. I think that's unfair, if marginally. But the point and the reason for experimentation is that in everything, communication campaign, advertising campaign, new dressing, mainframe computer, software, steel plant, nothing ever works right the first time. One of the few books I've read on this subject, and it's amazing how few there are, is a book called The Sources of Innovation by a fellow by the name of John Jukes. Looks at 58 major innovations. 46 of them fully came from the wrong place at the wrong time by the wrong person in the wrong industry with the wrong user. Nothing ever happens according to plan. Typical is this. This is a study from a fellow at MIT. The incandescent lamp was introduced on board ship, and that kind of makes sense. You know, the, there was a place where you needed it for safety reasons. They had the gas lamp, so you put the incandescent light in. That's simple. Then next, in a move, that every market research department in the United States of America would have predicted it went to night baseball. On and on and on the story goes. Xerox introduces the 9200. They got a tower 29 stories high with MBAs in Rochester doing marketing studies. They predicted 70,000 unit sales the first year. Actual 6500, it's called an error. Good news. The 6,500 sold more copies by a factor of two than the 70,000 had been predicted to do. The damnable user doesn't respond the way that the communications program writer says he's supposed to, or the way that the market researcher says he's supposed to, or the way that the engineer says it's supposed to. He uses it in his own strange idiosyncratic style. Goes this far. My favorite student of the process of innovation in America is a fellow by the name of Brian Quinn at the Tuck School in Dartmouth. Quinn has studied for a quarter of a century some second-rate American companies, Bell Labs, Xerox, Polaroid, GE, IBM. He said this of one of the most second-rate of all. He said, not a single major product has come from the formal product planning process. The second-rate company is the International Business Machines Corporation. About three or four months ago, I was down in Philadelphia, and I had an audience of senior Bell System officers one fellow who's a vice president of an operating company put his hand up and he said, stop this presentation. He says, this is nonsense. He says, I don't believe it about IBM, but he says, that's irrelevant. I can't prove it. He says, I know that in the case of Bell Labs, this sort of stuff is not the case. So there happened to be the most respected of the Bell Labs vice presidents in the audience, a fellow by the name of Tommy Thompson. He says, Tommy, he says, you tell him. He says, you tell him about the labs. 
My heart went about 140 beats a minute as Tommy sat there scratching his chin for about 30 seconds, which seemed an eternity. He said, well, he said, I've only been at the labs for 35, 36 years, but he said, I can't think of anything that ever came out of the planning process. And so that's what we're dealing with. Well, if it's unplannable and it's tough, again, whether communications campaign or salad dressing change at Burger King, the only response, the only reply is numbers. The number one domestic oil explorer in the United States producer is no longer Shell, Exxon, Mobile, Gulf, Texaco, but a company that moved from the bottom of the pack to the top of the pack, a true cultural change in only a decade, Amoco, Standard Oil of Indiana. Their chairman was asked for his unique and spectacular secret of strategic success for a fortune cover article about a year or so ago to which he responded, we drill more wells. As is so often the case, the number two man was a little bit more articulate. He said, most favorable results were unforeseen by us or anybody else. That happens if you drill a lot of wells. <laughs> so that's what we mean. Now, what's the point of it all? The point is this. Who does this stuff? Who drills more wells? Who tries more campaigns? Who changes the salad dressing without telling anybody? Well, Peter Drucker says, whenever anything is being accomplished that is being done, I have learned by a monomaniac with a mission. And we find this to be exactly true. Whenever there's a business success, there is a champion, a turned on skunk works of five or six, they call them in the technology companies, of five or six or 10, or at the most 20 people who've done the impossible in a matter of weeks. Time and time again, that turns out to be the case. Skunk works. We discovered the reason that General Electric beat the socks off of General Motors in the locomotive business was because of some four-person group who, after being told four times by management, don't build a locomotive, that's all they needed. They built a locomotive. They took a large share of the market in the process, 80% of it away from GM. We found steel plants built offline without anybody telling management for all practical purposes, as insane as that sounds. So it's not just handheld calculators or pieces of software, but this turned on team notion is so crucial. One example that we came across that was used in the book from Westinghouse, ran into a fellow who ran much of their research facilities. Recall the story right after the war. General LeMay was chief of staff of the Air Force. LeMay was wandering through the engineering sites. He saw a sketch, pencil drawn, of something he thought was kind of neat, side-mounted radar, which may sound sort of old-fashioned right now, but apparently to those in the know, it was beyond the state of the art by a fair shot back in those days. So General LeMay, in his usual understated, quiet fashion, said, I like one of those. I like it in about 90 days. As if to suggest he was modestly serious, the next day he delivered in an unexpected fashion to Westinghouse an airplane with a sign on it, basically, that said, hang it on here, please. And what happened? Ninety days later, the world's first side-mounted radar, designed from a pencil sketch by a 15-person team, designed, built, debugged, prototype working. And that's what we see time and time again, the power, the very power of the turned-on group, the power of the champion. I find that this notion of the somewhat irrational, erratic, monomaniacal champion holds everywhere. You know, I said to myself, where wouldn't it hold? And I thought, well, the pristine world of science. And yet I came across a study of Nobel Prize winners. It said they give a few IQ points away to some of their brightest peers, but the terms normally used to describe them, peasant toughness, streak of brutality, good finisher, killer instinct. Now, please turn over the cassette to continue.
it holds in the world of sports too. The winners are seldom the people with the biggest biceps. They're the most persistent folks. Baseball, a fellow by the name of Bob Gibson made it into the Hall of Fame a couple of years ago. The New Yorker wrote about him. They said he had a very average arm, but he was a hell of a competitor. Their way of describing it, he had played several hundred games of tic-tac-toe with his young daughter, and she had yet to win a game. A couple of weeks ago down at Rome, to my amazement after a presentation, one of Rome's officers came up and introduced me to somebody and said, you'd probably like to meet this person. Turns out to be Charlene Gibson. That's how we really do this research. Charlene looks me in the eye and says she still hasn't won a game. And that's three years later. In fact, the stories go on and on like this. I gave a presentation to a bunch of bank presidents a couple of years ago. A fellow is a president of a bank from Milwaukee comes up to me afterwards. He says, your Gibson story's great, Tom. He says, I can top it. He says, my kid plays Little League Baseball with Warren Spahn's kid. And Spahn was a Milwaukee Braves pitcher who made it into the hall a couple of years ago. He says, a year and a half ago, father and son game, three innings. Spahn strikes out all nine Little Leaguers. <laughs> said, I asked him why he had to do it. He said, they got to learn how to be competitive early on. In fact, the problem is partially this. Mr. Jukes, again, says the most inventive spirits have confessed the constitutional aversion to cooperation. A large team is essentially a committee. Now, what I take out of that is the following. In fact, the really creative dynamos, the people who have the persistence, as Howard Head did, to build 40 pairs of skis before one worked, are generally a royal pain in the neck on their best days. And at some level, we've got to design our organizations and our institutions in fact, to pay attention to those people, to nurture them like the buds of spring, because nothing ever happened. Communication programs, salad dressing, change or locomotive building, unless there was one of these irritable, sometimes cranky people involved. The other part of that, and it's delightful to see it in the best run American corporations, is tolerance, if not exaltation, for practical, well-intentioned failures. General Dorio is the Fred Terman of the East Coast. He's the fellow who created Route 128 outside of Boston. And he said recently in address to Digital Equipment Corporation, if failure can be explained and it's not based on a lack of morality, then to me failure is acceptable. And it's a delight to see that the corporate philosophies of the Emerson Electrics, the 3Ms, the Digital Equipments, and the Hewlett Packards explicitly say major philosophical point value system is Support for well-intentioned, honest failures. Critically important for the whole process. Second half of the action orientation, my favorite. The only thing that Bob and I ever considered as an alternate title for the book. MBWA, thanks to the Hewlett Packard Company. Management by wandering around. They got as many MBWA signs at HP as they have think signs at IBM. And the issue is one that you know so well. There's only one way to stay in touch whether it's a 370,000 person corporation or a five person corporation, and that's to wander around and actually talk to people. There is no other solution. I had a fellow in a summer executive program at Stanford this year from Rockwell. He had had the unfortunate experience of having been in charge of much of the space shuttle tile program. He said, we broke the back of that problem after two years with an incredibly complicated management tool. He said every week was the same. You walk in on Monday morning, something had fouled up over the weekend. 24 hours later, there's a report from an engineering group blaming it on two other engineering groups of 75 page length. 48 hours later, like clockwork, there's the rebuttal from the group that had been blamed, blaming the first group and adding a few others along the way. He said, you know how we broke the back of it? He said, you gave me the language to explain this simple thing. So they took the 30 people from all over the country who were involved in the program. We met in the room on Friday from 3 p.m. until 10 p.m. And we engaged in long-term strategic planning, namely, what in the hell are you going to do between now and next Friday when I jam you all in this room for seven hours in the smoke-filled, rotten room from 3 p.m. until 10 p.m.? Six weeks, the back of the problem's broken. So you can lie like crazy with a 150-page report. You can lie pretty effectively with a 15-page report. You can't lie face-to-face talking to a colleague who you've been working with for 10 years and who you know you're going to be thrown into the same room with seven days later. He says, it sounds so expensive. But the reality is that form of communication is the cheapest form of communication there is. I tend to agree with him entirely. And in fact, we found wanderers of all sorts in these corporations. 
obsessive, ridiculous schedules. Ren McPherson turned the Dana Corporation around. He spent over 50% of his time on the road. During the 15 years he was chairman of ARCO and turned that company into a gem, Robert O. Anderson said to a friend of mine that he had guessed he averaged 500 miles a day on the road. That's a lot. But that's the way you take the message to the field. When Eddie Carlson took over at United Airlines and he was hell-bent and determined to turn that institution into a service-oriented institution and break the back of the over-papered bureaucracy, he and his entire top team spent 65% of their time on the road for 18 months. You wonder how Marriott pays attention to quality. Well, until about a year ago, old J. Willard Marriott Sr. in his 80s was reading tangibly, palpably, every complaint card from every customer in the company. That's what we mean by MBW, a visceral contact with the market. Yes, the market research department is important. Yes, the statistical summaries are important. But real, tangible, palpable, live data is what's really vital. Is one of my senior Sloan students said sadly to me the other day about General Motors, he said if one of those companies had moved to the West Coast in the early 70s, we wouldn't have the problems we're having today. He said you couldn't have driven down the highways in San Francisco, out Bay Shore, in the 70s and not become aware of the fact that there were these things called Japanese cars. He said all the market research data in the world, tons of it, doesn't count if you're driving down the highway to work and it happens to be a freeway outside of Detroit where everybody is required to buy a company car and you look to your left and you look to your right and you say every one of them I see is still buying them and he said then when you drive home you drive home in the company limo that's been serviced by 25 people and you say boy mine still works <laughs> that's the problem and that's the enemy that's the enemy is bigness is, is abstraction or this Simple stuff is really the key. Simple stuff. Fellow who's designed a fantastic computer. He's got to be the most intellectual, PhD, abstract, theoretical electron chaser in the history of mankind. But how did he stay in touch? His words here I bought my uncle an outlet, and I spent my weekends incognito with customers learning what people really think of these things. Visceral, palpable, tangible, they ought to be the words that are on everybody's lips. MBWA ought to be everybody's sign in a company larger than five people. The customer orientation, more of the same. No magic to any of this stuff in any sense whatsoever. Joe Girard, world's number one car salesman, 11 years in a row. Ten of them, he sold more than twice as many cars as the number two person. His magic, he cared about his customers, and he sent out... 13,000 cards a month to aunts, nieces, uncles, nephews, in-laws, kids when they became 16, birthday cards, Christmas cards, Easter cards, Columbus Day cards, Veterans Day cards, President's Day cards, Chinese New Year cards. He kept in touch. He told them Joe loved them. I've owned cars for 25 years now, and I can't remember the last time anybody who sold me one ever communicated with me. I bought a personal computer two years ago and nobody's ever communicated with me. Customer orientation is about simple courtesy, nothing more. I'm amazed. I have these debates with my students and they say barriers to entry, which is a sophisticated economic term that we usually think of in terms of plants. They say service can't be a barrier to entry. Good God, anybody can do that. Anybody could, but nobody does. And so the special traits of the J&Js and the Procter and & Gambles and the Joe Girards and the Frito-Lays and the Mary Kays and the Tupperwares and the Mars, the McDonald's, is a smile. And apparently a smile is much harder to replicate than a $350 million plant. At least that's what I'm certainly coming to believe. Because this is what it's all about. I'm a very sophisticated market researcher. I stopped at my co-op store in Palo Alto. Generic toilet paper, four rolls, one ply, 220 square feet, 79 cents. Two blocks away is a 7-Eleven. Procter & Gamble Charmin, one ply, four rolls, 220 square feet, a buck 99. One dollar and 20 cents was added to a 15 cent product by a channel of distribution of slightly better quality and a whole different perception about what P&G is peddling. That's value added. If this stuff doesn't need to be a commodity, then nothing does. 
And with pure audacity, they've done it. Nothing more than that. IBM, the same story. One term I'll talk about, full liability. I don't believe in it. Nobody else could do it but IBM. But again, it's Joe Girard. It's intensity of customer concern. If I inherited one of your company's computer accounts as a senior IBM account rep and I walked in next Monday morning, you greeted me with the marvelous news, Tom, taking out some IBM machinery. We're all good analytic business people here, so we know what that means. I didn't do it. That fellow who was my predecessor as account rep was asleep at the switch a little bit for the last couple of years, out on the golf course a little bit too much. But IBM doesn't see it that way. They say, Tom, my boy, we have perfect sympathy for you, to be sure. Our concerns are your concerns. But out of your commission and out of your salary, as in S-A-L-A-R-Y, salary, comes the full value of all commissions earned on that equipment while it was in place in your company. As the corporate vice president for marketing said at IBM, naturally enough, his name is Buck Rogers. What else would it be? He said it's one of our little ways of trying to get people to pay attention to today's customers. In fact, when I first heard him say it was down in Tucson with the 20 officers who run Citicorp, and when he made that comment, much like my Bell experience, the soft-spoken Walter Riston, who was there, put his hand up. And he says, Buck, he says, come on. He says, what if you had Chrysler as an account? Rogers looks him in the eye and he says, Walt, you probably wouldn't have had a very good year. And so what we find systematically is the following. The winners, with the exception of a half a dozen resource-based companies like Arco, Exxon, Amoco, who in fact have to find it for less dollars a barrel than the next guy, the winners are the people who pay attention to the revenue line. They add value, quality, service, reliability, and nichemanship. 65 out of 70 companies were revenue line focused. They were not the low-cost producers. They were cost competitive as is an HP, a Caterpillar, a Digital, an IBM, but they were not the low-cost producers because there's not a company in America, as far as I can tell, that can walk and chew gum simultaneously. If you're spending 80% of your managerial time counting paper clips, you're not spending time paying attention to customer service and quality in the next generation of product. It's as simple as that. As my favorite stories are these, not the Hewlett Packards and the Wangs and the Decks with a little bit of technological edges, but the places where it can't be done. I love this company. Two and a half billion dollars worth of potato chips and pretzels. And they got an 80 share in two thirds of the United States. And they got margins that are the best in the industry. You can't do that. Two days in a microeconomics course and two hours in a strategy course and you know you can't do that. You're not allowed to. You can have share, you can have margin, but you can't have both. You sure can't have both in potato chips. And yet they do it because they were audacious to set a level of service that's absolutely unimaginable. 99.5% service level means that whether you're mom and pop gas station in Missoula, Montana, or the flagship Safeway in Oakland, California, there's a 99.5% chance that that little Frito root truck, the white thing, will stop by at least once a day. Computer companies don't do that for you. And when he gets there, he's a little IBM salesman, he solves problems sets the end displays, cleans up after the flood, does anything. It's not the most you can think of. Don't sell food, sell peace of mind. Surely we could not be talking about the undifferentiated gravy and meatball business, and yet we are. It's got to be the rottenest business in the world. Cisco, two billion dollars. Multi-hundred person industry, largest share, 20% growth, equity returns in the 20s, in the undifferentiated potato and gravy business, saying don't sell food, sell peace of mind. They got those returns by audacious service in a business where most companies hire a big gun, put it on their warehouses and fire the stuff into their customers' operation. And they hired 2,000 marketing associates to service their 99,000 clients and give levels of service previously, heretofore, unheard of in an industry like that. And so that's what we mean by audacity. Archie McGill said it better than anybody I know. He says the customer perceives service in his own terms. The customer doesn't care about the service manuals. 
for the engineer's desires. Customer cares about his own silly little idiosyncratic perception of the company, the product, whatever. As Joe Girard, the car salesman, liked to say, I want to sell you a lemon, because then you can see how I'll produce with the service department. Not silly, in retrospect. The customer perceives it in his own terms. Nobody cares about your manuals, and yet we act as if that was the case. Well, I'm going to finish up with a couple of comments about people. I love RMI titanium, too. I can't conceive of it. I'm not enough of a Midwesterner, I guess, having spent most of my time on both coasts. Niles, Ohio, garden spot of America. Titanium business, nice, clean, sweet business. UAW all over the place, as in 100%. And yet they won the Midwest like this. Big Jim Daniel, ex-captain of the Cleveland Browns football team in the 40s, just retired a couple of months ago. Plants are loaded with signs that say, when you meet a man without a smile, give him one of yours. Out in front of the Niles, Ohio, the town was, of course, renamed Smiles, Ohio, you know, it goes on and on and on. Out in front of the Smiles, Ohio plant is the American flag about 100 by 100, and the Smile flag 100 by 100 flying below it. And EMBWAs all over the place. He says he spends 70% of his time wandering around in a golf cart talking to his people. He certainly never went to any program I taught in at Stanford or Harvard or Penn State. Not allowed to do that if you're president of anything or any senior manager. And with all that, with nothing more than caring, he was able to increase productivity by 78% in three years and get his UAW grievance backlog down from 300 on average to 20 with a bunch of smile signs and the like. My favorite productivity story comes from my ex-dean, wonderful friend, pure inspiration, Ren McPherson of the Dana Corporation. This was the heart of Ren's communication program. This came out of time, I believe. Talk back to the boss. Ren didn't figure that he could ever change the culture of middle management, and so he took his message about caring about people to the field, to the people said the response when he ran this ad nationally was amusing. He said he got pained and aggrieved calls from his first-line supervisors and middle managers. They said, Ren, we've had eight of these things tacked on the door since Friday. He said, you're starting to get the message. And his effort was a simple effort to turn the company back to the people who do the work. That was the focus of everything, radical decentralization. His heroes were his plant managers, not his staff managers. And he gave them the tools. He decentralized personnel, legal, accounting, finance, to let them get the job done. And the story that's so poignant in my own mind comes from my first meeting there. One of the folks in the audience, the meeting group, half dozen people, was the vice president for personnel. It's a $3 billion company now, you know, big deal. And so in that fantastic, well-trained, incisive, to-the-point manner that consultants are trained, I said to this guy early on, I said, how many people work for Dana? You know, that kind of question for which we're so well known in our trade, right to the heart of the matter. Their VP of personnel replied to me, he says, I don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? He says, you're so damn bright. He said, if I told you 42,311 people, or if I told you 39,614, he says, what difference would it make to you? I said, none. He said, me either. It's a message well worth remembering. Well, the people orientation to me is about the trivia that adds up to caring. Things like this, exotic tools, techniques. This is a formal Eastern company. Or if it's not a formal Eastern company, it's a Marin County company that makes movies. It's a Lucasfilm. You know, laid back Maronites, movie industry. And yet, even there, they know that they can't beat the rap without MBWA. And so these are the kind of rules they have at Lucasfilm. Their company-sponsored softball teams will have no two people from the same department on the same team. People got to talk to each other. These are the devices that won the West. Not the exotic techniques, but stuff like this or running into that chairman of a large high technology company who said his grandest accomplishment of the last few months was to change the tables from round four person tables to army mess benches with 15 people around them. 
We were dumbfounded. He said at the long tables, new people may run into each other, talk to each other, communicate with each other. He said the little round tables, the same four people have been eating together for 20 years eat together. He considered that a major strategic breakthrough. And so do I, because that's the way the game is won, not by the sophisticated bureaucratic procedure. And it's words, words, words. The only time I've ever seen McPherson purple was over a word. I loved those Ford ads that said quality is job number one. And Wren came in and talked to my MBAs last year. In the middle of his presentation, I had been touting those ads. He pulls the ad out of his briefcase. He says, look at this crap, at which point I slid underneath my desk. He says, they call them workers and employees. He said, why not people? He said, everybody at Dana is a people. And we found the same thing in company after company. Crew members at McDonald's, cast members at Disney, associates at JCPenney and Walmart, everybody at Digital, from secretary hired yesterday to chairman is called an individual contributor. It's my thousands probably by now of white foundry stories. Companies turned around when a bucket of paint was applied. Ran into a fellow from Western Electric a few weeks ago, turned the plan around. Fantastic expenditure, about $3,000. He asked people what they wanted. They wanted an awning over the door because the rain comes in and gets people wet in the morning and falls off the roof. The second one was the real backbreaker. They wanted a second phone in the snack bar area. Because a lot of the women who work there have kids at home who are sick. They want to check and see how they're doing. And then the third one, the third shift demanded two more lights in the parking lot. And that was it. No retooling, no robots, no new plant, no new work agreement with you, with the communication workers, just that. What was going on, of course, was something a lot more. He listened. It's the first person who listened in 25 years in that plant. And he literally turned around the labor situation there in about six months for $3,000 and a bucket of white paint and an awning over the door. I've got thousands of stories like that. Sarah Clifton, Supreme Commander. Sarah works in a $250 million chemical company called W.L. Gore. They're the makers of Gore-Tex that you've probably seen in your sportswear. Sarah works on the line in a chemical company. But Bill Gore's approach is simple. He says, Sarah, what do you want to be? Sarah wanted to be a Supreme Commander. That's her calling card. Why not? Why not? Why do we have to spend tens of thousands of consultant dollars inventing titles like Senior Executive Vice President Prime? Sarah wanted to be a Supreme Commander. And you better believe that the W.L. Gore company has got a reputation with people that's probably unmatched and surely unmatched in the chemical business. And it's because of that. It's people like Sarah Clifton. McPherson stated it nicely. In fact, he says the manager's job is to keep the bureaucrats out of the way of the productive people. The flip side of that was nicely stated by a Rome senior officer who said the leader is not a devil's advocate, he's a cheerleader. That's the world of Sarah Clifton and Tupperware songs, whether they're sung in Silicon Valley or Pittsburgh. And so this all boils down to the obsessive company, the company that tries to get that single value through to often hundreds of thousands of people that does the impossible and does in fact communicate it. Ray Kroc built an institution in an unexciting market. And this is where he starts. He says, you gotta be able to see the beauty in a hamburger bun. Love of the product and love of the people is what it's all about. He's in good company. Old man Forrest Mars, not only does he not have bureaucracy, but he loves his product. He spends 50% of his time wandering around the streets, popping into corner stores and looking at the M&M displays, because he thought that's the most important contribution he could make to a $6 billion company. And when he found one he didn't like, his typical response was to go to the offending factory where it had been made, get himself a carton of those M&Ms, bring them into the weekly officer's operating meeting and throw the M&Ms at his officers one at a time. <laughs> Marriott read his cards. When Herman Lay came to talk to a sophisticated bunch of Stanford MBAs a few weeks ago, he started out with five minutes waxing eloquent about the potato, the perfect potato, and IBM's magic, which has crushed Burroughs and a bunch of other companies. 
IBM's magic brings to mind one and only one picture to me. Old Tom Watson in 1890 in Western New York State in painted post, peddling pianos to farmers in a depression worse than this. That's where he learned sizzle and service. And that's what's been the distinguishing feature of that company ever since. Or to end up with true sophistication, my students last year studied Robert Crone's shoes in the town and country shopping center in Palo Alto. Shoe business is pretty damn mundane. Somehow or other, Robert Crone is getting about five times more sales per square foot than the average in that mundane business. And he loves his shoes. And he loves the feet he serves. And he loves the people who work for him. And that's his special magic. Or the continued special magic of strategic sophistication, a fitting place to end with Debbie Fields. I am not a businesswoman, I'm a cookie person, says Debbie. And she's a hell of a cookie person. It's now a $40 million company still growing at 125% a year. And that's what it's all about. It's about people who are cookie persons, people who love their shoes, people who love their hamburgers, and people who care about the people who make them. Thank you very much. Before we sign off, we want to invite you to send us your comments and suggestions for other programs you'd like to see. In return for writing us, we'll send you our latest catalog listing all of our materials. Just send your comments to Listen and Learn, P.O. Box 396, Old Greenwich, Connecticut, 06870. Thanks for listening. We'd be happy to listen to you, too. Most of these things take less than one minute, but most of us don't have enough time to get all the things done we want to get done. And we've designed a very simple way to get results very quickly. It's a way to make sure you know exactly what you're doing, write it on a single sheet of paper, check your behavior against your goals to make sure that you're actually doing what you say is important. You see if your behavior matches your goals. Oftentimes you'll see in your appointment calendar, they don't match your goals. Most of us forget it. But if you can read it in a minute, you're apt to read them every morning. Feedback is really the breakfast of champions that the one minute manager says. How often in this country do we catch each other doing something wrong? Almost nobody catches someone doing something right. And it's very powerful. People that feel good about themselves produce good results. Welcome to this Listen and Learn program filled with useful information. This session is designed to sharply increase your awareness on the subject and give you ideas and knowledge that you can put to work right away. As with all Listen and Learn programs, you hear from the experts, people who have already been there and who have had success. We've structured the program to run under 45 minutes, which our research shows is the optimal listening period. So we won't take too much of your time. Of course, we can't hope to present everything there is to know in a short session like this, but we will give you all the important highlights so that you'll have a good overview when you've completed the session. For more information, listen to the message at the end of this cassette. Okay? Let's begin. Listen, learn, and enjoy. To tell you more about the material on this tape, here's Tony White 
chairman of AMR International. AMR is a leading-edge management education company that teaches top executives through high-quality seminars, courses, and research projects. Tony? It seems to me that the one-minute manager is a person who learns how to direct his activities and his people with three basic concepts, one-minute goals, one-minute praisings, and one-minute reprimands. One-minute goals to concentrate on the 20% of the activities which generate 80% of the results. One-minute praisings to keep people motivated and achieving. And one-minute reprimands to separate the person and his behavior to get feelings out on the table right when they're needed. A way to manage effectively with a minimum of time. This concept of the one-minute manager was developed by Ken Blanchard, Ph.D., and Dr. Spencer Johnson. Ken has been a professional management trainer for over 15 years, working with corporations both large and small. Spencer is a well-known physician and author whose books have sold over 7 million copies. What do you really think is the most important problem and challenge in American organizations today? One is productivity. That is how much work gets done and what the quality of work is like. That's one problem is productivity. The second problem is, is job satisfaction, that people really do enjoy their work. They stay with us so we can reduce the training costs and the turnover costs, the absenteeism and the illness costs. So those two things, productivity, and job satisfaction. The one minute manager feels that people who feel good about themselves produce good results, so the two are really connected. Why is there so much excitement about your book, The, the One Minute Manager? Well, I think it's because a lot of people view it as a practical answer. It takes uh, a very short period of time to read. It's a very small book, as you know. And it's got three practical secrets in it, three practical management skills that really work. Yes, the three secrets are uh, one minute goal setting, one minute praising, and one minute reprimand. The one minute goal setting has to do with making it clear to people what they're being asked to do and making it clear to them what good behavior looks like so there's no kind of guessing on that. Why, why is that such a difficult thing? When we ask people what they do and we ask their boss, we find we get two completely different answers. So it seems obvious, but they don't speak. And mm -hmm. so what the key on the one minute manager's goal setting, the one minute goal setting, is that you get the person to write them down. And they write them down so the manager and the subordinate can both read and reread them so that they can check the person's behavior against their goals to see if they, they really match. And so Some people may have been told what they were supposed to do months or last year, but they have forgotten what their goals are. And if you ask them later, they don't know. The advantage of a one-minute goal is that you can write it down in a format, 250 words. You can read on a single sheet of paper. You can read it in a minute or less. Every morning, you can begin your morning, take a look at your goals. Look at your behavior, for example, your appointment calendar. See if your behavior matches your goals. If they don't, change your behavior. Sounds like an excellent feedback mechanism, too, for follow-up, for the boss and subordinate yes. follow-up. This feedback is really the breakfast of champions that the one-minute manager says, and the way you get really motivated is getting feedback and results and goal setting really sets it up. The second secret is one minute praising because the one minute manager feels that the key to developing people is to catch them doing things right. How do you catch somebody doing something right, Ken? Well, once you have the goals clear, they know what they're being asked to accomplish, what you have to do if they're learners in the beginning is watch them closely so that you can give them feedback. Mm -hmm. You told them what to do, now watch it. See if you can catch them doing something right. And when you catch them, then you go to the praising. And Spencer, why don't you share about the steps to the praising, because they're very precise. Yes, and if you're going to wait until they do it perfectly right, you may wait a very long time. So what you want to do is catch people doing things approximately right, especially new employees or employees starting a new task. It's very powerful. And all you do is you tell the person what they did and how you feel about it. Not what you think about it, but how you feel about it. Uh, for example, Dr. Blanchard, your report was due uh, 2 o'clock on Thursday, and you turned it in at 11 o'clock. It was beautifully written. It allowed me to have the entire afternoon to review it, and I want you to know I feel great about that. I mean, I feel great. What'd that take? 30 seconds? And yet, how seldom do we tell each other that? You know, I'm, I'm familiar with the DuPont Corporation, and they make a special effort of giving someone a salary increase within six months of starting their their job rather than the normal period which would be a year. The whole idea is that we really appreciate you. We made the Good. right decision. And I'll bet they find that the productivity of those people mm -hmm. is higher than the ones we wait on for a year. One of the general managers from one of the Holiday Inns that I worked with 
came up to me recently and he said, I want to tell you what I did after hearing about the woman at manager. He gave a system out where he gave every guest in the hotel a praising form or a little almost like a, a ticket that he asked them when they checked in to give this away to some employee during their stay. Oh, neat. And yeah, uh, good job that they me. felt good really idea. did what they they thought was a fine job of servicing customers. And uh, it just got to be tremendous. And every time a person was given a ticket, they had to come to the manager to get $5. Each ticket was worth $5 oh to an employee. God. And they came to the manager, and he would give them an additional praising to go Great. with it. Now, he had to set up some some people so that they would get the people behind the scenes, you know. So they had some people say, could you mind if I go back into the kitchen? And they'll go and they'll say to the dishwasher, you know, I've eaten four meals here in two oh days. And I haven't seen one piece of silverware that that wasn't clean and all, and I wanted you to give you this That's little... That's terrific. Say, and he said what, what it's done. Like? Tremendous. I mean, he said they have been tracking the customer service. Uh, they have a form in Holiday Inns they fill out and they just haven't have been having any negative kind of stuff because everybody's trying to see who can get there. Isn't that great? See, that's what happens. When you start, that's a great story. Mm -hmm. When you start catching people doing something right, which none of us really have been trained to do. I mean, my first reaction to that as a physician is, you well, know, that sounds a little bit humanistic. And I find that a little hard to identify with sometimes. But the reality is when we do it, it gets great results, doesn't it? We all want to be caught doing something right, don't we? Mm -hmm. the, the thing that's fascinating is that endorphins, biochemicals in the blood, and encephalins literally rise in the bloodstream when people have good thoughts. And it literally produces energy. People that feel good about themselves do produce good results. And by God, we need good results in this country. Well, Spencer, one of your interests is how to reduce stress with yes. respect to the one-minute manager. Could you tell us a little bit about how that works? Well, the American work environment is probably the most stressful environment that any human being can be placed in, and it's chronic. It goes on day after day after day, and we think there are several things that, that uh, create the stress. One of the most common ones is anxiety, fear of the unknown. Anxiety is tremendously reduced with this one-minute goal technique, where you can read your goals in one minute every morning. You know what's expected. You know what your boss expects. And just knowing what's expected of you lowers anxiety. It lowers the unknown. The second thing is with one-minute praisings, these biochemicals that literally shift in your blood uh, give you energy. When someone comes in and praises you, you want to do more. Well, that lowers blood pressure, lowers heart rate, pulse rate, and the organic lesions that come about from stress, uh, gastric ulcers, diverticulitis, whatever, drop when men and women can work in an environment that is enjoyable. And the last one is, on the one-minute reprimands, when you can express your anger instead of bearing it, or your frustration or your resentment with an employee, and when they can have their guilt or anxiety relieved because you've called them on it, those things make such a difference in reducing stress. And when you get stress out of the way, you can then go on to a peak performance. I have been working with the Richmond Refinery of Chevron, which is the biggest Chevron refinery and second biggest in the country. And in our initial diagnosis, one of the problems that came out really clearly was burnout. A lot of stress, uh, people working long hours and all. And uh, Bob Davis, who was the general manager there, became a great believer in the one minute manager. And everywhere he went, he was giving people copies of the book. And they bought over 500 copies. All their managers were there and we've trained the people there and the environment really got to be fun because people were able to share their feelings both positive and negative and uh, Bob Davis now has been promoted to be president of Chevron Chemical and when I called him to graduate him he said well I want to thank you he said because what I learned from the one minute manager and these concepts have made a tremendous difference in my whole way of managing and last night I had dinner uh, with Kent the new general manager of the plant that took over from Davis and he said I came here and he said I've never seen a place like this in terms of the way people are interacting and the humor and the, the caring and all and he said I asked people I said what's what's going on around here and they said haven't you heard about the one minute manager yet it is rewarding because you get to see them quickly you know at first you're not going to feel comfortable doing the one minute praising and neither is your employee but you, you might share some thoughts on uh, the best way to put them at ease where they trust it more where you you tell them up front what you're going to do. 
You know, the, uh, the key thing with it is to share the concept so that everybody knows what the story is. People, when you first start to praise them, they will discount it. You know, they'll say, oh, I didn't do anything, and you'll see their eyes go to the floor. Ah, the reason why we're not very good at receiving praisings is we haven't gotten many. Where if you reprimand somebody, their eyes are right on you, they believe you, and all that. But when everybody understands the concepts and knows you're going to catch them doing things right, then they relax and, and start to laugh at their own embarrassment, and they won't discount it as much. It seems to me that one of the three key secrets of one-minute management is the one-minute reprimand. Spencer, could you give us an example of a one-minute reprimand? Jim, you know that your report is supposed to be in Thursdays at 1 o'clock. Mm -hmm. This is Friday morning. It still isn't in. This is the second week it's happened. And I want you to know I am annoyed. Mm -hmm. Annoyed. I also want you to know you're better than that. Last week, you turned him in on time. It was well written. I need you. You're one of our best people. Let's not let this happen again. You are good. Your last behavior was not. Mm -hmm. Now, Ken, could you describe for us what Spencer was doing there? He was honest. He was specific. He told me how he felt about it. And then what he did is he kind of paused, let the thing settle in. And then the most important part of the reprimand is that he made sure that I knew that I was good, and it was the behavior that he was angry with, not me as a total performer. That's a key to this whole stuff. You've got to be honest and simple. That's the kind of reprimand that you don't think so much about how he treated you. Then you start thinking about what you did. So that last part, reassuring the person that they're OK, their behavior is not OK. Then it's a very safe thing to express your anger, because you're going after the behavior, but you must uh, prop up the person. You don't reprimand somebody who's just learning because you will immobilize them. What you do with them is when you can't even catch them doing something approximately right, you're back to goal setting and you start the process mm -hmm. again. Because they may not understand what's expected. You use the reprimands very seldom. It takes a while or it takes some practice to be able to express goals. And some jobs are fairly complicated, perhaps, in a 250-word document. Ken, you've been working with managers for 15, 20 years now. What's the life cycle, the, the learning curve of that kind of thing? Well, what you have to do first is get them to realize that you don't want them to write 100 goals. See? That's the biggest problem. So priorities is part of it. Absolutely. You know, what are, what are the top say, like when I get on a plane, you know, tonight and fly out of, New York, I don't really care that the pilot knows everything about the plane, but I want to know how to take off and land. And so what you're saying to the people is we're not going to write tons of goals. One minute manager says 80% of what's important and what's productive comes from 20% of your activities. Once we get to that, we find that in about a half hour to an hour, we can get any manager to identify their key, key performance areas and start to say how they can tell they're going to do a job. Because they don't get overwhelmed. They say, oh my god, it's not going to be one of these big goal setting things where we're going to spend days and days on it. What we're going to do is say, what makes a difference and how do you know? Spencer, what major mistakes can a manager avoid and what should he avoid when he's first learning these three new one minute management skills? The biggest mistake you can make is to believe that you have to do it really well in order to be successful. And that's a mistake because none of us do these things really well because we don't do them very often. So when you're first learning to, for example, give someone a one minute praising, you probably won't do it real well. But the nice thing is to bring in your people, people who report to you, tell them what you're going to do up front. Don't just start using the method because it will not be trusted. They'll think, oh my God, he's gone to some new seminar, he's heard some new tape, but geez, now he's going to try some new management technique. Give him a copy of the one minute manager, tell him to read it and say, this is what we're going to do and why we're doing it. Then tell them up front, listen, I haven't been letting you guys know how you're doing. You gals know how you're doing. And I'm going to try and do a better job of that, because it's, it's a lot easier if you know what, you know, how you're doing. I'm going to tell you when you're doing well, I'm going to tell you when you're doing poorly. And I'm not going to do it real well at first. So if I give you a praising and it doesn't sound quite right to you, it'll get better, because this is the way we're going to do it. Just using it. Confucius says the essence of knowledge is having it to use it. Just use these three techniques. They will get better every week. So I'd say the biggest mistake is thinking you have to do it too well. Just start using these three simple methods and you will find that you'll get incredible results. What I would advise uh, managers is to remember that good performance, good productivity, is a journey, not a destination. And that just saying to somebody, here's your goal, 
which is performance planning, and then expect to sit back and to come back six months later and evaluate everything going fine is crazy. The movement day -day from process. the goal to being able to evaluate high performance is a journey. And I think that the One Minute Manager and the three secrets of the One Minute Manager can really show them techniques to move the journey towards the destination. The three skills seem so simple. Why are they so effective? That's a good question. I think one of the real problems with anything that seems so simple is it seems unbelievable. They're so effective for several reasons. Number one, it's honest. It's a very honest and uh, simple system. It's effective because it takes very little time. And it's effective because once you make the investment up front, you practically don't have to manage these people. It's extraordinary. They then become one minute managers. For example, let's say you haven't made it clear what you expect of your people, or you've told them briefly in an offhanded way last month. You are going to be into rescue and salvage operations for months trying to get the things done. If you sit down with your people, you make it very clear what you expect. You ask them to write it in a one-minute goal format. That means on a single sheet of paper, less than 250 words, anything that takes a minute to read. Bring it back to you. Take a look at it. You know, when they're going to get it done and have an agreement on it. Put it in the first person and put it in the present tense as though it's already happening. It becomes effective, even though it's simple, because it becomes a visualization. Every morning you read that you have done or are doing this. Every morning you read this. Believe me without even consciously thinking of it, your work starts focusing towards that objective. Now, please turn over the cassette to continue. Another reason that it is so efficient is because after you put it clearly on writing and you ask them to read it every morning, you show them what good behavior looks like. If you want a job done, don't just tell them to go do it. Now this sounds like it takes time. It does only at first. You take them and show them someone doing that job well. Let's say it's a gal who's going to learn a word processor or something. Take her over and have her watching someone working a word processor. Let her visualize the job successfully done. You make these kind of investments, and then you stay with her closely, and you catch her doing it right. Let's say she's tried three things and she made two mistakes. Don't mention it. Just let the mistakes go for now. Remember, she's a learner. When she pushes that right button and brings up that right thing in the computer, just say, you know what? You were looking for this. You pushed button F, and it came up. And I want you to know that you know it's terrific to see someone learning so fast. That's marvelous. Touch them. Touch is very powerful. Just briefly, just a touch at the elbow or anything to let them know that you're with them, you're on their side. Well, you will be amazed how many more correct computer buttons get pushed. So it's very, very effective because it taps into the nature of people. Mm -hmm. How does the one minute manager increase his own personal success? I mean... Well, the fun part about this is, of course, is that the better your people look, the better you look. If you, for example, are uh, one of a head of a department and all of a sudden in the last four months your department has become a more productive and b the people are laughing more and smiling and enjoying themselves they're working they're enjoying being at work and the uh, productivity charts show your department at the top and guess who gets the next promotion your prosperity rises first of all you feel prosperous emotionally because you feel like you're running your job your job isn't running you anymore we are all overwhelmed with information overload these three little simple one-minute manager secrets can take a lot off your back. So you start to feel prosperous emotionally. Your employees, ironically, this isn't why you're doing it, but it's one of the payoffs, start feeling better about you. The rapport, because you're starting to treat them like people. They like you better. They respect you better. They know you're going to nail them on their bad behavior, but they appreciate your praises and your clarity. And then you do better financially because your people do better. I would think this whole concept of one-minute goals, one-minute praisings, one-minute reprimands could be used in all kinds of different ways. Ah, that's Children, a very good point. With spouses, with, with customers, with suppliers. Yes, that's, that's, that's marvelous, with customers, suppliers, with friends. 
with anyone. Uh, you might be interested in knowing how this whole uh, one minute thing came about. I was a divorced father and didn't get to spend very much time with my boys. So the time I spent with them was very important to me and I didn't want to spend all my time parenting them or disciplining them. So I really was looking for a faster, better way of doing this. And a child psychiatrist, Jerry Nelson in Del Mar, taught me the one minute scolding method, which he invented for really aberrant behavior kids, really antisocial kids, including a child who literally burned his parents' house down. I mean, that kind of aggressive anger behavior. And something as simple as one minute scoldings changed those kids' behavior, if you can imagine that. He taught me this for my children who would like get up at night and ask for a glass of water 500 times. <laughs> they were driving me nuts. So uh, I was doing very well. I was using the one minute scolding very well until one day, I, and my kids' behavior did improve dramatically. They behaved much better. I went into a supermarket store and my two and a half year old son started whining. I want this. Well, just that sound of a whining child is like fingernails on a blackboard to me. It drives me nuts. So I gave him my, you're going to get it now look. And he looks at me and he smiles and lights up like a Christmas tree and says, scolding daddy, scolding? And I go, oh no, this is not working out too well. The kid's enjoying it. What was he enjoying? He was enjoying getting my full attention for a minute. Dad is here and whatever it takes. So I took him outside the supermarket and gave him a scolding. He was good. But that day I invented, I said, that's the last time my kids got to misbehave in order to get my attention. So that's when I invented one minute praisings. And as Ken has put it so well since I have met him, I'm catching my kids doing something right. Well, the first day I said, Emerson Johnson, get over here. I saw what you did. And you could see the poor little guy's mind going, did I hang up the towels in the bathroom? Did I, you know, and I said, uh, I got in in physical contact with him for a minute and I said, Emerson, I saw you share that candy bar with your brother and I want you to know how good that makes me feel. I really feel good about that. Come here and I gave him a big hug and a kiss and pat him on the butt and off he went. Well, the first couple of times he was looking back over his shoulder like, my God, what's going on with that, you know? But in point of fact, it was beautiful because as I started doing more and more one minute praisings, guess what happened to the necessary uh, one minute reprimands? I didn't have to do as many. So you're right, these three, uh, these three uh, one-minute techniques can be applied anywhere. Let's talk a little bit, Spencer, about this 80-20 idea, this idea that 20% of the activities are really the important activities. In the usual manager's time, 80% of the time is spent on the unimportant things, yes. and you really get your results out of 20%. Absolutely. And the whole, this whole concept is focusing the attention to that 20%. Only. Only. Yes. And how do you really get that across? Well, I think the best management technique is the one used uh, a long time ago by Socrates, where he didn't teach anybody anything. He simply raised questions. And I think a marvelous thing to do with your people is to start raising these kind of questions with them. You go away. You write down everything you do. You decide on the 20% of what's really working for you. See, then you put it back in their ballpark. The great thing about being a one-minute manager is it's not so important what happens when you're there as what happens when you're not there. You want each person reporting to you becoming a one-minute manager in themselves. And so uh, that's the technique I would use with my people. Get them thinking, put down their list. Mm -hmm. It seems to me, with, even with my people, to ask them to take the 20% of the things they do that are really important and then list all the rest of the things they do and then yep. bring them in and say, all right, here are the things you're not going to do anymore. Well said. Maybe don't. forms that someone invented three years ago that are still being filled out you that nobody it. reads. And you know what the first reaction will be? Yeah, but. Yeah, but we need to do it because, and there will be a lot of, you know, defending why we still need to do that 80%. There was a great uh, story that a friend of mine uh, was a fine writer and had won a, a lot of awards for writing, and he was in a real block. And the best piece of advice he ever got was the hardest one to follow. And uh, when he was asked, I'll bet you have a lot of your awards up around your room. I'll bet you have all the stuff you've written on file and so forth. And the guy said, of course I do. And the advice was, you know, do you want to get out of your writer's block? I mean, this man was having a serious block where it was affecting his, you know, his income and his self-image and everything. So, I mean, it was getting to a crisis stage and the man could not solve it. And you know how he solved it? One simple way. He had the guts to follow the advice. Very hard to do. He was told to take down every plaque and throw out everything he'd ever written. And it was extraordinary. A reminder that he'd ever been successful in the past. Well, it was getting in his way. It was like there was no more room left. If you went into his study, his entire hall was filled with plaques. Well, that's fine, but <laughs> there's no more room. No more plaques. Exactly, exactly. And so a lot of what we're doing is hard to let go of because it's safe. But if we're willing to let go of 80% of what we do, first of all, it takes tremendous strain off our back. And we really don't need to be doing it. It doesn't make any difference. 
<laughs> it's reassuring because it's familiar. In, in the many years that we've been running seminars and conferences in the management field, getting something so simple that even senior management can understand it is, is a real key. key <laughs> well factor. said, yeah. It's just common sense. Could you go into a little background on who's, who's using it and why and what level of management is using it? Well, the spectrum goes all the way from Fortune 500 companies, which are increasing, it seems, almost every week. Uh, more and more of them are using the one-minute manager, like uh, ITT, uh, Mobile, uh, Chase Manhattan Bank, um, GTE, IBM, Lockheed. There's a very long list now. Two, with all due respect to those big ones, they're so big I find it sometimes hard to get a grasp that they're actually, you know, people. That down to the uh, smaller companies like uh, those that have more direct contact with the consumers, like Burger King, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Holiday Inns. They're giving them to lots of their unit managers of their fast food stores. And, to me, I'm excited about that because we're talking about real productivity in this country. That's where the people are. That's where they work. We are particularly pleased after the Today Show we did recently that the manager of the, uh, of the crew came over almost with tears in his eyes and touched us and said, uh, I've been wanting somebody to say that for the last 20 years. He said, that's the way I've wanted it to be managed. We, we were very touched by that. And as we came out, uh, a man came down from the elevator and said, I'm the manager of the art department here at NBC. He said, and I, I want you guys to know that just after that brief exposure, he said, I want to change the way I manage people. Now, that's where the productivity is. So that's what I'm really the most proud of. And it's being used uh, by uh, non-business groups, various kinds of organizations, the cities of Pittsburgh and Memphis and university administrators. It's even being used by the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts and their management uh, Technique. So we're excited the fact that it is so simple, so many people can use it. Mm -hmm. As you say, even senior management can get it. <laughs> Spencer, in your book, you've got a major quote on it. We are not just our behavior, we are the person managing our behavior. What's, what's behind that quote? That's, that's a really critical concept because we really are not our behavior. This is a concept most of us don't understand about ourselves, let alone about the people who work for us. But our behavior changes. Some days we act like an ass, you know. <laughs> Some days we act absolutely marvelous. Uh, but we don't switch. We are still the same person. And if you can remember that the person you're managing is not his recent mistake, he is the person behind that mistake. And if you can get the person to look at their mistake in a way that is not their worth, if you can separate their behavior from their worth, then you can say to the person, your behavior was nonsense and you are terrific. So if you can get people, it really is, and it's very, very, very powerful. If and you can do that. the idea of you are not managing the person's last mistake. Yes. You're managing, you are managing the, person. the person. Exactly. And it's critical. If you get that, then as you're talking to the person, they get it. And you know what? They can let go of negative behavior so easily, so much more quickly, if they know that you know that they're okay. So if you say to them, let me give you a quick one-minute reprimand. Uh, Tony, we wanted your report in at 11 o'clock Thursday morning. You turned it in late, and it wasn't complete. Now, this is the second time we've talked about this, and I want you to know I am angry. I am angry. You get that? I sure and do. I'll tell you something else. You are better than that. You are one of our best people. You know it, and I know it. You've turned in reports on time, and they've been beautifully written, and I need you. We need you. Now, if you do this again, we're going to go through this drill again, and I don't want to go through this again. Turn them in on time, and thanks for everything else that you're doing around here. And a touch, and it's over. You just touch the man on the shoulder or the, the elbow or anything to let him know, I'm with you. It's us again, the problem, and it's over. Well, that's very powerful, see, because you have come right at the behavior and you pause and you let that sink in. And if they start talking, as they will invariably, yeah, but I, but I had this flat tire, how did you know? You know, one way to avoid that is to say up front, uh, I want to tell you something, and this is not a conversation we're about to have. I don't want to hear a word. This is not a conversation. Do you understand that? Okay. <laughs> so you set the mode very clearly. Now, there is no such thing as a one-way street in the world in terms of human relations. He's got his feelings, and he's going to want to express them. What I've done with my kids and what I do with, you know, lovers or, you know, friends is to encourage them to do the same thing to me. Hey, when I'm off base, I want to know about it. 
You know, tell me what you think. Tell me what you feel. Let me know how my behavior is affecting you. But just be darn sure you remind me I'm a pretty good guy, you know. Then I can take it. Uh, and it does work both ways. And later on, you will want to get your employee back in and ask for the employee's feelings. What final advice would you give managers today? The final advice I would give them is if they can remember these three key skills, woman of goal setting, praising, and reprimand, and not have to worry about a million different management techniques, but just concentrate on three that are simple, straightforward, they will be amazed at how much better they feel and the people around them. Because if you are clear up to with people what you want them to do and what good behavior looks like, if you have an environment that's trying to catch them doing something right, and your good performers know that you will not put up with anything but their best performance, you are creating a human organization which is geared towards good, solid, quality productivity and job satisfaction and personal prosperity. I think I would uh, follow up with what Ken has just said. I think I would be reminded of what Confucius said. He said, the essence of knowledge is having it to use it. And I would really encourage people to use these three one-minute management techniques and enjoy the marvelous results you get. Having seen these concepts work firsthand, I can personally tell you that they're easy to put into practice and they really get results in no time at all. We've given you the fundamentals, and now's a good time to get a hold of Ken and Spencer's book for all the fine points to put the one-minute manager to work for you. Before we sign off, we want to invite you to send us your comments and suggestions for other programs you'd like to see. In return for writing us, we'll send you our latest catalog listing all of our materials. Just send your comments to Listen and Learn, P.O. Box 396, Old Greenwich, Connecticut, 06870. Thanks for listening. We'd be happy to listen to you, too. We judge others by their behavior, but we judge ourselves by our intentions. And what we're talking about is coming up with some ideas today which can be useful to you in communicating your ideas more effectively. Do you want to get some kind of feedback before the hostile Q&A session begins? Sure, and the only way you get it is by looking right at people and letting them respond. Even if it's negative, I think we want to get it so we know whether we're getting our message across or not. Here's the answer to the question, what do you do with your hands in front of a group? The answer is, don't plan gestures. Welcome to this Listen and Learn program, filled with useful information. This session is designed to sharply increase your awareness on the subject and give you ideas and knowledge that you can put to work right away. As with all Listen and Learn programs, you hear from the experts, people who have already been there and who have had success. Of course, we can't hope to present everything there is to know in a short session like this, but we will give you all the important highlights so that you'll have a good overview when you've completed the session. For more information, listen to the message at the end of this cassette. Okay? Let's begin. Listen, 
learn, and enjoy. Tom Kirby is a communications expert specializing in business communications. He's president of his own communicator training firm and has been a lawyer, radio personality, and broadcast executive. He's taught over 10,000 executives from Fortune 500 companies how to present their ideas persuasively, forcefully, confidently. He's done this through intensive feedback, speech training programs. On this tape, working with audience participants, Tom shows how to get attention and hold attention how to handle questions and improve speaker-listener rapport. Let's listen in. Welcome to Better Face-to-Face -face Communications. Here is the umbrella theme. Some of you may have heard this before, and it, it never changes. This is what we're always trying to do, communicate a little bit better inside and outside the organization. What we're working on is not the intellectual part of what you say, but it's the physical part, the how you say it, and if I were to stop and have a discussion right now, everybody in the room would probably have several reasons why they agree that how you say it, especially in the selling business, but in all communication situations, is very often as important as the actual words themselves. Yes? That's what we're, we're agreed on that. Now we want to do something about it. Now the problem in talking about communication skills, especially when we're talking about how to improve our skills is this. It can't be done by talking about it. It's something that has to be experienced, and therefore, this is a workshop, and with the exception of a few comments between speakers, this will be a session where you're involved. In fact, we're gonna have a way for everybody in the room to be involved in this little time together where we think about the unspoken communications, the invisible communications, body language, we could talk about a whole list of descriptions for the things that are happening that really communicate messages other than the words themselves. Now, here's how we do it. Normally, if we were to say we wanted to improve our communication skills, we got together, we'd have a small group of people and a videotape camera and playback unit so that we could go right past any opinions about whether somebody was communicating well or not or uh, effectively or not. We just take pictures of each speaker, show them back, let them make up their own minds. We do not have videotape capabilities here today. So what we're gonna do is ask three of you to be volunteers to come to the front of the room and give three short talks, after which we'll have a discussion and talk about these nonverbal communicators, the physical part of communication. But we have to have the volunteers to do it, so we have material uh, to, to work with. Before I ask for volunteers, I want to ask you all a question. This is not a trick question. Uh, it occurs to me that some of you, even though you'd like to improve your communication skills, you've, you, know, you may have even thought about taking a course in negotiations or interviewing or public speaking. Uh, you may be a little reticent about getting up in front of a group, especially a peer group, to give a talk. Is there anybody in the room who's nervous either now or any time about the idea of speaking before a group? Anybody? Would you just look around, see? Almost, raise your hands high so we can, this is not a tr trick question. Almost everybody is raising their, their hand to say at one time or another you're a little bit nervous about speaking before a group. I'm, I'm glad to see that we have an honest group because most everybody is. And according to a survey by the Book of Lists, they ask a cross-section of Americans, what's your greatest fear? And the number one fear of adults is speaking before groups, six places ahead of death. <laughs> Here's the survey. Greatest fears of adults, number one fear, speaking before groups, second, heights, third, fear of deep water, fourth, financial problems, fifth, cancer, sixth, flying, and seventh, fear is death. I, I guess the reason that speaking before a group is a greater fear than death is that we think there's a greater chance we're going to be called on to speak on a given day than to die. Some of you are going to be called on to speak right now. I did, I did this just for one reason, to say you're in a large company because we're all a little bit nervous. How come? Why, why any sense of, of nervousness or surge of nervous energy when you're speaking before a group? Anybody? Maybe we have an inability to express the idea verbally. Okay, the 
The comment is we're, we're liable to embarrass ourselves. We're afraid of looking silly before the group. That's the consensus of most people I talk to. And there's a reason uh, for being concerned about our behavior in front of a group because sometimes our job depends on it. For instance, let me ask you this. How many in this room use seminars as a method of prospecting or selling new products to existing clients? Raise your hands, look around. A lot of people. So we're talking about something here which is uh, a serious consideration as part of your job, communicating ideas. Now there are probably some people who did not raise their hands who have either thought about doing seminars or used to do one and you just don't feel comfortable standing in front of a group of people. You may be perfectly relaxed one-on-one, -on -one, but you can't get your ideas across well in front of a group because your nerves aren't under control or you lack the experience or you want to hone some skills. What I'd like is a lot of you to volunteer so that I can then pick three volunteers who will give three short talks. You won't be embarrassed. It'll be fun. It won't take long. And now can I see how many people will volunteer to participate. We're going to need a lot more volunteers for me to feel like you're interested. Raise your hands. Hi. Three volunteers. What are the, I'll tell you the subjects in a minute. They're very simple. All right. There's one volunteer, and your name is Ken, and Don is our second volunteer. How come no women are volunteering? There's one. Are you going to volunteer? No. <laughs> Settles that. And that was enough. Okay, fair enough. Mark. Mark, Don, and Ken. Here's the first talk we'd like for you to give in front of the group. Introduce yourself. Tell us in less than 60 seconds your name, where you're from, something interesting that you're involved in, either at work or a project, but a talk of introduction that would help us get to know you a little bit better. I know you know a lot of people in the room, but assume that you don't know all of us so that you can make an effort to introduce yourself. This is something we're called on to do a lot in business and social situations, talk of self-introduction. So if you want to make some notes, Feel free to do that so that you're organized about what you want to say, but plan not to bring your paper up with you when you give the talk. Now here's what the rest of us are going to do. I said we could all be involved. What we're going to do is be the television camera and microphone so that each time one of our volunteers gives a talk, we will immediately have an instant replay and tell them everything we saw and heard and perhaps in some cases it's not just seeing or hearing but just feelings we get from the speakers as they communicate to us now to help us stay on track I've made a list of specific things we want to look for and listen for each time one of the speakers is up here the visual signs will be signs of nervousness watch for that in case one of the speakers is nervous and if so Let's tell them exactly what we saw, not just that they may look nervous, but how it manifested itself. We'll be watching the speaker's posture. Were they standing up straight, leaning on one hip, moving from side to side? Where were their hands while they were talking? That's the question most people ask in advance of a public speaking program. What do I do with my hands? Now, we're not going to tell the volunteers ahead of time, but we will tell them what they do, in fact. Then this last thing we'll look for is eyes. What we mean is, where were they looking with their eyes during the talk? Were they looking at people in the audience? Did their eyes go up to the ceiling floor looking around the room? A good way to think of this is, did the speaker look right at me? Vocally, how was the volume, especially back in the back where Frank is sitting? We'll listen to see if every word came across crisply and clearly. We'll listen for inflection. Do we hear peaks and valleys? Is it interesting to listen to? Perhaps sliding into a monotone occasionally. Whatever you hear, let's feed back. Then the pace, that's the speed of the delivery of the words. Is it too fast or too slow or just right? And finally, we'll be listening for non-words. What's an example of a non-word? Uh, you know, all right, okay. Anything that is repeated, particularly if it has no bearing on the subject matter, we'll call a non-word and report on that to the speakers, who, if they were not nervous before hearing what we're going to do after each talk, are probably a little bit nervous now. But this, this is all in, in good spirits, and we're going to keep all the, con, uh, the
the comments very constructive, but very direct so that our three speakers will benefit as well as the rest of us. Now, before we ask Ken to come up and give us the first talk, here is, here is a contract for us. This is what I'm going to be working on. The three volunteers, I can promise you, are going to be better speakers and feel better about it by the time this session is over. Now, let's watch and see how it happens. Ken? Good morning. Uh, one of the things, obviously, we all have in common is not that we're only tax shelter coordinators, but we're all brokers working for E.F. Hutton. And uh, I've only been in the business about a year and a half. One of the most fascinating things I note about this business is that no one started out as a child saying, I want to be a broker. They either want to be firemen or baseball players. And we all came from some, <laughs> Don Schwal, for instance, and we all came from somewhere else. Uh, it might be interesting to note to you that I used to work for E.F. Hutton as a business consultant. Uh, my own background is very analytic. I used to work as a, an economist for the Central Bank of Israel in Jerusalem before coming to work here. Um, I was a business consultant and only then saw the light of how interesting it might be to be a broker. So my background is probably uniquely different, but probably very much in the same in that we all came from different places. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. Great job, Ken. Don't keep, keep your uh, mic on. Let's give Ken some instant feedback on what we saw and heard. Great talk, but let's be specific. Any signs of nervousness that anybody may have noticed? Yes, what was that? The way he was wringing his hands in front of him was a sign of nervousness to some people. I call that the used car gesture, by the way. Boy, have I got a, a deal for you. All of these things we do say something to the audience. Any other signs of nervousness? Yes. What? The pace of this talk. The pace of the talk. In what way did it? Well, uh... He was trying to be so non-nervous by being forth, uh, speaking forth, just the, the impression of being, uh, being nervous in the uh, inflections of his voice. All right, it sounded a bit nervous. He was talking at a high level. The pitch of the voice. A lot of things can contribute to it. Anybody else have that feeling in listening to him that he sounded a little bit nervous? Or? No. I guess yes? It wasn't as much nervous because I think he was hurrying to get in that 60 seconds. And that's what contributed to the high pitch. Yes. All right. What, what I'm, I'm hearing is that one way or the other, whether it was because he was trying to com compress a lot of information into a short time or because he really was nervous, it sounded that way. Now, from the audience's point of view, does it make any difference whether you are nervous or not if it looks like it to the audience? No. Well, let's find out. Were you nervous at all? Sure. A little bit. All of us are just a little bit. Matter of fact, I still bit. am. <laughs> This is one of the hardest things to do, is to stand in front of a group and be talked about. I, I appreciate your, your putting up with this. Let's, uh, let's go on with the critique, but with this, yes, other comments? Three non-words, man, uh, We're having a report on the, the verbal side already. Three non-words. Uh, it, was it distracting to anybody? Like you were shifting gears. That's when most of us use non-words, when we're trying to think, and we're going to get back to that after another talk. Let me go back to nervousness. Just get one thing. I'll get your comment. Did he, and this is for Ken's benefit, did he appear that nervous? No. I mean, no, not enough for you to worry about. And that's one of the benefits when you see yourself on videotape, perhaps take an intensive course that you'll walk out with. Sometimes we feel nervous and that inhibits our own communication because we're concerned about looking nervous to the audience. But I would say in, in Ken's case, it wouldn't bother us at all. We're just putting the spotlight on it. There was another comment over here. Pacing back and forth. Pacing back and forth. Is a, we're moving all over our chart here, but in fact, every one of these things in some way could be a sign of nervousness. Yes? Ken, I had no sense of you talking to me. All right, the is comment is... I didn't look at you? The comment is, I, I was hearing you, but I didn't feel like you were with me. Let me move down our chart here for a minute and ask this question about eyes. No eye did, that's the point. He didn't have eye contact with you. How many did get eye contact from Ken at some time during the talk? That's good a handful of people all around the room. Most people would like to get some eye contact from a speaker or at least feel that the speaker is making an attempt to really communicate with people rather than just saying words. That's why this question is here. I think that's a pretty good job for eye contact. How about posture? We had a comment about a pacing, moving a bit. We had a comment about his hands. What else can you say that he would see on a videotape replay, specifically about posture or where his hands were? Yes. In other words, his body language at the, at the midpoint of the talk suggested 
pay more attention. This is an important part of the talk. Good illustration of what we're saying, that many times the way we speak, the gestures we use while we're speaking, say something to the audience as well. Yes, Mary? But his posture was even. He didn't lean either way. He did walk around a bit, but he, when he was standing, he stood stately. And, and what, what did that say to you? It said, well, it wasn't distracting, whereas when somebody stands on one hip, it's very distracting. All right, the point here is the posture itself, if it's out of control, can be a distraction to the audience. In this case, you're getting a compliment that you were standing up straight. Let's quickly go down here. Volume, how was it in the back? Too low. Could have been louder. We're hearing from the back of the room. How about inflection? Sound all right? Interesting delivery. The pace of the talk we've already talked about sounded a little fast to some people. And we had a non-word count of three. Anybody disagree with that? All right, Ken, thank you very much. Let's give him another hand. Don? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Don Schwal. Very happy to be here this morning. I'm an assistant regional director for tax shelters with E.F. Hutton & Company in the Atlantic region, the finest tax shelter firm in the United States. I'm very proud to work for them. Before getting into the brokerage business, however, I was the opposite of Ken. I was a baseball player who dreamed of getting into the brokerage business. It has been quite a change, but it's very much like playing baseball in my eyes. You win some, you lose some, you get rained out once in a while when you don't get your private placement. However, it is something that I have enjoyed from the first day I started. It's something that I'm still enjoying thoroughly, and I'm looking forward to everybody in this room having a record year so that both Frank and I will have the best override check we've ever seen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Don. Don't take your uh, mic off here. Thanks. Well, I may have uh, overpromised. I said everybody would be a little bit better as a speaker. He's, Don's pretty good as a speaker. Let's tell him why specifically. Any signs of nervousness, by the way? And I didn't see any. Don, were you nervous at all? Uh, I was just pepped up a little bit. Pepped up is a good way to put it. We've all got that surge of nervous energy, but in Don's case, I, d I didn't see any signs of nervousness, particularly anything that would be distracting. How was his posture? Excellent. Standing up straight. Did he move at all? <laughs> Wonder why. How should you stand in front of a group? Should you stand planted perfectly straight or move around? What's the significance of the fact that it feels better to you? We're going to come to that and cover it very specifically. Yes, comment over here. Are you saying at the beginning of this talk, that's how it appeared to you? The comment is that sometimes standing perfectly straight or appearing to be rigid can be a sign that you're uncomfortable. Why is that important, by the way? Why are we going over this every time? Because if you look nervous in front of a group, the group is not going to think automatically, well, that person's just like everybody else and is a little nervous speaking before a group. They're liable to associate it with your discomfort with the subject matter. And in this business of selling a sophisticated product like tax shelters, the last thing you want is for a client to think you're uncomfortable about the subject matter. So that's why we point this out over and over. Specifically, what about eye contact? How many got direct eye contact from Don? Don, take a look around the room. There are some people in these corners that were missed, but you got people in all points of the room. I'd, I'd say that's very good. Did it look pretty good to you in terms of his communication? Yes, Mary? It was was a little bit too sweeping, though. I, right. I wanted you to... Yeah, I noticed alone. myself. I think that's, again, that one-minute thing that you're... So. you got a clock going in your head, you know, as you're, as you're talking. The eye contact may have been a little fast. We, we yeah, saw I, a lot of people being covered, but not for very long at a time. I and specific, doing You knew that... Yeah, I knew I was doing it. I could feel I was moving a little too... too a little fast. too quickly. Right. Is volume okay? Nice. Inflection? No problems there at all. The pace of the talk, was it... Delivered at a comfortable speed for you? Measured. Somebody says too measured. Make a, make a note. We'll listen for that next time. And then what about non-words? I didn't hear any. If there were, it was not distracting. We have somebody who made a point of counting, though, and the word is... I knew it. <laughs> All right, you're watching for your own benefit. Don, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right, just one second. What's this last comment? Don, you did something that I felt was very important to me, and that was you smiled. I think that's very important. I felt comfortable. You did not make eye contact with me, and yet I felt comfortable listening to you. Let me say one thing about that. 
We don't have the word smile on the list here because it's very difficult to teach people to do. But it's one of the nice things you can do when you start a talk because most smiles are started by other smiles. So if you're the speaker and you want people smiling, a good way to do it uh, is to smile at them. Thanks, Don. Great job. Mark, anytime you're ready, 60 seconds. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mark Furstein. I'm with the New Brunswick office of E.F. Hutton. I began this week with more anticipation than I've had in 12 years because I was going to see something I haven't seen in 12 years. My top lip. I shaved my mustache on Monday morning. And this caused me more anxiety than I've had in any business situation in quite a time. I started slowly. I sort of liked what was emerging. And then when I was finished, I didn't like it anymore. I went downstairs and my six-year-old son started to giggle. He said I looked younger. Well, when I started in the business, I was 23 and I needed some age. Now, I don't need it anymore, but I still may grow it back. So thank you for letting me discuss it with you. Okay, thank you. Give him a hand. Did anybody do a double take when they saw Mark for the first time this meeting? Did I did. And what, let's take a vote. You like it off or on? How many like it off? <laughs> this is what I need, this kind you of need feedback. The, you gotta, you got to hear this now while it's important to you. I, I think we like it both ways, Mark, but especially... <laughs> All right, let's have the feedback, instant replay for what we saw, the physical skills while Mark was speaking. Any signs of nervousness? No. When he started. What? When he started, but it couldn't quit. All right, and when he started, but what was it specifically that he would see on tape if he were to see a videotape oh, replay? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said his upper lip trembling. What was it at the very beginning? Moving around in his hands. Hands a little bit tense looking, body language. Were you nervous? Yes. Giving the talk? But he says he was nervous, but was he that nervous? No, uh, no not at all. Very disarming, in fact, for us, too. Posture, how was he standing? Swaying. He was swaying a bit. Were you aware of that? I didn't know what to do. He said he didn't know what to do. We're going to tell you some ideas in just a minute. His hands, somebody mentioned that just briefly. What was he doing with his hands? He had them in front of him in our famous used car gesture. A lot of people stand in front of a group and put their hands in front like this, which we call the fig leaf position. And, uh, and as soon as we point that out, they put them behind them, and we call that the reverse of fig leaf. I, I mention that now that our three volunteers have given their first talk because we are going to start talking about options for things to do with your hands other than, than those ideas which we seem to have all had before. How about eye contact? How many got direct eye contact from Ken? Good. This is one of the best showings for eye contact I've seen in these workshops. Were you making a conscious attempt yes. to look at people? He said yes, and that's the key, by the Looking way. For people with mustaches or... <laughs> Somebody you can relate <laughs> to. All right, good eye contact. What about volume, especially back over in the corners of the room? How was it? I heard everything. You heard everything, but it could have been a little bit louder, perhaps. Did the volume in any way affect the, the way you heard the inflection? Yes. I really do not have difficulty hearing you or Don. And I've had my hearing checked and there's nothing wrong with my hearing. I think some people project and others don't. There's a word that's coming in this comment and that is projection. Yeah, I, I don't know what the quality is. Resonance. There's a difference between speakers. All right, everybody has their own mix that's a combination of their tone of voice and the ability to put that volume out. And it's, the combination is called projection. We're going to focus on that in just a minute. What about pace of the talk? No problems there. Any non-words? I'm looking at our counter. There, there were none. Mark, thank you very much. Good job. Give him a hand. Now, there are going to be two specific skills we work on for the next two talks. The next talk assignment for our volunteers is this. Tell us a story, 60 seconds or less, about a previous communications experience in which you were personally involved. It doesn't make any difference whether that was you talking to one person or talking to a group of people. And it also makes no difference for our purposes whether it was a successful communications experience or not. But we ask you to do it as a first-person story, mainly for your benefit, because it's easier to tell. 
Uh, somebody said one time the beautiful thing about the truth is it's so easy to tell. So just tell us, a, in other words, don't tell a joke. And don't tell a third person story, but tell us a story in which you were involved. And again, we'll ask you not to bring your notes up with you if you care to make some in advance. There are two skills we're going to work on. Here's the first one. We ask every uh, body in the room to think about getting eye contact from the speakers. And we got feedback, and this is an excellent group of speakers because occasionally when I do these workshops, I said, how many got direct eye contact from the speaker? And no hands go up. Now, this is the central skill that you can take out of here with you that will help you control nervousness and also help you control your communication with members of the group. Why do you think people have a problem with eye contact in front of a group? Because they're concentrating on their topic? Yes, Frank? That was the point he wanted to make. If you look at somebody, you're going to have personal communication. That might increase your sense of nervousness. That's possible. What I'm going to suggest is the opposite, in fact, that by having a series of what amounts to one-on-one -on -one conversations, talking to one person at a time, you'll actually feel less nervous because you'll get involved in the kind of communication you're used to doing most of the time. If you're talking to somebody across a table or in a social situation, do you look them in the eye? Most of us do. What, well, let me ask it another way. What happens if you're talking to somebody one-on-one -on -one and that person doesn't look you in the eye? What do you think? That you've lost them? What else might you think? That he's hiding something or not interesting. In other words, it's a basic principle of communication one-on-one -on -one, face to face that you look at people while you're talking. Why should it be totally different in front of a group? Now, earlier, one of the unsolicited comments was, I had a feeling that he was looking at people, but the eye contact was a little too fast, perhaps sweeping the audience. We have learned to do that out of habit. Even good speakers, many good speakers, have not mastered this particular skill we're talking about, and that is delivering your message to one person at a time. The eye is a muscle, and if you're used to the idea of sweeping the room, it's going to be very hard to break it. But in fact, I think we can demonstrate now that you'll be a much more effective communicator if you talk to one person at a time, which is just exactly what you do in social situations and in any kind of small group or two people talking communication conditions. Just talk to one person at a time. One of the big benefits, besides the audience's appreciation that you're looking at them, is that you get an opportunity occasionally to get response from members of the audience who might either nod their head or shake their head. We're going to ask the three speakers to come up one at a time. We'll get back to these comments, too. And then, in addition to telling us the story, we want you to concentrate on talking to one person at a time. That's your assignment. Just talk to one person at a time. Now, I, that's a little difficult, as, as some of you uh, may know if you've tried this before uh, in one of these workshops. Because if you're not used to looking at one person at a time, your eyes will have a tendency to go to the ceiling, to go to the floor, to go to another person, and then back. And what we're looking for is one-on-one -on -one communication, talking to one person at a time, hopefully delivering a complete thought, but a minimum of four or five seconds to each person. That We're overdoing it. Let me say that in advance. We're overdoing it so that you can practice the skill of talking to one person at a time. Now, please turn over the cassette to continue. Now, the three volunteers, so 
they can concentrate on the subject matter. I can hear this going through their minds now. How are we going to know that we've talked to each person for four or five seconds or a complete thought? And the answer is we're going to help you. What we're going to do is ask members of the audience, especially through this middle section, to raise their hand. These will be the eye contact traffic cops. And your job as speakers will be to select one at a time people with their hands raised and then, for instance, if my hand were raised, I was a member of the group, and you're talking to me, you would continue talking to me until the hand goes down. Now, those of you who have your hands raised, just count silently to yourself uh, to four, four seconds or five seconds, 1,001, 1,002, and then drop your hand after four or five seconds. Now, that is going to seem like an eternity if you're not used to looking at one person for that length of time. It's not really very long at all and then just drop your hand when they're through now to make it more interesting since there is this tendency to look away if the speaker looks away while your hand is raised and he's engaged you in eye contact then count for four continuous seconds and if during the four seconds the eyes move away from you start at zero again all right that'll I'll keep them honest and keep them locked in any questions from our volunteers all right, now, beginning now, I'm going to feel free to interrupt if, if it's useful to, to help us along. Are you ready, Ken, for the first time? All right, Ken, select one person and tell us the communication story. Since many of us are here to talk about public speaking, it might be interesting to note that what I'd like to talk to everybody about has nothing to do with public speaking, per se, rather with something very personal. Uh, some of the best conversations I ever have are with my two-year-old daughter. I consider them to be uh, uh, quite expressive and self-rewarding. One of the best ones I've had recently is when I came home one night, my daughter was in a frenzy. She didn't want to go to sleep. And hands? We were, we were sitting in the den, and I said, it's time to go to sleep, Yardena. And she said, no sleep. And I said, Yardena, let's have a little talk about it. Okay. And we had a little talk, and I said, you've had a long day. It's been a very hectic day. Uh, you've done a lot of things. Tell me about some of the things you did. Well, I baked, and I went to the pool, and I went swimming, and I helped clean the dishes. And when that whole thing was over, I said, you've had a long day. Don't you think it's time to go to sleep? And she said, yes. And at that point, I took her upstairs, put her in her crib, and the night had begun. Nice story, Ken. Give him a hand. <laughs> Leave that on for just a minute. Sir. All right, nice job. Uh, sometimes I have to, and I said this earlier, I have to interrupt because people just won't, in front of a group, lock in on one person. I don't think Ken had that problem at all. Let's get comments from people that he actually spoke to. How did he come across as a communicator this time? Almost like staring me in the face. <laughs> The comment is that uh, it's possible to overdo eye contact. What happens when a speaker just stays with you too long with eye contact? I, yeah, you can overdo that, and the person on the receiving end is probably going to avert his or her eyes to get away from it. That'll be a signal. Yes? I was aware that when I stopped. I thought about that. All right, on that point specifically, I have to take uh, either blame or credit for, for that because I asked for these volunteers up here, but... Specifically, when you're using this eye contact technique, if you'll select people in the back of the room to look to as well, you'll overcome this point that, that you're raising here, that we have a tendency to lower our voice when we're talking to people close up to us. Other comments about Ken's talk on this go around? Yes. The, the comment is that this particular technique can, can look like a technique to the audience if you're not careful. And we're doing it for laboratory purposes right now, and it is a little awkward, but the ideal situation would be randomly looking at one person at a time and going from one part of the room to another, not like a windshield wiper, of course, where you, you know, anything that you do that looks like a, a repetitive uh, gesture or technique is going to bother the audience. Thanks for that comment. Other comments about the quality of communication from Ken now, besides the subject matter on this talk? Yes? Well, Ken was so 
focused on talking to one person, that he stood in this big leaf thing the whole time and kind of nodded forward. To All right. Person. What you'd see on videotape is that we're going to, even though you're doing a great job with eye contact, we still have some options for doing other things with our hands besides the fig leaf position. And perhaps, if you saw yourself on videotape, you'd notice that you are probably, for emphasis, nodding your head a lot while you're talking. Yes? Uh, I noticed that you had your right hand clenched in a fist, hidden behind your left. Did you know that? Right hand clenched behind the left. I don't I know what that is. I felt much more awkward this time than last time because I had to focus in on certain people. All right. We're going to come back to that specific thing about hands in just a minute. Other specific comments before Don gives his talk. All right. Nice job, Ken. Thank you. Give him another hand. Come on up, Don. In every athlete's career, there comes a time when he knows he's reaching the end of the line. And it's usually caused by some event. It happened to me one day in Pittsburgh. I came into a ball game, bases loaded, two outs in the eighth inning, Harry Walker was the manager, and he came out to the mound, and he said, Schwal, whatever you do, don't throw this guy a changeup. It's Jimmy Wynn. I managed him. The guy will kill you. Nothing but high, hard stuff inside. I said, Harry, don't worry about a thing. Go into the dugout. Relax. I'll be there in about 30 seconds when I take care of this turkey. All right, hold it one second, Don. Does anybody notice that Don's eyes are moving back and forth just a little bit? Let's focus on that now. Who's the next person you're going to talk to? It was him, yeah. All right. Are you? All right. Stay, stay right with, I mean, what's your name? Art. Art. Stay with Art, but concentrate on not moving your eyes a bit. Just lock right in on him. All right. All right. What happened when you? As I said, I'll take care of this turkey. So I got the guy to a two and two count. Pagaroni, the catcher, gave me the sign, and I threw the best fastball I had. He hit it about 380 feet <laughs> over the left field wall. As I was standing there enjoying the sight of the ball, I happened to turn around and I see Harry running out to the mound to me. He said, Schwal, I told you, don't ever throw him a changeup. And with that, Pag took off his mask and said, Harry, that was his fastball. <laughs> <laughs> Good story, Don. Stand here for just a minute. Sorry I interrupted, but sometimes that's the only way we can change these little things, and the specific one we're looking for is holding our eyes steady, looking at one person at a time. Let's have some comments specifically about Don's eye contact in this talk. Shouldn't the eye contact uh, be made for a thought rather than artificially the way we're doing it? All right, it? what about the artificial nature of four or five seconds? That's a, let me give a blanket apology. We're in a laboratory situation, and frankly, it's very difficult to get people to change without some device like that. But in fact, you're right. If you're looking at a person, the correct time is what feels right. And usually that's a thought. Why is that? Because when I make eye contact with somebody in the audience and a natural point is being made, it's perfectly natural for somebody to respond with usually a, a gesture or a nod of the head at the end of the thought. But if you move your eyes away ahead of time, they won't have that opportunity. I think I was a little more conscious this time than I've ever been, you know, of looking at one person. Like, I think normally when I'm talking to a group, I don't really look at the guy in the last row like I had to there. I, I could feel the difference that, that I actually was looking at him. Let me thank you for these comments. Now, let me wrap up and say something. Don, I'll let you sit right. down to listen with us for this, and then we'll... Uh, just before Mark comes up, let me wrap up some of these things about eye contact. And, and I, I think you've made some good points here, especially about the fact that when you're learning a new technique, it can backfire on you if it appears to be a technique in the audience. I think that was the gist of this last comment. You've got to get comfortable with this yourself. Now, let me go back to the question about is eye contact for everybody. There perhaps are people who can be as good as they can be as a speaker without really working on eye contact. I see very few of them. And I've worked with a lot of people over the years. Usually this will bring out other things in the speaker because the speaker benefits from eye contact as well as the audience, particularly from this response you get when you're looking at people and there is a little nodding of the head occasionally. Now let me ask you this. In this business of selling tax shelters, let's imagine a seminar where you're explaining a product to a group of prospects. Do you want to get some kind of feedback before the hostile Q&A session begins? 
Sure, and the only way you get it is by looking right at people and letting them respond. Even if it's negative, I think we want to get it so we know whether we're getting our message across or not. But one final thing for Don, and this is for everybody six feet tall in the room and over, you don't have an option if you're a big person about putting out a big message, do you? If there's a disparity between what we see and what we hear, it's going to give us a little bit of a pause, perhaps at a subconscious level. But in terms of communicating as a, a, an expert, when you give a financial seminar, you might want to keep that in mind in terms of volume and forcefulness. And the final point, and we're going to get to this in a minute with the last talk, is using your whole body with gestures appropriately for your size and for the subject matter. Let's let Mark give this talk, then we're going to have one last quick one and wrap it up. I do public speaking from time to time. And I'm your basic do-gooder in that I will lecture to senior citizens about their finances. And I really don't attempt to sell them anything but to explain various parts of the financial world and what could help them. I had a difficult situation about a month ago. I normally go into a meeting and I immediately disarm them with a joke. I rely on my charm for at least the first 10 minutes. <laughs> But what happened was that I didn't know that I was 20 minutes late. The chairperson told me to start at 1 o'clock. Who knew that they were expecting me at 20 of 1? I walk in the room. I introduce myself. I told them where I was from. This little lady in the corner was saying, we got a bus to catch. We have a bus to catch. And she was knitting. This was not a good sign. And I didn't know how to react. This happened invariably through the meeting. Because not only did she interrupt my joke, which is supposed to disarm them, she was distracting the attention of anybody interested. So what I finally did was I found a few people in the audience to be my friends. Whatever she said something, they'd say, shut up. <laughs> and the best thing that this lady said during the whole meeting was goodbye. Thank you. Okay, give him a hand. All right, let's have instant replay for Mark. What did you see and hear specifically about eye contact? Can I have some comments from you, please? He didn't look at you. Did you have your hand raised? You wanted him to look at you, but he didn't? I thought I looked at you. All right, let me just ask this one thing. Could it, could it possibly be that there's a glare on Mark's glasses that... All right. Sometimes we don't have the option. If I'm trying to read something, I've got to have glasses. So I'm not saying this is a blanket statement, but in giving seminars, if you do wear glasses, keep in mind that it could have a glare. I started wearing contacts recently, but I'm still not comfortable with them. It'll be interesting to see my eyes flipping up and down with contacts the next time. On the subject of comfort, we've talked about this a few minutes ago, and it relates to practicing this skill of eye contact. It's not going to feel comfortable anytime you change some kind of physical behavior much like people I know who've taken golf lessons in the process. Now, just change your grip about an eighth of an inch here, and it'll be fine. And they tell me that it never feels comfortable, not at least for uh, a few rounds. And it's the same with this eye contact. We're just asking you to do something that you already do in front of a group a little bit more up. How, yes, Don? I thought one thing you did very well was that when you changed eye contact, you paused, which kind of gave a new thought to the new person, which I think is good. Uh, rather than cutting off my eye contact in the middle of a statement and going to somebody else. All right, he had a smooth transition between people as he moved from place to place in the room. Yes, Frank? I'm going to have to ask you to move forward the next time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other specific comments for Mark? We'll have a chance to hear him at a higher volume one more time. All right, Mark. Thanks. Now, we're going to wrap up. The, the time is rapidly disappearing. It always goes too quickly when you're having fun. And we have one more talk, this final one, and I won't interrupt. We'll just give them in pretty quick succession. will be our last talk for each speaker. This one will be a favorite story about yourself. Another favorite story about yourself. Only this time, try to build into the story something that provides the raw material to get excited about. Perhaps something, perhaps like a sports story. Don, of course, got some uh, stories that could require some, some animated delivery, and that's what we're talking about. This ties it all together. What do you do with the rest of your body? You master eye contact. You know the words that you're going to say. 
Now let's put it all together and make sure our gestures work. Here's the answer to the question, what do you do with your hands in front of a group? The answer is, don't plan gestures. Do exactly the way you do. Watch other people to see this. Do exactly the way you do in a social situation where it is practically impossible to talk without using supportive gestures. They come out naturally. Now, if some of you remember seeing one of our former presidents give talks. He tried to, the president I'm thinking about, tried to memorize gestures, and he was fond of saying, my fellow Americans, I have two, two points I want to make today. The two fingers would go up in the air after the words came out of his mouth. How did that come across? <laughs> Perhaps that too. I think most people feel that it was rehearsed and therefore maybe insincere. I'm not saying that he was, but I'm saying that's how it can come across. Therefore, the advice is this about what to do with your hands. Get excited about the subject matter get rid of inhibitions, and this will automatically be right, what you do with your hands. Most of us watch most speakers. We get in front of a group. All the pressure is up here. Everybody, and there's only one show going on, and you're it. And the result is almost a, a reverse force that keeps all of our gestures in a little phone booth. We, we don't want to stick our hands out. Don, this applies to what I said about volume. You've got to use this space to look natural. Now, across the desk from somebody, you can make them very nervous if you start waving your arms about. But in front of a group in a room this size, I can't use too much space. This is the appropriate gesture if we're talking about something big. I taught a group of bankers in Hartford, Connecticut a couple of years ago in a videotape training program. And one of the speakers came to the front of the room to give a talk, and he said, I'm proud to announce that we're going to build a nine-story building in downtown Hartford <laughs> and put, it, put his hands right in front of him like this. One of his associates in the back of the room said, hey, that looks like a piggy bank. <laughs> Here's the point. Find in this story, hopefully you'll have some big things to do for us, but the key here and the key for all of us, when you take a videotape training program and see yourself getting uninhibited, it will unlock the natural speaker in you. Now, this is the thing we want to suggest for the three volunteers before they come up. Just get a little bit louder than you think you have to be. That was an unsolicited comment for all three of the speakers. We have a bone right next to our ear that prevents us hearing ourselves as other people do. So don't rely upon what you think is right. Get a little bit louder than you think you have to, and the result is, since this body is an ecosystem, the gestures will probably expand a little bit with your increased volume. Now, one final thing I'm going to say, then we'll have the three talks and it'll be over with. Here is for the analytical people in the room, and I, I know there are some people who like to have a scientific basis for everything they, they take in. Here's uh, some science for you about what we're doing right now, about adding enthusiasm and energy to a talk. How fast can a speaker crank out words in words per minute delivery? Anybody know? The suggestion is 160 words, and that's close enough. It's about 150 to 160. Clock a 60-second radio commercial, you'll hear about that many words come out. That's not very many words per minute for the brain power of the average adult. We know that because you can speed read at seven or 800 words per minute, can you not? How fast can the mind receive and process information when listening to a speaker? Faster than that. That's why we get bored so easily listening to speakers because our mind is working, let's say, on a slow day at 1,500 words per minute. What's happening between the 1,500 words per minute for every member of the audience and the puny production level of 150 words per minute? That's intellectual word power going out. What's happening in here? That's the war zone for keeping the audience's attention. All more reasons for doing something up here to keep the attention on you instead of noises, distractions, or as most people will tell you, even at an exciting information-packed meeting like the one we're attending right now, occasionally, even though we're interested in what's going on, our mind will go back to the office or to the golf course uh, or to the King Cole bar downstairs or someplace. That's the, that's the challenge for our speakers on our final talk. Add some enthusiasm 
Get louder than you think you have to. We've rented this room for the day. They can't stop us. And then we'll give you a little quick feedback after this last talk. Ken, are you ready? Don Schwal is the baseball person here. But I have two first cousins who were both relief pitchers for the University of Pennsylvania. They're about 10 years older than I am. When I was about eight years old, my cousin Harvey was just in his senior year of high school, and he was the captain, the cleanup hitter, and the catcher for the Clayton High School baseball team. And I had to be just like Harvey. So I convinced my folks to get me this catcher's mitt. It was terrific. It was big, it was soft, and it was designed actually to catch a hardball, although I was a bit frightened of one. As soon as I got it, Harvey was somewhere, and his older brother, Norty, was in town. I called him up. I said, Norty, please come over and pitch some in. He was on vacation from U of P. He came over. We got in the driveway. I held the mid up. He threw me his fastball. Not too fast, obviously. I was only eight. I caught it. Terrific. We did it again and again and again until, Har until Norty wound up, looked at me very seriously, threw his curveball, and it landed right between my eyes. Thanks. Nice job, Ken. Couple of quick comments before we hear Don's and Mark's. Yes. How are his gestures distracting? Specifically, what would he see on videotape? That, did you were you making an attempt to use gestures? That's what people are telling us from the audience. I appreciate the attempt from the standpoint of this workshop. But I think what we're hearing is it could look a little more natural if you just let it happen. Just let it happen. The most effective kind of gestures are the ones that describe something, like the catcher's mitt where you automatically put your hand out to show us. And if you'll think of it that way and, and cut down the effort on gestures, it'll look more natural. Thanks, Ken. Nice job. Give him another hand. Speaking in behalf of hey, the Don, Company. Not loud enough. Louder. Let's get a little bit louder. All right, speaking. Mm -hmm. Speaking in behalf of E.F. Hutton and Company around the region and the country as a whole, you know that I've done a lot of kidding about my baseball career. In fact, when I get into it, I talk quite a bit about some of my female relationships. However, today I want to set the record straight. I am a very happily married man. In fact, I just celebrated my 20th wedding anniversary. And at the dinner party that night, my wife confided something in me I think is really fantastic. She told me that after 20 years of marriage, I still satisfy her totally sexually. I think that's quite a compliment. I know it's true, because every night when we go to bed, I say, Patty, would you like to make love? And she says, no thanks, I'm satisfied. <laughs> Okay, Don, <laughs> thanks for the inside story. But let me ask just one question, and we'll let Don sit down. Great job on this talk. He's a good speaker to start with. We know that, but we're looking for that little extra millimeter of, of skill potential, which you can transfer to money in this business. Let me just ask one question. Did he get too loud? Don, that question was for you, because we can't hear ourselves, and I think if you'd bring that volume up a little bit more, it's more what we'd expect from seeing you here. Any other specific comments for Don? Yes. I would have liked to see his chest just that big, too. It would have been okay. <laughs> yeah, I think I probably do like you. I think I'm so oh, big, probably, you. that I'm afraid to really, you know. Just expect. try stretching out right this minute. You see, sometimes th this looks natural to everybody else in the room, but in front of a group, remember, we're still concerned about our image, and we don't want to look silly. We don't, and if we feel inhibited about doing something like this, we're probably not going to do it in front of a group. That's the point. Don, I'd give anything if we had videotape today just to get some of the comments captured visually here. Thanks very much. Thank okay, give him another hand. I must admit that some of my most animated stories have occurred not in baseball, not in track, not in cross country, but in the market, practicing my chosen profession. Before I got involved in tax shelters, I did a lot of naked options. I sold calls when the market rose, and I sold puts when the market declined, in that order. As a matter of fact, when I was asked one day, 
to what did I owe my enthusiasm for tax shelters, I told them I was naked ASA when it went to 90 and homestake when it was 80 and I had no place to go. And the incentive was that one day I was on the phone with a client who had just had a very large margin call. Those are the days before super restriction or when there was super restriction. And he said, what are you doing to me? Why am I doing business with you? Why are you talking to me now? Discuss this with my attorneys. And this went on and on. <laughs> I decided I needed shelter. So here I am. <laughs> OK. All right, let's have a couple of quick comments for Mark. How about this talk compared to his previous two? Any difference? Volume is up. What else? Gesture's better. Does that mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but more natural? I think, I think that's how it looks to me. Most people are nodding their head, yes, yes. <laughs> the mustache is coming in a little now. We have a very observant audience here today. Any other comments? Yes. And a great smile. Always does. Mark? Real story. Mm-hmm. Uh, the question I'm hearing is, on the telephone, do we want to communicate with the voice only? I don't know. I don't spend as much time on the phone as you... Well, I don't know if that's a desirable goal. I think if you were to think back over the things we've been doing today, and as I think of it right this minute, I'd have to say no, that the, the voice alone is not the communicator. By the way, what he said was, watching people in the office on the telephone, where there's nobody, at least on the other end of the phone, seeing it, there's still a lot of gestures going on, a lot of pounding the table and shaking fists and pointing in various directions. If that helps you communicate a little bit better, I think it's great. In fact, a survey was done recently about people listening to others on the telephone, and the result is you can tell on the phone whether a person is lying faster than you can in person. Now, to me, that says there are all kinds of hidden things, including pauses, tone of voice, the way you feel coming through. Remember a word from the 60s? vibes, vibrations. We're getting that all the time. It's part of communication, and I think we're stuck with it. Yes? I think everyone in this room communicate on a one-to-one -one basis, and yet some people have trouble public speaking. And I think it's because they, I, I know I did, until I remembered the, the application of the KISS rule. I think many people make, uh, seem to believe they have to use a, a different vocabulary, a different grammar if they're speaking before a group than they would on a one-to-one -one, uh, basis. And they get fouled up with thinking what words to use and the grammar rather than the content. And I think that's the biggest problem. And I, I think if you keep it simple, it works. I agree. It Keep it simple. It, it's really communicating one human being to another. And a lot of the things that we have done to try to enhance public speaking have backfired on us, if I hear what you're saying correctly. And I agree. Our time is up. Let me just say one thing as we leave. We've talked about two simple skills. We've done them in isolation. The key is to put it all together. One is look at people, human beings, eyeball to eyeball, complete a thought before you move on to another person. That's number one. And second, put some energy in it. You believe in what you're saying. Let us know that with some enthusiasm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before we sign off, we want to invite you to send us your comments and suggestions for other programs you'd like to see. In return for writing us, we'll send you our latest catalog listing all of our materials. Just send your comments to Listen and Learn, P.O. Box 396, Old Greenwich, Connecticut, 06870. Thanks for listening. We'd be happy to listen to you, too.
Experts disagree about fitness. Uh, for every physician who says that it will confer immunity against heart disease and prevent other death-dealing disturbances, uh, there's an equally prominent uh, expert who will say the opposite. And uh, neither can prove the other wrong. And so there'll be probably decades before we know actually the effect of fitness on disease. And what has happened because of that is the proponents of fitness have, when forced into a corner, start talking about the quality of life. They say, well, we're interested in the quality of life, not the quantity. What I've discovered is that it's both, that fitness does, of course, give you the qualities you need for life, but it increases the quantity as well. Welcome to this Listen and Learn program filled with useful information. This session is designed to sharply increase your awareness on the subject and give you ideas and knowledge that you can put to work right away. As with all Listen and Learn programs, you hear from the experts, people who have already been there and who have had success. We've structured the program to run under 45 minutes, which our research shows is the optimal listening period. So we won't take too much of your time. Of course, we can't hope to present everything there is to know in a short session like this, but we will give you all the important highlights so that you'll have a good overview when you've completed the session. For more information, listen to the message at the end of this cassette. Okay? Let's begin. Listen, learn, and enjoy. George Sheehan is a physician who's been in practice since 1949. In 1972, he became medical editor of Runner's World. Currently, he educates other doctors as well as the general public on fitness. Dr. Sheehan is the director of radiocardiography and stress testing at the Riverview Hospital in Red Bank, New Jersey, and has been running competitively for years, including completing the last 20 Boston marathons. He's written five books on fitness and has an enormous following coast to coast. Sports Illustrated said he is maybe the most important philosopher of sport. We know you'll be motivated by what you will learn from him. Dr. George Sheehan. First of all, what are the qualities we need for life? Uh, what, are, what are the qualities we need when we wake up in the morning and first venture out of bed for this ever-standing miracle, this 24 hours we've been delivered? And I like to think of what the Spanish philosopher Ortega once wrote, that we're here to write, act out, and produce our own drama. There is no precedent for you or for me. I am the one and only George Sheehan that will ever exist. And so we are each of us unique, never-to-be-repeated events. And therefore, we have every day to choose, pick and choose what we're going to do. As Ortega said, life is fired at us point blank, and we must choose. And so each day, then, is making this choice and acting out that drama that we were born to, to produce. And, and we see this in thinkers from the beginning of time. Uh, Emerson said, we're here to bear a fruit, to deliver a message, to have a point of view. And so what are the qualities then that we should rise for that day? It seems to me it, it, it very much resembles what happens in football. Football teams go into a game with a game plan. About two series of downs and the game plan is out the window. I remember there was a story about Benny Leonard, the great fighter, and he said, I win boxing matches because I keep the other fellow from doing what he wants to do. And what happens when you get up in the morning from, from minute one, you're beginning to find out that people are going to prevent you from doing what you want to do. Your game plan is going to go out the window. And so the winning coaches win not because of game plans, but they win because of fundamentals. And you find that Lombardi, Lombardi was the first coach that had 11 players in on every play. And 11 players doing the fundamentals. People who would block and tackle and run and pass. No fancy dance, just doing the fundamentals. And what are those fundamentals? Well, I think they are what one runner reported to uh, Dr. William Morgan up at the University of Wisconsin, a sports psychologist, about running. He said he had been running because of the energy, clarity, and self-esteem he received out on the road. It seems to me, and, and you'll see this thread starting with the Greeks in the 5th century BC, 
this thread of the three qualities of body, mind, and spirit, energy of the body, clarity of the mind, and self-esteem of the spirit, those things, you see this repeated again and again, this holistic approach to life, so that you're bringing all of your energies together, not only your physical energy, but your mental energy and your spiritual energy. And what, what fitness is, then, is not merely fitness of the body, you see. We're going back to that original classical idea of a sound mind and a sound body. The human machine is that body-mind complex that expresses the soul. We'll be repeating over this talk the idea of these three simple things. What we're coming to now is this holistic approach to life. We're getting a holistic approach to medicine, and we're beginning to have a holistic approach to management, all incorporating these three factors. So here's these qualities, then, that we need to face the day, and that's what we get. We have the energy now. When you use your body with intensity and become fit, you may not get longevity. You may not live a day longer, but you're going to live a longer day. I've been running for 20 years, and what that 20 years has done is given me a 20-year addition to my life. My day no longer ends when the work is finished. It begins. I have a second day. You know, Arnold Bennett wrote in 1910, he wrote a book, How to Live on 24 Hours a Day. He had come upon this great secret. We weren't going to get any more time. And so we have eight hours to sleep. We have 16 hours to work with. And what fitness does is give you that additional eight hours. So you have the energy. You have the energy to live that life. Now, what about the clarity? I like that word. Clarity has to do with perspective. It has to do with sense of humor. It has to do with knowing what's second rate and what's first rate. It's having to know with what is trivia and what isn't trivia. And so clarity allows you to take what is important in your life and concentrate on it. Not only that, what we find with the fit person, the fit person exercising, frees the mind and allows the mind to play. And then finally, we have the self-esteem. Well, I, you may have read this recent book by Reverend Robert Schuller called The New Reformation, Self-Esteem. And he discovered that through the Gallup poll that Americans who have self-esteem are happier, healthier, and more productive than those who have low self-esteem. So these are the factors that we will talk about, of introducing into your life. Now, I do a lot of talking on campus, and when I go to campus, I talk to these students about heresy. Again, this is a Greek word meaning choice. And what I'm asking them to do is choose the body. You go on, into the, on the campus, and you begin to realize that the body is a second-class citizen. We've been taught since we were, go to school that the body is bad, we have to save our soul. Then we, they, all they're concerned about is our IQ and PSAT tests, and then when we get to work, we're either a blue-collar worker or a white-collar worker. But the body is us. We're going to live this body physically. I mean, we're going to live this life physically, and we have to live at the top of our powers. And so we must learn physically to be all we can be. You know, it's odd that the real reasons for being fit are those we learn from the philosophers, not from the experts and the physicians or the physical educators or the coaches. The philosophers are the ones that point out the fact that we must be fit. It is part of our nature to be fit. We look back, and I keep going back to the 5th century B.C. Greeks because, you see, they were the first aristocrats. The word aristocrat comes from the word arete which means to function as you are supposed to function, to be the best you can be. Now, it's not the best in your community or the best in your company or even the best on your block. It's the best possible you, just that I'm trying to be the best possible George Sheehan. That's what arete means. Now, what the Greeks did, you see, was take their lives and, and try to make them a work of art. If you think about the 5th century BC Greeks, you realize that they had no antiquity. They were the first civilized people, and what they did was find that the body and mind should work as in harmony, 
And so their training of the body was equal to the training of the mind. If you read Plato's Republic, you see that he suggests that the mathematician lift weights and that the wrestler study philosophy. And so we had that sort of union, that first holistic idea. And the idea that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Every athlete knows that. Two and two makes five for the athlete. Once you get it all together, that's what the Greeks tried to get it all together. As a matter of fact, their word for leisure was skole. Their leisure was a school they went to to perfect themselves. And their curriculum was designed to make that life a work of art. And so this word arete keeps coming back every time we have an aristocracy, every time we have an affluent society where we have all the time and money to be anything we can be, we start going back to the body, perfecting the body. In Schopenhauer, when he talks about the self, he said, the self consists of what a man is, what a man has, and what people think about him. And he said, as you grow, you realize that 95% of that is what you are, not what you have or what people think about you. And so we see coming down Eric Fromm where he said, modern man has everything, he is nothing. And you, people begin to realize that. They go through this nouveau riche thing and then they realize it's the self that's important. And now I can develop myself. And what we're seeing in America right now is this grassroots movement. It's not due to the doctors. I wish as a doctor I could take credit for these 50 million people that are out developing their bodies and minds and souls. We had nothing to do with it. We were late in arriving. Physical educators have nothing to do with it. Why is it the kids who love to play hate phys ed? Because they destroyed the play element, and that's what we brought that back. And the coaches are elitist, that's fine, but they want to deal with motor geniuses, and they don't realize that each one of us is an elite. Each one of us deserves to be coached. Each one of us deserves to be the best body we can be. And what we found is that the rules are so simple. You know, human beings do not come in new and improved models. They're not like automobiles or other products in this technological age. The child born today is the same as the one born in the 5th century BC. And so we know those rules. The, the rules uh, of health have not changed, and what we're talking about is simply athletic training. And if you don't know what the Greeks did, at least you know what the Yankees and the Red Sox and the Cubs and the Knicks and the 76ers do. You know the rules that an athlete learns. Athletes are seeking a rete in the best possible way. If you had read, for instance, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, what he's looking for is quality. And when you get toward the end of the book, you realize, and he does, that quality equals a rete. What we, in our parlance, call a rete is class. It's simply having class. And we know that the athletes that have class are the ones that follow these rules. I found a simple listing of these rules in the studies done by the Breslow. They are sociologists on the West Coast at UCLA, and they studied a large group of people in 1972 and found there were seven rules for health, that people who observed these rules and were in their 60s, for instance, were in much better health and had a greater longevity than, than people in their 20s or 30s who observed only two or three of them. The rules are very simple. There are seven in number. The first rule is eat a big breakfast. Eat a good breakfast. And that's been our tradition over the centuries. Wherever there's hard work being done, and when you become an athlete, you're, do, you're going to be working hard, people eat a good breakfast. And not only that, it matches with our circadian rhythms, those bodily tides that ebb and flow. You see. We are supposed to peak around two to four in the afternoon. If you eat a good, solid breakfast, you're going to find that you will have a, a solid work day. And then, contrary to what we do, eating the big dinner at night, we should be taking pasta and carbohydrates and fruits and vegetables at night to bring the body down into sleep. I found going over the country that this vestiges of this large breakfast still remain. There's a cowboy's breakfast in Scottsdale and a farmer's breakfast in Minneapolis. My grandfather was a farmer, upstate New York. He was dead before I was born, but we used to hear stories about what they had for breakfast. Incredible. It was what we ate for dinner. It was pie and meat and everything else. Why? Because they weren't coming back. They ate and they went out on the fields and they worked all day. Now, the second rule was eat that big breakfast, lock yourself into a good work day, 
The second rule was don't eat between meals. If you eat a breakfast like that, you don't have to worry about eating between meals. You're not even going to think food until supper. The third was maintain your weight. Now, that sounds like a simple rule, but I'm in a study at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. It's a study of the physiological uh, rate of aging. Now, m most of the examples, the normals, so-called normals that we find in medical books are sedentary individuals. They make no allowance for training. So what we thought was the physiological aging of an individual was simply people rusting out. They were sitting around not training. They took 15 runners, similar to me, 60-year-old runners. The other the requirement was that we ran in college so they could match us now with 20-year-old runners that are in college that run approximately what we did 40 years ago. What they have discovered that in the 40 years since I was 20 and running at college as a miler, and, and right now I'm running competitively, that I have lost only 15% of my maximum oxygen uptake. Now that, unless I was in competition, that wouldn't be apparent. I am in as good shape as this 20-year-old for endurance activity. That my energy level is practically identical to what it was when I was 20. And that aging is a myth. Now Walter Bortz, uh, whose father was president of the AMA, and he's uh, at the Palo Alto Clinic, did a study recently where he set up in two columns, the effect of inactivity and the effect of so-called aging. They're identical. The, the blood pressure goes up, the heart size goes down, the cardiac output goes down, you lose calcium out of your bones, you lose lean bus muscle mass, all with activity, all presumably with aging. What we thought was aging was simply inactivity. And so this use of the body can, can start at any age. You can start into a fitness activity whether you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. We have people in their 80s now getting into fitness programs. There's a lady, 84, that ran the New York Marathon last year. There's no limits to what you can do. So those are the first three rules. The fourth rule is don't smoke. Well, tobacco is one of a number of pollutants that we should avoid. Uh, we know that the running body does not want to smoke. I never told people not to smoke in my practice. I, I think that once you, you get started into a fitness program, your body will, will stop the smoking. Your body has a mind of its own that will cease smoking. Uh, Peter Wood at Stanford has done studies on uh, relatively high mileage runners who were three and four pack a day smokers. None of them smoke anymore. However, the running body apparently likes to drink. And Peter Wood found that a, a numbers of these, um, these high mileage runners uh, took two, three, four drinks a day. Oddly, this was in accord with what the Breslows found. Their fifth rule was drink moderately. And now we have substantial evidence coming in that two drinks a day is probably, uh, if not beneficial, at least is not harmful. And people who take two drinks a day apparently live longer than people who totally abstain or those that take more. So drink moderately. The fifth rule, or sixth rule, was get a good night's sleep. Well, this is a peculiar, I thought when I read this, this is peculiar because how does one go and get a good night's sleep? One cannot force a good night's sleep. And what I finally discovered this from my own experience is that the Breslows were reporting what these people told them, that they did indeed have a good night's sleep. Well, a good night's sleep is in the eye of the sleeper. <laughs> and I'm 64 years old, and that is an age that the World Health Organization calls elderly. And if you read about the elderly, you find that we do indeed have sleep disturbances. We have trouble getting to sleep, and then our sleep is interrupted repeatedly during the night for things that I won't go into in any detail. But, and it is. But what I discover, because I love to use that time to think, is that this time getting to sleep, I enjoy, and then I enjoy being awakened and have another opportunity to think again. I would put it this way, that I use my running to uh, write my columns and to think out my speeches and to uh, develop lectures. And so that running is my creative time. Next best time is when I'm lying in bed about to go to sleep. 
And if you've ever been a writer, you know that you're trying to get the, what is called a lead, which is the theme of what you're writing. And you're trying to get the first paragraph, because then it follows, everything follows after the first paragraph. And what you get, trying to look, you're looking for is the absolute best first sentence, so no one will ever forget that first sentence. And so you, I'm lying there in bed looking for that theme and the first paragraph and that absolute best, best sentence, and then the next day I know I'm asleep. <laughs> But fortunately, because I'm elderly, I'm again awakened, and I have another opportunity to do this. And so the night goes. And if somebody was in the, in the house, they'd say, well, George had a terrible night. I heard him up five times when actually I had a wonderful night's sleep. What the Breslows were saying was that a good night's sleep means a good day that you can think about. The people that have a bad night's sleep have days that they don't want to lie awake thinking about. And so what they were reporting were people that were psychologically secure, who felt good about what they were doing and enjoyed themselves. And their final rule, and of course this is the key that we're talking about, is exercise regularly. Now exercising regularly in the fitness formula means 30 minutes. A lot of people ask me how many miles I should run, how many laps I should swim, how far should I go on the bicycle, how far should I walk. It has nothing to do with distance. It has to do with time. It's minutes. It's 30 minutes. And then people will say, well, how fast? Uh, uh, should I run 10-minute miles? Should I walk uh, three miles in an hour? Or should I cycle so many miles or so many laps? And it has nothing to do with, with that numerical kind. It has to do with a perception you have of your effort. It has to do with being comfortable. Now, comfortable is a, is a place between light and somewhat hard. It's in there where you can feel that the body's doing something, but it's enjoyable. And, and it's that dialing to that, that's the training pace. So it's 30 minutes at this comfortable rate. If you're uncertain about what's comfortable, you can use the talk test, which is the ability to talk with someone while you're running, or walking, or jogging, or cycling. Uh, the AMA, American Medical Association, suggests that level is the, t the point at which you first begin to breathe through your mouth instead of through your nose. So these are ways to establish comfortable. This is 30 minutes at a comfortable pace. Now, how often do you have to do it? Well, the suggestion is four times a week. That is a minimum weekly requirements for fitness would be this 30 minutes at a comfortable pace four times a week. Now. Is 30 minutes, or are 30 minutes enough? Well, yes, physically it's enough. But what we're thinking about is this total fitness. And again, I'm thinking of this three-level sort of situation. And if you think of it over the ages, what the experts in all these functions of the self have asked us for is an hour a day. So the physiologists want an hour a day for our body. The thinkers want an hour a day for our mind. And the, and the preachers want an hour a day for our soul. And I'm, we see this. Uh, physiologists can prove it. You can go and give this hour a day and get on a treadmill, and in 12 weeks, your physical work capacity has increased three or four hundred percent. Now, what about the thinkers? I remember a quote from Emerson. He said, I believe that to every well ordered mind, and we can all have a well ordered mind, comes a thought each day. Comes a thought each day. So he said, Thinkers since the time of Pythagoras have set aside an hour a day to go and see what the oracle has to impart. What I find is I take this hour from my body and I'm also going consulting the oracle because I'm able to think while I'm running. As far as your soul is concerned, I remember a book by uh, Father Henri Nouvan, who is a lecturer and teacher and writer, a Belgian priest who at one point was so caught up with his lecturing and teaching and writing while he was preaching meditation and solitude <laughs> that he, he had no time for meditation and solitude. So he finally he said, decided to take a step back and he went to uh, a Trappist monastery uh, in Genesee, New York, which is outside of Rochester, seven months. So he wrote a book called A Genesee Diary. And in that he discovered, he took this step back and spent the seven months, but when he was coming out, he realized he was still Henri Nouvin. He had not changed. 
he was fine in the monastery, but he knew as soon as he got outside, he was going to be the same, in the same situation. So he went to the abbot and he said, what am I going to do? And the abbot said, you must take Genesee with you. You, see? you have to take this experience with you and spend an hour each day renewing it. And so, you see, this whole thing, this whole fitness thing is to bring these three forces together, the body, mind, and soul. Get that hour. Take that step back that Henri Nubin did. Oddly enough, when he went in the monastery, they immediately assigned him the kitchen to make bread, and he had to go out and, and collect rocks to build a chapel. Then he had his little cell where he could go to and, and meditate, and then he had the community where he was drawing the spiritual strength. We can do the same thing. We can go out. We have that hour for our body to perfect that body. Going back to the philosophers, you see Thoreau saying, our first duty is to make to ourselves a perfect body. Spencer, the philosopher, said, and uh, he was thought at that time to be the most intelligent man in England back in the mid-1800s. In his treatise on education, he said, if you wish to be a success in this life, you must be first a good animal. And you see that again and again in the philosophers. They call us animals. That's the substrate. Then they put adjectives, social, technological, problem-solving, theological. Whatever you do, however you function humanly, you begin as this animal, to be the best possible animal, to have all that energy. You see, our terrible tendency is, is not to cheat other people, it's to cheat on the self. What I've found now, I no longer compare myself to anybody else. I'm not superior or inferior to anyone else. I am superior or inferior to the self that I've been made to be. And that is where we, we, we're using that 24 hours to develop the self and develop it in these three aspects again. To be that good animal, the philosophers ask us to be. And then to be, become the thinking animal and finally the loving spiritual animal. And, and you put this all together, but it has to start physically. Now, please turn over the cassette to continue. I see this again and again. When I go out and I speak to runners, there might be 500 people in the room, and I know there are 500 stories. There's a before they got into, we can call that their particular fitness program, that running program, there's a before and an after. They have been transformed, and what they have done is done it themselves, you see. This is a human potential movement with movement. This is a human potential movement that involves the mind and the spirit as well as the body. You know, William James, who is the American philosopher, said life is made in doing, which is the body, in creating, which is the mind, and in suffering, which is the soul. And it's, again, we see those three, three concepts, you know. He was the uh, president of the American Philosophical Society. In 1906, he gave a speech as presidential address. And he said, tonight, gentlemen, I want to consider the problem of the energies of man. To what extent do we have energies? You know, only physicians weren't asking that. Physical educators, coaches weren't even asking that. Here's the philosophers asking, to what extent do we have energy? And James said then, he said, I notice there are people who have a second wind and a third wind and a fourth wind. They seem to have subterranean sources of energy. And he said, when I look around, I realize that most of us are leading lives inferior to ourselves. And, and in that, he meant inferior to ourselves in every aspect. And not 
not inferior to the person next to you or or the mayor or the corporate executive around, just inferior to the self you could be. This is where the philosopher is coming down to each individual soul and saying you are cheating on that self that you were born to be. Possibly the the best account, a kind of a spiritual and psychological biography on becoming an athlete, because that's what we're talking about. Becoming an athlete. Not on you see, again James, he called athletes secular saints. And he called saints athletes of God. See, becoming an athlete, the word comes from the Greek, comes from two Greek words. One is prize, one is struggle. You see, the struggle is for the prize that's yourself. So it's this idea of becoming an athlete that 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 goes through this whole trend in, in the philosophers in James and the rest. I think the the best description of becoming an athlete is in a book by Yukio Mishima called Sun and Steel. Mishima was the Japanese candidate for the Nobel Prize. He was a, well, among his novels uh, is uh, The Captain Who Fell from Grace on the Sea. And he was an actor, playwright, uh, complete intellectual. Uh, Sun and Steel is an account of as he said, a puny intellectual becoming an athlete. It began because of his interest and his desire to commit suicide. As a matter of fact, this book was written in his 46th year, which was the year he did indeed commit suicide. And I don't understand, uh, and I'm sure most of us don't understand, this interest or part of the Japanese tradition and culture. But the book itself is a marvelous description by a man who uh, was a consummate artist and, and a handler of words of the athletic experience. One of the things that uh, Mishima said he discovered was that his body did not speak Japanese, that he learned things through his body that there was no words for. And he said the supreme nonverbal uh, expression was, was group uh, pain the feel of, of sharing of pain with other people. And people who are in athletic uh, contests realize this. They're aware of this, that uh, there's something that cannot be expressed when you join with other people in, in sport. But basically what occurred with Mishima was that he, he perfected himself physically. Sun was the fact that he came out of, uh, into the sunlight. He was writing all night and, and spending his his uh, nights in his activity. Instead, he came out into the sun and became an athlete. Steel was the use of weights to develop the classical body. Eventually, and this is in his 46th year, he said, eventually I became the person my creator had in mind the day I was born. He had achieved his objective, and that's when he went with his companions, I think, to the emperor's palace and, and committed suicide. When I spoke earlier about the uh, speaking to college students and, and advising them on heresy and making choices, the first choice is for the body. The second choice is for play. Again, you see, play has been discarded from our, uh, our, our concept of adult life. It would disappear somewhere around grammar school. We get into high school and we have phys ed and teams we can't make and we show school spirit by watching other children have fun. But Play itself is something that is necessary for creativity. Again, we find this thought expressed in writers over the century. We had the uh, people who had to walk in order to think. We have the peripatetic philosophers in Greece. We have the lake poets. And almost every thinker, when you look in the diary, you find that they were great walkers. Kierkegaard had something about, I walk myself into my best thoughts. I walk myself into health. There's no, there's no disease I cannot walk away from, no thought so bad that I can't dispose of it by walking. And Thoreau saying, the length of my walking is the length of my writing. At the turn of the century, almost all the uh, faculty members in, in the English uh, colleges were great walkers, took what were called constitutional, seven or eight mile walks. And so, again and again, we see this idea that somehow walking opens up the brain, but somehow movement of the body opens up the brain and, and lends itself to, uh, to meditation and creativity. 
I, I've made a study of these things, and I keep picking up uh, mention in Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, in his books, he mentions that walking, in walking, the action is so automatic it frees the mind to do whatever it wants. He speaks about uh, sculling on the Charles. I've always been tempted to try that myself, as lending itself to this uh, mental activity. In Emerson, we see that walking is excellent for gymnastics of the mind. And so, when we talk about this hour for the body, you see that the same hour is for the mind. If you can do something that the body will do automatically so you can dissociate from it. The fitness formula that I spoke of has uh, duration, 30 minutes, uh, intensity, comfortable, frequency four times a week. But then you might ask, well, what is it that I do? In the fitness formula, the first thing, of course, is the mode of exercise. What is the mode of exercise? How, what exercises may I do to get fit? Well, we have learned since 1968 that almost all the effects of fitness activity is on the periphery. It's in the muscle. Now, the heart is the muscle and partakes of this, but the essential changes are in the muscle. Now, therefore, the more muscle you use in fitness activity, the more fit you'll become. And that's why you try to use large muscle groups and preferably, of course, would be in the legs because that's where your largest muscles are. So any activity that uses the legs, large muscles of the legs, continuously for 30 minutes at a comfortable pace will make you fit. And that leaves it only open to your ingenuity. The primary ways of doing that, of course, would be walking, cycling, jogging, swimming, aerobic dancing, uh, rope skipping, cross-country skiing, uh, so you can see any activity that will use these muscles continuously. Now, you might mention tennis. What about tennis? Well, people who put a stopwatch on tennis players find that they are active five minutes out of the half hour. So if you're going to use a racket sport, you should have a friend clock you with a stopwatch to see how much of that time on the court you're actually in motion. Similarly with golf and other activities, you'll find that uh, when you do a time study on them, that the 30 minutes takes quite a bit of time, more than as in running and walking and swimming and cycling is virtually continuous. So the mode of activity is to use large muscle groups continuously, and any activity that will do that will make you fit. I was saying that when I speak to uh, college students and, and, and preach heresy, that they must choose play. And finally, that they must choose some type of discipline activity that involves some sweat and effort and even pain. And because that's where you're going to come up with the final value from your fitness program, which has to do with your own self-image and self-esteem. What occurs then, when you develop self-esteem, you're going to find that you trust your own experience that you're willing to make choices, you're willing to take risks, you're willing to live that your own life out of your own experience. It is true, I think, and I've discovered, that only those things that are self-experience will change behavior. You can listen to a lot of talk and be convinced, perhaps, in your own mind, but unless you've experienced the truth of what you've been told, you, you won't follow it. And when I speak to runners, I find that this is so. What they have done is come to make their own decision. They've become athletes. They've learned to listen to their body. They've learned to listen to what their mind is telling them, and they learn to trust their emotions. And they are acting now out of the self that they've developed. I met a runner in a race up in New York State, and he said to me, I'm 165 pounds now, and three years ago I was 230, smoked three packs of cigarettes a, a day, and drank five quarts of booze a week. And now he was 165 pounds, and he was in this race that I'd been in. It's, I thought at that time that if he'd gone to a psychiatrist three years before, what would have developed? Would anything have happened? Uh, would he have changed in any way? They might have been able to stop his smoking and drinking, but they wouldn't have found the person that was incognito in that body. And now here we have this person transformed and by his own hand. That, I think, is what fitness does for you. It, it brings out that person, that individual that you are, that may now be incognito in that body. 
that mind that has been rusting away and, and, and has done nothing creative and that soul that is neatly wrapped and unused. And what we're looking for then is primarily to learn how the human machine works. When you think of it, how much t of your education has been spent in learning how to make a living and not learning how to live? Learn how the human machine works. Learn that the, that the human body is one of the marvels of the universe, that like David, we're marvelously made, that, that we have capabilities, as William James said back in 1906, to what extent do we have energies? Does anybody realize that energy is resident in your body? What we're seeing is a revolution in energy in this country. Uh, women who thought a trip to the shopping center was a big deal are now going out and running marathons. I met Jesse Bell the other day, who was with uh, uh, president of Bonnie Bell Company, and they put on races uh, for women, just for women, and he was leaving to the West Coast to attend their first triathlon. 1,000 women in a triathlon. I find that it incredible even to me, and I'm sure thinking of that 10 years ago it would have been inconceivable. What we're having is this tremendous revolution in, in our, our thinking. Again, we go back to the fact that what we're in now is a renaissance. We have this new aristocracy and the requirements, not only this affluent, this affluent society sets us up, what we have is an elevation of our consciousness to what we can do, and then the opportunity to do it. To have your consciousness elevated as William James was trying to do to his fellow philosophers is simply to observe what your neighbors are doing. To see that America is developing a consensus about lifestyle. We are seeing in this country a new generation that has, has superseded the me generation. You now, Thomas Wolfe said, what will you do when you have all the time and money to do whatever you want to do? We saw what happened. People dropped out. They, they saw this nouveau riche society and decided they didn't want any part of it and dropped out, but they dropped out physically, they dropped out mentally, they dropped out spiritually. This is not happening now. America, as I see it, has decided to play this game to the hilt. They are coming in and living life right at the peak of their powers. And, and the experts have no recognition of this. Doctors think people are out running on the roads because of their high-density lipids or hypertension when they're actually finding the self. Physical educators think we're doing this simply to become fit when we're finding play and creativity and all these other values. And the coaches think that we should be all spectators watching the experts. And we realize that we are the experts. We are the experts in ourselves. And we are the stars. We are the athletes. And each day is an Olympiad to us just as much as it is to Frank Shorter and Bill Rogers and, and all those great gold medal winners. So that's where I see uh, fitness coming from. I think that fitness is something that goes back over the centuries. The rules are simple. It's simply a matter of, of having your consciousness elevated to your own capabilities. We have the opportunity and the rules uh, are there to be followed. Once one gets into fitness, uh, the tendency is to go further and to become an athlete and to uh, have the athletic experience. Now, I uh, had occasion to speak in Ottawa to the sports psychologist on the meaning of sport in life. I was assigned to that with two or three other uh, gentlemen and, and after some thinking about it, I came up with this, this idea about the athletic experience, that it was divided into three parts. The first part is exercise, and that's, that's the physical fitness part of being an athlete. It, exercise is work. It's going out and, and doing interval quarters and laps and things that the coach is, is, is putting you through in order for you to compete at a later date. And this part of the fitness uh, experience is almost totally sensual. It can be good. I mean, it's just that good feeling about sweating and the rest. It isn't the total athletic experience as you would expect. The next part of it is competition. It is the contest, it is the race or the game. And that part is what William James first 
suggested as being the moral equivalent of war. He felt that we needed an arena where we could be heroic. We needed a theater where we were able to do these great deeds, and it isn't available anymore. We need some place to be bigger than life. And sport, regardless of where it is, if it's on a racquetball court or in a tent on a Sunday day in a seaside town, affords that arena. It gives you that bounded area. True, it's an artificial situation, but everything you feel is actual. The pain is actual. The challenge is actual. Your response is real. It's something that you can experience totally and directly. And so that competitive effort it enables us to make that heroic activity. Now, as I see that, that then goes into our subconscious and becomes part of ourselves. And it's and it becomes something we now use as material in producing our own art, just as any artist would do. Now, Frost once said, to write a poem, you have to have an experience. To live your life, you have to have some experiences to derive the material. And, and sport gives that good information. Now, I, I heard this interview that Bill Moyes had with Theodore Rozak, and he was talking about his childhood as a Catholic and, and going to confession and said, looking inside into this chamber of horrors, I think that we, we see too much bad inside of us. This is, again, what Reverend Shuler says about self-esteem. The churches have emphasized the bad instead of what's good. So it, sport tells us what's good about us. And then what happens during the week, and this is how I use it, I'm not sure how other runners do, but you kid, it, in, during the week when you're on these little training runs, now, I run my training runs during the week at two minutes over my race pace. Now, suppose I'm racing, say, at six minutes and 30 seconds a mile. I go out and train at eight minutes and 30 seconds. My body is virtuoso. Two minutes slower, it feels like it's an Olympic champion. You know, It can do it automatically. I just put my body on automatic pilot, let it have fun, and now I'm into my mind. And what's in my mind? Somehow that racing experience that, that good feeling, the good experience I had with myself is going to come out in my day. That's why I say w that these runners are transformed, that their lives are different because of their running. It's because of this experience they've had, this good experience they've had, and then the meditative uh, run that comes out in something in their daily life. This is it's a little hard to think of your life as being a work of art, but it is. I remember something in Emerson where he said, the value of each individual soul is the ability to transform the world into a particular language. See, all artists are doing are transforming the world into their language. Whether, And as Emerson said, it need not be an essay or a statue or a piece of poetry. It might be a trade. It might be a profession. It might be a character. It might be just a way of life. And that's what... Whatever your art is, whether your art is selling or uh, teaching, or whether it's parenting, you're going to do it differently because of the different person you've become through that athletic experience. And so these people are different. And, and the way I see them, I think runners are wonderful people. And I don't think we were wonderful before we started running. We were like everybody else. <laughs> And it's this thing that we've taken, this activity, not only the fitness, that's great. I mean, to become that body you're supposed to be, to have that hour uh, for your body. But this, this, this competitive experience, there's no difference to me in a race as the winner, who is, <laughs> you know, he's in his sweats by the time I get there. He has gone through the exact experience I have. And no difference between me and this housewife who's finishing minutes and many minutes behind me is having the identical experience. Uh, so it's this business of becoming the athlete that is the, is the culmination of the fitness program. You begin by becoming fit. Fitness allows you to look for that life you're to lead. Being an athlete means you've found it. Before we sign off, we want to invite you to send us your comments and suggestions for other programs you'd like to see. In return for writing us, we'll send you our latest catalog listing all of our materials. Just send your comments to Listen and Learn, 
P.O. Box 396, Old Greenwich, Connecticut, 06870. Thanks for listening. We'd be happy to listen to you, too. cannot become wealthy without going into debt. It is impossible. Wealth is when small efforts produce large results. Poverty is when large efforts produce small results. It is not cash. It is not material possessions. Wealth is what's in your head. If you understand the principles of wealth, which I'm going to share with you, you don't have to have any money. But if you don't understand the principles of wealth, it doesn't matter how much money you have to start with. Welcome to this Listen and Learn program, filled with useful information. This session is designed to sharply increase your awareness on the subject and give you ideas and knowledge that you can put to work right away. As with all Listen and Learn programs, you hear from the experts, people who have already been there and who have had success. Of course, we can't hope to present everything there is to know in a short session like this, but we will give you all the important highlights so that you'll have a good overview when you've completed the session. For more information, listen to the message at the end of this cassette. Okay? Let's begin. Listen, learn, and enjoy. Hello, my name is Robert Allen, and I'm the author of the book, Creating Wealth. And I've got a question for you. Have you ever wondered why it is that money seems to flow to some people like a magnet and seems to be repelled by others? Why is it that most people struggle financially and only a small percentage ever really make it? Is it possible to create wealth? I guess you're really concerned with the question, can you become wealthy? Well, in the next few minutes, you and I are going to spend some very important time together, and I'm going to be answering these questions for you. But before we start, so that there will be no mistake, I want to make sure that you understand, and I will say it emphatically, you can become wealthy, starting from where you are right now in 10 years or less. I'll cover with you how to develop a wealthy mindset, how to understand the principles of wealth, how to launch yourself into financial self-reliance, how to pick an appropriate strategy that's just right for you, and how to set up your wealth and put it on automatic pilot. Now, there are going to be some theories to talk about, but remember, there's going to be plenty of nitty-gritty detail and specific information that you can use immediately to help you make more money, to increase your net worth dramatically, and even help you save some taxes. And along the way, we'll delve into some of the deeper philosophical questions like, what is wealth? But remember... It's the nitty-gritty that I think you're interested in, and we'll get that. We'll cover a lot of it. In fact, my goal is by the time we get to the end of this tape, you're going to know how to be wealthy, and that includes money also. And if this goal has not reached, your time and my time will have both been wasted, and I don't want that to happen. In short, we're going to have a lot of fun. And you know what's really exciting about this tape for me? You're going to learn, and I'm going to have a chance to internalize one more time the, the thought that is very powerful in my life. You don't have to be crooked or unethical or immoral to be wealthy. I know that's what the world teaches, but you don't have to be that way. And we're going to talk about how to achieve win-win wealth, even in a win-lose world. 
So where do we begin? Well, let's begin where it all begins, at birth. And did you realize, as the first chapter of my book says, that most of us are programmed to fail financially from the moment we're born? Now, I know I'm treading on thin ice here, but stick with me for a moment. What we learn from our parents and from TV and from our schools and even from our churches does really not prepare us for wealth at all. As Josh Billings said over a century ago, the trouble with people is not that they don't know, but that they know so much that just ain't so. Perhaps an illustration would help. Back when I was just beginning in this process of becoming wealthy, we had a friend that lived in the neighborhood next to us. And while we were taking the time to invest carefully in our properties, etc., this friend of ours and his wife were spending their time investing in a career. And he became a fireman. And becoming a fireman was very exciting to him. Problem was, after a little while, he realized he wasn't making enough money. You see, he was working 24 hours on and 48 hours off. 24 hours on and 48 hours off. And the income to him was not sufficient to meet his needs. And so guess what they decided to do? They thought about it, and they decided to go back to school. He always wanted to be an engineer. And so facing them was going to be a two- or three- or four-year education decision. And I met them in the grocery store one day, and I'm trying to illustrate this point of being programmed in the way the world thinks about money. And I said, what are you going to do that for? And he said, well, I'm going to go back and I'm going to earn some more money. I'm making $15,000, 18000 a year right now, and I think I'd like to go out and make some more money. How much more money would you make? Well, maybe twenty five, thirty thousand. We don't know. Surely going to increase our, our benefits somewhat. And I said to him, well, you seem to have the most ideal job in the world. 24 hours on, 48 hours off. And what could you do during that 48 hours? You could concentrate on your wealth. You could learn. You could study. Instead of learning how to become an engineer, you could learn how to invest better, more carefully. You could spend time looking for bargain properties. You could analyze. You could become wealthy. Having that job is just a way for you to support the habits you have, like eating and sleeping and paying your bills. But they were completely programmed to think in another way. You see, he wanted a job. He wanted security. He wanted someone else to be responsible. He thought that he couldn't become wealthy because he never thought about it. And I want to illustrate for you and make sure you understand that there are at least nine major myths out there that are very, very entrenched that govern the way people in the United States think about money. And it's sad. They think a job is good, but it's not. It's just a way of supporting yourself. And it will never take you to wealth. They think that security is good, but security is a myth. Never was. There is no such thing as security. There are only varying degrees of risk. And what he was doing, our, my fireman friend, was he was, in essence, relying on someone else to provide security for him when he could have been creating his own security. Think about those millions of people who are unemployed right now. Think about how much security means to them. Is there such a thing as job security? Do those two words go together anymore? Is there such a thing as social security? Do those two words go together? No. The only security you have is in between your own two ears. And even that is illusory. What about risk? You see, he didn't want to take the risk of spending 48 hours looking for his own fortune because he didn't know how to do it. He wanted to take the road that so many people have traveled down. And so risk was bad to him, and failure was bad to him. And this is what keeps so many people from making it. Remember that risk is the price you pay for opportunity. And if you want opportunity, instead of worrying about risk and failure, you've got to love it. Isn't that what our country is built upon? Risk. That's its greatness. Now what about someone else taking the responsibility? I'm sorry, but the government has taught us that they are becoming more and more responsible for us when the only way that you can really become independent is for you to assume full responsibility for your wealth and not to let anyone assume it for you. And that last myth, at least one of the most entrenched, is that it takes money to make money. The reason he wasn't willing, my fireman friend, to go out 
and try and create his own wealth is because he thought you have to be wealthy in order to become wealthy. In other words, it takes money to make money, doesn't it? No. It doesn't have to be your money. It may take some money to get started. But what you need to get started is an idea. And then the rest comes. And the money is attracted to your good ideas. And it doesn't have to be your money. Now, I realize this sounds a little philosophical. And forgive me if you would. But it's important to lay a foundation. The last couple of myths, let me mention, so that you know what they are. People generally have an aversion to debt. They hate it. They say debt is bad. And there are two kinds of debt. There's debt for consumer items. Yes, that's bad. You buy things that go down in value, that's stupid. At least if you don't have a lot of money. But the second part of that is there are investment debts. Debts for buying real estate, for instance, just to pull one off the top of my head. In order to become wealthy, let me make a bold statement, and I, I may shock a few. But you cannot become wealthy without going into debt. It is impossible. And therefore, if you have an aversion to debt, work on that. You've got to learn how to love debt. You've got to be able to say to yourself, I want to acquire debt, borrowed money, leverage, other people's money, OPM. I need it in order for me to become successful. Now, I want to get it carefully, selectively, well thought out, well organized, well planned, but I've got to have it if I want to become wealthy. And there are so many people who try and point us in the opposite direction. I remember uh, a gal that was doing the uh, engineering work on a radio program I was doing several years ago, and she listened to me talk about these concepts. And she came up to me after the program and she said, You know, Bob, what you're saying is so logical, but it goes against everything my parents have always taught me. And I looked at her and I said, How well are your parents doing? And she looked back at me with understanding and she said, Oh, they're strapped to the wall. They haven't got two nickels to rub together. Now I understand. You can't let this programming overcome the principles that you need to create wealth. Now what about that myth that I talked about right at the very beginning, the win-lose myth? Everybody thinks you have to be a crook to make it, but you don't. In fact, when you make it, generally you make it in a win-win way. Everybody wins, and you can have it that way. Where do we learn these myths where do we learn the myth about uh, having to be crooked? I mean, it's blasted on TV every Friday night, every Tuesday night, every Sunday night, with Dallas and Dynasty and all the other programs. You don't have to be that way. That is only a minority of the way it really is. Now, we'll talk about the philosophical question of wealth. What is it? My favorite definition is wealth is when small efforts produce large results. Poverty is when large efforts produce small results. You can see it every day when you're driving to work, can't you? Do you drive to work? Are you listening to this tape right now in your car as you're crawling along the freeway on that trek to and from work every day? Large efforts. What results are you getting? Are you on the wrong road? You see, I like to put my wealth on automatic pilot, and I'll discuss that in detail with you in just a few moments. I like that wealth to come into me without me having to work for it. I like to have small efforts produce large results. That's what wealth is. But wealth is deeper than that, isn't it? Wealth is not money. It's not material things. It never was. I tried to prove this with a recent challenge I did with the Los Angeles Times. Well, they challenged me to live up to a statement I'd said on my previous book, which is a bestseller entitled Nothing Down. I said, send me to any city of the United States, take away my wallet, give me a $100 bill, and in 72 hours I'll buy an excellent piece of real estate using none of my own money. You see, they thought that my wealth was my credit, my financial statement, my cash, my equity, my job, my cash flow. And I said, if that's what wealth is, then take it from me. And then put me in a city and let me show you that that's not what wealth is. They dropped me off in the city, uh, San Francisco to be exact. And on that morning at 8.30 in the morning, I stood there in the airport and they took my wallet from me. The reporter at my side gave me five $20 bills. And in the next 72 hours, I was challenged to go out into that marketplace where prices were extremely high and to buy one piece of real estate using none of what 
they thought was the real wealth. It took me 57 hours to buy seven properties, $722,000 worth of real estate, using none of my own money. You see, my wealth was in my head. It wasn't in my pocketbook. And once you grasp that concept, it's powerful because then you learn that education is the shortest distance between wealth and poverty. And if you want to go from poverty to wealth, you need to put the information into your head. A machine in a factory broke down and an expert was called in to fix it. He looked at the machine and he said, I know what's wrong with it. He took his hammer out, he tapped twice in a certain place and the machine immediately started to work. He handed his simple bill to the superintendent and all it said on it was cost $250. The superintendent is aghast. I mean, how can you spend $250 for two seconds worth of work? And he was furious. He said, I want an itemized bill on my desk in the morning. And in the morning, the bill came. Tapping with a hammer, $1. Knowing where to tap, $249. Together, you and I are going to learn where to tap. And once you learn it, it's easy. Now, I know that sounds ridiculous, but once you understand where to tap, it's as easy as making that machine go. Therefore, wealth is not money, it is thoughts. It is not things. It is not cash. It is not material possessions. Wealth is what's in your head. How to create a wealthy mindset. You see... What so many people think is that it's your connections, it's the fact that you're born with a silver spoon in your mouth, that you're born under a lucky star. That's how you get so wealthy. But really and simply, the reason that the wealthy are wealthy is that they think wealthy. And the last thing you want to hear is that you have to change your attitudes, but that's the way it is. It has to be that way. How do you create a wealthy mindset? Well, there are five specific steps. First, you set goals. Now, I'll bet you've heard that before. As a matter of fact, in audiences I've spoken to around the country, I ask a question of the audience. How many of you have heard that it's important to set realistic financial goals if you want to become financially independent? And 100% of the people in the audience raise their hands. And then I ask the telling question, how many of you could now go to your homes and find for me a previously written set of written financial goals, and guess what? Maybe three, four, five percent of them raise their hands. They know what they ought to do, but they very rarely do it. And goals are so critical. The great Zig Ziglar tells the story I think is fantastic about the study they did at Yale University in 1954 when they took and asked a group of graduating students in 1954 how many of them had written financial goals, and guess how many? Only three percent had written goals. 10% had goals that were clearly fixed but were not written down, and 87% had no idea what they were going to do financially as they left school. They took that same graduating class and followed them for 20 years, and in 1974, they resurveyed and found out how well this group had done. And guess what? The 3% with written goals had done better financially than the other 97% combined. Now, I'd, I'm not saying that goals are essential, nor am I saying that if you don't have goals, you can't make it. But what I am saying is they must help somewhat, and therefore I highly encourage you to write them down. And when you write them down, do the second step, which is visualize, will you? Visualize what it is you want those goals to accomplish for you. Suppose you pick a magic figure like a million dollars. It's becoming less and less attractive these days because you almost need five million to make it anymore. But pick a big figure. What is it that you really want to do with your money when you get that money in your hands? Picture in your mind what it is you're going to do. Is it travel? Is it golf on all the famous golf courses in the world? Is it service to others? What is it? Imagine it. And the subconscious mind will help you reach it. I'll not take the time to discuss with you the ramifications and how the subconscious mind works, but do it. You'll see the results. Next thing, I'd like you to affirm your goals. In other words, work on programming yourself with positive thoughts. At the end of my book, Creating Wealth, I have 52 of, I think, the most powerful thoughts in my life, and I try and read them regularly. 
It keeps me on a positive tone. Let me read you a few of them. Andrew Jackson said, One man with courage makes a majority. That kind of helps sometimes when you're worried about taking a risk. And then a friend of mine, Paul Juke, said, I'd rather see a crooked furrow than a field unplowed. That helps me when I need to get myself started. And then Joel Weldon says, Don't compete. Create. Find out what everyone else is doing and then don't do it. In other words, be creative. And then that great William James who said, Human beings can alter their lives by altering their attitudes of mind. Some of these thoughts over and over again repeated can help. You know, I even went so far as to create my own affirmation. I called it a 60-second commercial to me. Now, I know this may sound a little silly, and it probably was, but it surely helped me at a time when I was going through my graduate studies and my MBA program, and I was discouraged, and I needed help. And I sat down one day, and I said, You know, I do have some blessings. I do have things to count on my side. And so I wrote down a 60-second commercial to me. Bob Allen, you're great. You're one of the few individuals in the world who thinks the way you think. And I went on to say, you're enthusiastic. You're a great leader. And although I wasn't, it sure helped myself to remind myself that I had that kind of potential. The next step is to replace all of those thoughts about luck with a new thought about probability. In other words, don't think about being lucky or unlucky. Think about having a low probability of success or a high probability of success, and you can always increase a low probability to a high probability. Case in point, my first book, Nothing Down, was a long shot. Let me tell you, every year 30,000 books come off the presses, brand new books, and the chance of them becoming a bestseller, like my first book was, was extremely small. My book, Nothing Down, remained on the bestseller list for 46 weeks. This is the New York Times bestseller list, and I must admit that's a long shot. How did I increase the probability that that would be a success and I did not count on the luck being a major factor in it? Well, first of all, instead of sending my manuscript in to my uh, editor, uh, Simon & Schuster, since I didn't have a connection there, I knew that the probability of getting that selected was almost nil. So I went to a major publisher's convention in Atlanta, and I waited until the right moment to talk to the president of Simon & Schuster. Now, I was frightened. My heart was in my throat. But I waited for the right moment, and then I showed him a complete package on my book that I had had prepared before I got there with a beautiful cover, a professionally edited few chapters, a table of contents with some catchy titles. He immediately saw that I had gone the extra mile and accepted the manuscript. You see, I didn't just leave it to luck. I tried to increase the probability that that would be a success, but that wasn't all. I went out on a PR tour. I worked night and day to make sure that people around the country would learn about it. We created a seminar so that people could also come and spread the word. I only leave everything up to an increased probability of success, which I can control. And lastly, if you want to create a wealthy mindset, you've got to learn how to be a person of action. You must love to jump off those figurative cliffs and learn from your mistakes. How many business college professors do you know who know everything they need to know to be successful in their own business, but they can't put their knowledge into action? There are brilliant derelicts around us everywhere. But those who put their thoughts into action are the ones who succeed. My favorite Zen quote motivates me to action whenever I'm stuck on a plateau of comfort. It says, and this is profound to me at least, to know and not to do is not yet to know. I encourage you to set your goals, to visualize them, to affirm them, to work actively towards realizing them through smart planning and fearless action. Once you have this foundation, you are ready to advance to the next step, the realm of principles. Have you ever heard the saying, a fool and his money are soon parted? Is this true? If I can confess a bit, one day I sat down and I analyzed all of my failures, all of those mistakes I've made along the road, and counted up to my dismay, $212,000 worth of the most idiotic mistakes that you can imagine. 
money out of my pocket that I would not have had to lose if I had understood the principles of wealth. As a matter of fact, perhaps I had to go through that loss so that I could understand those principles and that I could share that information with you so that you don't have to go through that same kind of loss yourself. So what are these principles? Well, I have found at least seven of them, and let me share with you how I discovered them. I wanted to do a survey, and therefore we prepared with an expert, a survey to find out what people would do with sudden wealth. We wrote down a question, and we said, here is $100,000 cash, imaginary, of course, but suppose you received it tax-free, what would you spend it on? And we gave them about 25 categories in which they could spend it. House, car, boat, debt, church, charity, family, real estate, diamonds, gold, silver, etc., 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 bonds. And we said, uh, if you'll respond to the survey, we'll be glad to send you a copy of a free book. And many people responded. And we discovered, scientifically, that they would take their money and they would invest it in certain kinds of things, things which would either go up in value or go down in value. And so we projected out over a 10-year period of time what would happen to the things that they had invested their money in, and we found out what the compound rate of growth would be of each individual item in our survey. And we were able to then determine what the market value of their shopping basket of investments would be worth in 10 years. Now let me ask a question, and you put it in your mind. How many of those people, let's say of 100, how many out of 100 would have been able to take that $100,000 windfall tax-free and only just double it in a 10-year period of time? What do you think? 20%? 10%? 5%? Did any of you guess 1%? Only one in 100 would take $100,000 cash and double it. Isn't that interesting? And yet, so many of us who don't have a head start like that, $100,000, are assuming, hoping that we can start with nothing and create wealth when those with great wealth can't even double it? Well, let me make sure you understand that if you understand the principles of wealth, which I'm going to share with you, you don't have to have any money. But if you don't understand the principles of wealth, it doesn't matter how much money you have to start with, great or small. The probability that you will be successful is extremely small. What are these seven principles? I'm going to cover them quickly. We have so much material. We were able to take the survey and pull out of the survey the seven principles. Number one, People forgot and always forget about taxes and inflation. Inflation may be lower now, but any inflation at all is devastating. It's just a tiny hole in your net worth that gets bigger and bigger as inflation grows, and you always have to plan for it. Number two, make maximum use of your assets. You have to sacrifice to invest in things which go up in value. It was amazing to me that... The average investor in our survey would take thirty to forty thousand dollars of the money that they would receive and would immediately spend it on things which go down in value. And they would only then take the sixty or seventy percent that was left over and invest that in things which go up in value. So they weren't maximizing their assets. If they had had a hundred percent of their money to work for them, it would have been easy for them to reach their goals, or at least easier. Number three, don't diversify. In other words, instead of taking 60 or 70 percent of the money and putting it in 19 different areas of investment, which is what most people did, you should take your money and invest it only in a few areas. Now here we come across the programming of the world. What do most investment counselors tell you to do? They tell you to diversify. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Who are they talking to? They're not talking to people who are creating wealth. They're talking to people who are perpetuating wealth. In other words, if you've got a lot of money, yes, diversify. But what happens if you don't have a lot of money to start out with? You've got to learn how to concentrate it. And what did the wisest man, I think, in the United States say? As far as money is concerned, one of the richest, at least, his name was Andrew Carnegie, and his motto was, put all your eggs in one basket and then watch that basket. In other words, if you want to create wealth, you've got to learn how to concentrate. 
And what most people in our survey did was they took and spread their money in 19 different areas. Many different areas. Number four, wealth seekers are always on the offensive and not on the defensive. And yet what is the frame of mind of most investors in the country? They want security. They want liquidity. You know, I heard uh, an advertisement on the radio the other day. A large savings loan in California was saying on the airwaves, giving this kind of programming, listen to it. In a jingle song, they said, come in out of the risk. That was their motto. If I could have been there, I would have said to that songwriter, no, you don't say that. What you say is come out into the risk, for that is where the opportunity is. In other words, wealth seekers have to be on the offensive, willing to take risks. Number five, money must multiply at wealth-producing rates of return. What does that mean? Well, Suppose you have $5,000 cash today and you want to invest that so that it will grow to a million dollars in 10 years. What compounded rate of annual growth will you need on your investment after taxes and inflation to have that money grow to a million dollars? What rate of return are you going to need? The answer is 70%, 70 percent, seven zero percent. But what investments do you know out there that can give you 70 percent? There aren't many, are there? Are they money market funds? I doubt it. Even the stock market is going to have trouble. You look at the best performances in the stock market by advisors in their newsletters, and 25% is tops. Not the bottom, but the top. How do you get 70% rate of return on your money? First of all, you have to realize that you do need high rates of return, and then you go to the sixth principle, which is you must choose investments that are both powerful and stable. Now, powerful. What do I mean by that? I mean leverage. I mean debt. We talked about that earlier. Debt. Other people's money. Let's take a piece of real estate, for instance. I buy a $100,000 house. I can get a mortgage. I can borrow $90,000 against that. I only have to put down 10% of my own money, $10,000. If that property does go up in value 10%, which would mean a $110,000 house, my investment of $10,000 now becomes an equity in a house of $20,000. That's 100% on my money, isn't it? You see what leverage did? Well, that goes against the grain, and most people don't like debt. That is one of the only ways that you will be able to get a high rate of growth, a wealth-producing rate of growth. But the problem with leverage is that it's a two-edged sword. You can have leverage in the stock market. They call it margin. You can have leverage in uh, commodities. You can have leverage in lots of investments. But what you need are high rates of compounded growth over a long period of time. You need stability, don't you? And what doesn't the stock market have? Stability. What don't commodities have? Stability. There are investments that do have stability. Let's take money market funds or savings accounts in the bank. Bonds, for instance, they're a little less, and less stable. These investments have stability, but what do they lack? They lack power, meaning I can't get a high rate of growth. So what investment is both powerful and stable? You come to only two or three, frankly. You're going to come to real estate, and you're going to come to certain rare numismatic coins. You're going to come to some form of uh, discounted mortgages, but very, very few investments can you pick from. And I pick real estate. The reason I pick real estate is not because I like it. You may have heard me say on talk shows before, I hate real estate. There is nothing neat about it except the fact that it creates wealth. And it creates wealth because you can use leverage to obtain it, and it has long, slow, steady rates of minor appreciation over a long period of time. That's why it's exciting. And therefore, that stability mixed with the power creates the wealth. We all understand this in a gut way. We know that real estate has lots of benefits. But that's the reason that you come down to it. It's stable and it's powerful. Number seven in the principles is control. One of the reasons that real estate is good is that you control it. And one of the major reasons why I try to avoid myself the stock market is because you don't control it. You don't control the minor or major things that can happen to make your investments 
go up or down rapidly. How many people do you know that have taken money and given up control of it and given it to somebody else to manage that money for them and end up losing some of the money or all of it? That's happened to me. And the reason that I lost that $212,000 I referred to earlier is because I lost control of it and that I couldn't rectify the problems that were created by another person. You've got to keep control. What did H.L. Hunt say about money? He told his daughter, never invest in anything that you don't control. I think that's pretty good advice. So a fool and his money are soon parted. Why? Because he doesn't understand investments. He doesn't understand leverage or compound interest or control. And as long as he doesn't understand these things and won't make the effort to learn them, his wealth is in jeopardy. But once he learns the principles and he's not afraid to try them and to put them into practice, wealth comes easier. I like the quote from Will and Ariel Durant's book, The Lessons of History. The men who can manage men manage the men who can manage only things. And the men who can manage money manage all. And that brings us to strategies. And the strategy that we'll spend time on now is how do you now launch yourself into financial self-reliance? You've got a wealthy mindset. You understand the principles, basically. You've got your goals set. So what do you do? Where's some meat? Well, there are four stages of wealth, and each stage has its specific steps. Let me describe a wealth trajectory using real estate investments, although this would be the same if you were to start and manage your own business or anything else. I pick real estate because that's my experience, but... Any type of business that's well run can give you the same kind of results. The first stage, stage one, is the pre-launch stage. This is the stage where you get your house in order. It's where you study. It's where you put the wealth in that you're going to need to use. In other words, it's getting your education. It's learning about investments. It's learning about uh, leverage. It's learning to set your insurance up. It's learning to go to your banker and arrange for a good line of credit if you need it. It's doing those things that failures don't like to do. As one wise man put it, one small good deed is better than a grand intention. In other words, don't tell me you're going to be a millionaire. Start today to read, to study, to get your house in order so that you'll be ready when the time comes. This pre-launch stage is the time of many small, practical, mundane, seemingly insignificant actions which slowly compound our grand intentions into the realities of grand deeds. And this is where we lose most of America. They are not willing to, think to make those kinds of sacrifices. What's stage two? That's the liftoff. Imagine this space shuttle sitting on the launch pad in Florida. The morning is crisp. The booster rockets thrust that capsule up into the atmosphere. In order for it to overcome the enormous gravitational pull of the Earth, those booster rockets groan and strain and push that rocket upward through 50, 75, 100 miles worth of gravity. It's not until it reaches out beyond the Earth's gravitational pull that the rocket or the spaceship or the space shuttle just falls into a in orbit. It just takes the breath of a baby to propel it then. But to get it off of that launch pad is extremely difficult. It takes effort. It takes work. And the same thing goes with reaching your financial independence. The first steps are hard. To overcome the inertia, the gravitational pull of the world, overcome the desire to spend your money and not to save is extremely difficult. You're tempted on all sides to spend the money that you have instead of invest it. But once you reach outside that, your rocket ship goes on in what I call automatic pilot. The second stage of that rocket is when it's groaning about 50 miles above the Earth. I call that the liftoff stage. This is the tough time. And the reason that it's tough is because you, you rarely see any results. It takes a couple of years for investing, for instance, if you're investing in real estate. It takes a couple of years for your equity to start to grow where you feel like the sacrifice that you put out is going to return your money back. Let me give you a sample investment program. 
Let's pick, for instance, an investment program of investing in two single-family homes each year for the next 10 years. Now, I know this may go against the philosophy of many who like to buy just one house and have it free and clear. I'm investing in 20 single-family homes in 10 years. That's the program I'm outlining. And so at the first uh, five years of your program, you end up with 10 houses, but the equities are not there. They're not growing fast enough. The compounded rates of growth have not started to really take effect, and it's very discouraging. Your net worth at the end of five years is, is less than $200,000 on that program, assuming minimal rates of appreciation, and yet you've used up half of your time. You've used up five years, and you're only one-fifth of the way there, but it's in that last step when the rates of compounded growth really start to rapidly increase so that you reach a million-dollar net worth by the end of a 10-year period of time, just investing in two single-family homes a year. Now, please turn over the cassette to continue. That's exciting to me, to realize that if you can just persist and hang on by your fingernails, as I had to do, that things really start to happen for you. But we lose the rest of our country somewhere along that liftoff stage, and they abort their mission. And they jump ship. They abort the mission. They go away saying, I tried and I couldn't make it. What I encourage you to do in this first liftoff stage is to concentrate, as I said, as a principle. As much as 90% of your available discretionary investment capital into real estate. Learn how to manage it yourself and control it yourself. Always keep at least 10% of your liquid assets aside. Put them in what I call a staying power fund. For every property that you own, you should have at least three monthly payments worth of staying power fund aside in a, an emergency fund so that if something goes wrong, you can always maintain your properties. And believe me, there will be things that go wrong that you'll have to plan for. Now what about stage three? This is the second five years of our 10-year program. And in this, what we call the pre-orbit stage, things really start to happen. The net worth goes up. You're beginning to be more and more efficient in your managing. You understand the business better. I would imagine that you'd concentrate 80% of your available investment discretionary cash into real estate. You should have a 10% staying power fund as you had previously, but now you should have an additional 10% of your liquid assets and put that into what I call the prime the pump fund. So what happens if the economy goes down the drain? What happens if we have a deflationary collapse? Am I going to lose everything I own? Well, no. You may lose some of your possessions, but you're not going to lose your knowledge. And at the bottom of any depression, you can always start again, especially if you've got some money put aside to pick up those bargains. You see, I'm not afraid of depressions, as most people are. If they come, they come. But that is the time when bargains will abound, and that is where many, many millionaires were made in the last depression. I don't plan for it, I don't hope for it, but I'm not afraid of it either. Stage four is when you go into automatic pilot. You see, at the end of your 10-year period of buying single-family homes, and I'll go into the details of this with you in a moment, you end up with 20 single-family homes, an equity of 900,000 plus in those 20 single-family homes. You've also got some money put aside in your staying power fund and your prime the pump fund. But what do you do now? I would imagine that you would feel wealthy. You've got a million dollars. That's pretty wealthy, isn't it? Not really, because your 
equity is tied up in real estate, and that's not liquid, and it surely doesn't generate a lot of positive cash flow for you. So let me describe to you what I would do to get those 20 single-family homes on automatic pilot. I would pick the 10 homes with the largest equities in them, and I would sell them. I would want all cash, and it may take me a year, two years, sometimes three years to be able to find the right buyers with the right cash at the right price. When I sell a home, I take the cash and I pay off the mortgages on the other homes. The homes that we sell will generate enough cash to pay taxes to the IRS and to completely pay off the mortgages on the other 10. Now is when we go on automatic pilot. You see, because now we have 10 single family homes completely free and clear. No mortgages. And imagine in 10 years from today when the rents on those homes would be, for ease of illustration, I'll say $1,000 a month. I've now got $10,000 a month coming in. Cash flow. Now, I have no mortgages to make. And so that money belongs to me. That's my automatic pilot. That's my goose that lays the golden eggs. Yes, I've sacrificed for 10 years to get there. But then I can relax a little bit. The money is coming into me without me having to work for it. Remember the statement I said earlier, wealth is when small efforts produce large results. Now the small efforts of just collecting your rents produces large results, the freedom you're looking for. And you know, it's not the money that wealth is so known for. It's the freedom. That's what you want, isn't it? The freedom to do what you want to do when you want to do it without having to be told. That's a very precious freedom. And it's worth getting. And it's not that hard to get. Now, automatic pilot is the term I use when the income is coming to me. I've got several automatic pilots in my businesses right now. I've got a seminar business that's totally on automatic pilot. I don't personally teach the seminars any longer. I train teachers to do that for me. I also have uh, other businesses, a newsletter. I've got the book that I have printed and I'm selling nationwide. That's an automatic pilot. I did all the work to get it to the publisher, but now the publisher sells it and I just sit back and collect the royalties. Those are all automatic pilots. I encourage you to find automatic pilots because it's only when you have an automatic pilot that you have the real wealthy freedom that I'm talking about. Let me give you a, an example of someone who is not on automatic pilot but that most people think is wealthy. Let's take a doctor. Let's take a surgeon. The problem with a doctor or a surgeon is the fact that he can't train someone to take his place. He has to be there. And the only way he can increase his income is to do more operations. And there has to be a limit to that. Or to raise his prices. And there has to be a limit to that. He can't clone himself. And therefore, he has a limit on the amount of income he can make. Now, we might think that's a lot. But unless he takes his income and invests it in things that will generate for him automatic pilots, he will get to the end of his life with no more ability to earn income and no more income to sustain him or her. So look for things that you can put on automatic pilot. The reason I like real estate is for that very reason. It's an ideal creating wealth investment because once the mortgages are paid off, the income is generated to you and your family, your heirs, your posterity forever as long as they maintain it correctly. That's what's exciting to me. Let's move into some more specifics. We've covered the entire picture from minimum wage to maximum wealth, but let's add some flesh to these bones. I talked earlier about buying two houses per year for 10 years. What about the details of just how you concentrate there and how you learn how to be in the right place at the right time? Let me give you the concept of target property. As I invest in real estate, I can choose many types of properties. I can choose recreational property, single family homes, apartment buildings, commercial buildings, office space, etc., etc. Let me concentrate for you into one area that I feel has the greatest potential, and that is the area of residential property. I like to invest in things that people have to have. There is no choice. You don't see communities of tents around the country, at least not yet. And therefore, I like to buy single-family homes, and the target property I like to choose is a cheap single-family home, a three-bedroom property, condominium or townhome is okay. I like to choose it within a 50-mile radius of my own home. 
I like to choose it so that it can be purchased with a small down payment, if any, so that it does not have a negative cash flow, break even is my limit, and so that it can be managed easily. I like to put that in my portfolio and take care of it. That's what I call a target property. Anything that falls outside of target property, I'm not interested in. What's the limit in price for me? You want to have as cheap a three-bedroom home as you can have in a neighborhood that you'd feel comfortable about driving through at night with your windows down. Is that graphic enough? You want to have it in a suburb, a nice little houses all in a row neighborhood, if that also can help you illustrate. Your home should be priced hopefully under $75,000. There'll be some cities where that may not be the case, but the lower under $75,000, the better. In my area, we invest in homes between fifty and sixty thousand dollars. That's the target price range that I'm looking for. Anything above that gets me into a lot of trouble. Gets me into the trouble of managing it, gets me into the trouble of paying negative cash flows. And that means the rent I collect from that house is not enough to pay for the mortgage payments and the costs of maintaining that house. And therefore for me, it's not worth picking up. Now why am I interested in those types of properties? You see, we're in a back-to-basics decade. People will be buying smaller cars, and they'll be buying smaller homes. And if they can't buy a home, they're going to rent one, and it's going to be mine. I'm going to control it. What they don't realize, most people, is that they can buy a house and negotiate excellent terms themselves, but they don't know how. So they end up without the knowledge to know how to get their own home. They come to me to rent it from me. Now, once we have chosen our target property, we next choose a cookie cutter. Now, what does a cookie cutter mean? A cookie cutter is a strategy that we use. You see, every successful real estate investor you ever find has a strategy that he uses, like a cookie cutter, over and over and over and over again, the same details, the same formula. You've got to pick a formula that works for you, and there are eight or nine or ten of different formulas, a way of making and there are eight, nine, ten different ways of making money in real estate because real estate is such a diverse animal. It's so varied. It's so exciting. And why is it so varied? Why is it different than the stock market? Because the stock market is a perfect marketplace. I know today what my stock can sell for by just placing a simple telephone call. But real estate's different. I can't place a telephone call to someone and know that I can sell it within a day. It's illiquid, isn't it? It's an imperfect marketplace. And the reason that it's imperfect is it's illiquid. We can't sell very quickly, and we really don't know what it's worth. It may take us three or four months to find out. Well, it's that very imperfection that creates the opportunity. Most people say that real estate is bad because it's illiquid. I say real estate is good because it's illiquid. It's illiquid and therefore I can find opportunities in that. For example, I find a person who needs to sell. He needs to sell today. He needs the cash today. And he's willing to take a deep discount in the price of his property if we can solve that problem for him. And yet I know also that if I can solve the problem and pay him his money and get him out and assume ownership of that property, I can put that property back on the market again for sale. And if I find the right buyer quick enough, I can sell it at a profit. In one instance, I bought a 12-unit apartment building in the morning, put $50,000 down, and sold it in the afternoon and got my $50,000 back plus $9,000 cash the same day. Why can I do that? Because real estate's an imperfect marketplace. And the key to being successful is to become an expert in value, to become an expert in knowing how to appraise properties, what you think the market would pay for that property. Lots of people are not experts in that, and that's why they, no, they uh, never do well in real estate. That's what you're going to learn how to do, and you're going to have to learn how to do that, or you will not be successful in real estate. Let's talk about these eight cookie cutters that I'll describe here, different ways of making money in real estate, and you'll see that in almost every one of them, recognizing value is probably the key to it. The first cookie cutter is buy high, sell higher. Well, let's go back to the old stock market adage, which is the way you make money is you buy low, sell high, right? Well, the stock market 
is not really that way. You don't buy a stock low and sell it high. You buy it high and you sell it higher. You see, you're hoping that the stock goes up in value, but you don't really know. And the, the real estate analogy to that is buying a house today for what it's worth, holding on to it and hoping through appreciation that it will increase in value and selling it higher in a few years from now. The difference between the price you paid and the price you sell it for is your profit. Same as in the stock market. Well, appreciation rates have not been very high in the last few years. Does that mean that that game is now over with? Not necessarily. And I fully expect that appreciation rates will come back, but I don't have to bank on it because I can always go to the next formula, which is the true buy low, sell high. Because in real estate, you can really buy a property well below its current market value and sell it for a profit. That's what's exciting about an imperfect real estate market. For instance, I located a, a property recently where the seller was anxious to sell. He had a $60,000 property. He wanted to sell for $48,000 with nothing down. He was desperate to sell. Couldn't stand the property, couldn't stand the management. He was moving and he was three months behind in his monthly payments. Those were all excellent clues. And he said, get me out. I want out immediately. And we were able to oblige his wishes. And he was ecstatic to get rid of it. Well, we pick up the property at $48,000. We know we've got a built-in $12,000 profit the second we buy it. Even if we turn around and sell it for two or $3,000 above what we paid for it, we can make an immediate profit. That's what we call buy low, sell high. What kind of formulas would you use there? Talk about the foreclosure models, people who are losing their properties to foreclosure. You talk about going to banks today. This is an excellent formula for many of you. Go to your bank. Talk to the person who's in charge of real estate owned, REO, and say, I understand that you've foreclosed on many properties, and believe me, they've got some. And tell them, you've done all the distasteful foreclosing. Tell us what you would like us to do to buy your properties. And many of the banks are very flexible. They want to get rid of those properties because that's not the way they make their money. The way they make their money is when you make your monthly payments. That's the money business they're in. They're not in the real estate business, and they're very, very anxious to have you take their problems off of their hands at wholesale prices or wholesale terms or both. I've done that myself recently, and I highly encourage you to do that. The third cookie cutter, buy low, don't sell. What do I mean by that? Can I buy a property low and then not sell it? Surely. Recently, I bought one of those properties from a bank, it was appraised at 45000 They wanted to dump it at 39000 They only wanted $2,000 down, which was below their legal or their usual limits. And they would agree to make me the loan to buy them out of that property at a very handsomely below the market rate. You see, I was solving their problem, and the the philosophy or the attitude changes when you're helping a bank solve their problem uh, instead of having the bank help you solve your problem. They sold me the property $6,000 below the market and I moved in uh, a tenant immediately and now we have a break-even cash flow. I made an immediate equity gain that I could put on my financial statement and I get marvelous tax benefits. In the first year alone the $2,000 I invested in that one simple single-family home has been recouped many times over from the equity buildup and the tax shelter that was generated from that property. So it's an excellent formula. Now, when those mortgages are paid off on that home, since it's now a break-even situation and in two or three years it'll be a positive cash flow, when those mortgages are eventually paid off, that home will be an automatic pilot for my heirs for centuries to come because they'll have the home and they'll also have the rent that comes from it. Could also be an excellent retirement program for myself. In 20 years from now, if I have 30 single family homes all coming free and clear at the same time, can you imagine the kind of positive cash flow that'll generate for my retirement years? Well, that's exactly what I'm doing, folks. The fourth cookie cutter, buy high, fix up higher. I personally don't have the skills to fix up real estate, but many people do. And they find these cosmetic fixer-uppers that need paint, carpet, touch-up, cosmetic work, some light landscaping, and they significantly increase its value 
by the way it looks, and then they turn around and sell it for a profit. And this is an excellent way to go. The cookie cutter number five is buy high, don't sell. Many of you have seen these ads recently in the newspapers offering properties for zero interest. For instance, you can buy a condominium in several cities still today for $75,000, put down 15 or 20 percent, and have a zero interest mortgage, which is paid off in five to seven years. That means you will have to make higher monthly payments today. But at the end of five to seven years, the property is completely free and clear. Then you've got a real automatic pilot on your hands. There are all kinds of ways to look at real estate and make money. The sixth cookie cutter is what I call don't buy. Do you mean don't buy real estate? Yes, don't buy real estate. Do you mean don't invest in real estate? No. I mean don't buy it. Option it. Control it. Control is important, not necessarily ownership. Can I lease a piece of property with an option to buy it? Yes. And there are many ways of and many advantages to leasing property and then turning around and subletting that property to another tenant at a higher rental rate, collecting the higher rental rate as a positive cash flow, and ending up with an option to buy the property down the road, assuming there may be some inflation, at a better price. It's an excellent formula, especially for those of you who are living in areas where the prices are extremely high and where it's very probable you'll have a negative cash flow by buying real estate. My cookie cutter for you then is to lease it with an option to buy it or just to option it. The seventh cookie cutter, buy high, sell high. Is it possible for me to buy a piece of property for $100,000 and turn around and sell it a week later for $100,000 and still make money? Surely. You see, there are several kinds of wholesales in real estate. You've got wholesale price and wholesale terms. And if a seller is willing to accept wholesale terms, 9 10% interest on his mortgage, then all you have to do is turn around and sell it to someone else for a little bit higher terms, 11 12% mortgage. And you collect the positive cash flow, the spread between those two transactions as a positive return to you for the next 25 years or until that mortgage is paid off. And the cookie cutter number eight, and this one is my favorite. This is what I call buy high, sell low. Is it possible to buy a property for $100,000 and to sell it for $80,000 and still make money? Can I buy something high and sell it low and still make money? The answer is yes, of course. It's a very complicated, but it's very powerful in the use of discounted mortgages that are out there and trading mortgages and what we call substitution of collateral. And once again, it's a little technical for the discussion of a tape. It's kind of like teaching a person how to do an appendectomy over the radio. And therefore, I'd rather that you had a chance to study it in a little more detail. But there are ways to do it. And it's very exciting and very, very little known, as a matter of fact. Now. As a summary to our discussion of cookie cutters, let me point you in the direction of the one I feel most comfortable about today, at least for the next 12 to 18 months. I would encourage you to pick the buy low, sell high formula. And as I discussed in that previous cookie cutter, go to your banks, your finance companies, your financial institutions in your area that have had the habit of lending money using real estate as security or collateral. And if you have to go through 19 no's to get one good yes, you have to learn to be that perseverant because it's well worth the effort. I mentioned earlier the win-win philosophy, and win-win is a fundamental part of my attitude in dealing with sellers. I like to make sure that they win as well as myself. I like to walk away from the transaction knowing that I could have sat on the other side of the table in that seller's same shoes and have felt fair about what had taken place. Now, many things can cause a seller to want to sell, can cause a seller to want to accept a wholesale price or wholesale terms. But I want you to understand that you're a business person, and therefore 
you have to win too, and you want that seller to win. Talking about your side of the equation, how do you win? Well, as a business person, you need to have something at wholesale. As a matter of fact, if you don't get something at wholesale, you're not a business person, you're a speculator. And you will end up uh, as so much wreckage on the shoreline of the investment world if you don't realize that investors don't make it in real estate. Only business people make it, and they need something at wholesale. So in the negotiation, you've got to remember the the side of the equation, the win-win equation is you've got to win. And if you don't win, don't play. By the same token, you must let that seller feel that you are fair also. The philosophy has five or six principles that I like to follow myself, and I mentioned one to you earlier. If both parties can't win, don't play. You see, if it's not win-win now, it will eventually be lose-lose. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you take advantage of somebody, I mean really nail them to the wall, eventually they'll realize how bad it was for them and they'll pass a bad word of mouth around. And I guess ultimately in the eternal sense, if you really took advantage of somebody, you will lose either in this life or in the next one. There is no such thing as win-lose and there's no such thing as lose-win. It's either win-win or lose-lose. So don't cause anybody to lose and especially yourself and then, of course, not the seller. The next uh, principle is, since the essence of win-win is mutual problem-solving, don't negotiate with people who don't have problems that they are mo motivated to solve. Don't negotiate with people who don't have problems that they're motivated to solve. Meaning, if they're not flexible, don't negotiate. Now, 90% of the sellers in the real estate market are not flexible. So your very creative solutions to solving your cash problems or your business person problems will not be well received because they're in the same business. They're business people. They're trying to make a dollar too. You've got to find people who are motivated by the problems that they have to be very flexible in the way they sell their properties. And that's a key fundamental principle of success. If you don't use it, you'll be very, very sorry. If you do use it, you'll see how powerful it is. If 90% of the people are not flexible, most Americans would say, then that's not very good odds. But I look at it differently. If 10% of the people are flexible, that means I'm definitely going to be able to find somebody out there from whom I can buy a property. So it's a numbers game. I know I'm going to get nine no's before I get a yes. In fact, I'm going to get nine no's before I get a maybe. And I'm probably going to get five or six maybes before I get a good solid yes. And I may have to go through two or three good solid yeses before I get an absolute yes, let's close. It's a numbers game, and you never can lose if you continue to persist. Now, the third principle of win-win is make friends with the seller. He will be more apt to enter into problem solving with a friend than with an enemy. You see, your attitude to negotiation is not negotiation, it's problem solving. Mr. Seller, I understand you have a problem. Would you tell it to me? Let's try and solve it together. I'm here to help, not to hurt. Let's work out something that's beneficial for both of us. Let's be fair. Instead of, I'm your adversary, I want to knock from you uh, the last quarter in your piggy bank. It's a different attitude, and it's really very powerful. It's really due unto others as you would have them do unto you. And some people feel that that might have gone out of the window 2,000 years ago, but I can vouch for you that it works today very powerfully. Number four, you can't solve a problem unless you understand it. So as you get involved in the negotiation process, listen. Get to the real problem. Mr. Seller, why are you trying to sell? And he tells you that uh, they just decided that they don't want their house any longer. They want to move on. They want to know if you're a safe place, if they can divulge their problems to you. And so you have to listen. And after listening, you'll discover that generally the problems that they tell you at first are not the real root of the problem. They may be three or four months behind in their payments, and they're embarrassed to tell anyone about it. Once you learn that kind of information, you can help them solve their problem in a way that is beneficial to both parties. Fifth principle, once you understand the problem, search for an alternative win-win solution. Ways in which you can come out with something wholesale, price or terms, and then they can leave and have their problem solved. And remember, that optimism in investing is the root of persistence. You have to be optimistic or you can't persist. And remember, it's a numbers game. You cannot fail 
if you go through enough sellers, you will find a bargain. And when you find that bargain, you can put it in your portfolio and you are on your way to wealth. The problem with most investors is that they have plenty of non-financial resources, like lots of time and lots of courage. But no financial resources like no cash and no cash flow and no credit. The essence of wealth is to understand that all wealth is found in non-financial resources. And that is only the appearances of wealth that are found in the financial resources. Therefore, if I am broke, what do I do? First of all, you don't let it bother you. Because the motto of a leveraged investor is, if I don't have it, somebody does. A new challenge I'll be performing here shortly goes something like this. Send me to any unemployment line. Let me select one individual who is out of work and discouraged. Let me teach that person in 48 hours the principles of creating wealth. And in 90 days, this person will be off the unemployment line with $5,000 cash in his or her pocket, well on his or her way to a life of financial independence and self-reliance. How can you perform that kind of quote-unquote miracle if you don't have financial resources by the simple understanding that any financial resource you don't have, you can always borrow, no matter where you're coming from. That is the power that gets you started. When you do go into debt, you create family tension. And the last thing you want to do is to wreck a family over money, to ruin your real wealth over something that's transitory at best. Second problem, it's easy to borrow money, but not as easy to pay it back. And that's obvious, but most people don't understand that. And number three, leverage increases the danger of losing control. So leverage is a tool that we use very carefully, like a surgeon would use a scalpel with practice, very wisely, and it's something you need to have. Let me recommend two or three investments for you. I would recommend, first of all, investing in discounted second mortgages, third mortgages, first mortgages, discounted mortgages or trust deeds. What is that? Suppose you own a home and you want to sell it. It's worth $100,000 and you have a $50,000 mortgage against it, so your equity is $50,000. That's the amount of money you would hope to receive. And someone comes in and makes you an offer. They say, here's 30000 cash down, and we want you to carry the balance of your equity in the form of a second mortgage secured against your property, and we agree to make you monthly payments of XYZ dollars at 14% uh, interest for the next 10 years. And you analyze the situation, you realize the market's a little slow, and you say, well, I get 30000 cash, and I get so many dollars a month for the next 10 years, I'll take it. You are now the proud holder of a mortgage or a trust deed. You receive monthly payments for the next 10 years. Something happens in your family about a year later. You've received these payments faithfully, but you realize that you've got an asset there that has a value of, uh, on its face value of $20,000, but you realize that receiving this monthly payment for the next 10 years is really not what you want. What you really would rather have is some cash. And so you go to the marketplace and try and find out what you could sell that $20,000 mortgage for at its face value. And the market tells you that they may only pay 12000 cash for it today. And you say to yourself, which would I rather have? A monthly payment for the next 10 years or 12000 cash today? You might accept that. In fact, many people would. They might have an opportunity they could invest that $12,000 in to give them a much, much better return on their money. This is what we call discounted mortgages. A person who would pay $12,000 for a mortgage like that would probably earn a yield on his investment of between 18 and 24% on his money, which is significantly higher than you can obtain in a money market fund or in a bank and probably in most traditional investments. What are the problems with investing in mortgages? Well, obviously, you have to be willing to take the risk that if a person doesn't make his payments, you'll have to foreclose. And therefore, every time you buy a mortgage, you have to say to yourself, am I prepared to foreclose on this mortgage and to obtain the house or property back? Do I really want to own the property that this mortgage is being collateralized by? 
if you decide you want to invest in that particular mortgage, then you sit back and receive your monthly payments for the next period of time. The next area of investment that I would encourage you to look into is the area of numismatics. What is that? That's rare coins, gold and silver coins that are pre-1965. It's a very specialized field, but it has very wonderful benefits. And one of the benefits is its rarity. Real estate is great because it's rare. It's hard to make, it's hard to sell, it's hard to create. And coins are even rarer because they're not making them any longer. The reason that a coin is rare is because there are no others like it. I encourage you to become experts in this area. As a matter of fact, I'm beginning to do this myself, and this is an excellent time to start. I would encourage you also to invest some of your money in real estate limited partnerships. Generally speaking, as you're creating wealth, limited partnerships are not the way to go. You want to control. But once you reach a plateau of wealth, you want to spread your efforts out and uh, get only perhaps a piece of the action and not the whole thing. Limited partnerships are excellent. I would analyze a limited partnership the same way I would analyze a property that I would want to buy for myself. A final note on education. How did I get my start? I'll tell you when the spark came on for me. When I was attending a little-known seminar in California on real estate investing, and it was taught by an investor who was very creative, and he was the first one who got through to me and made me realize that I was in control and that creativity was more important than money. From that point on, I've never looked back. And that investment of $1,000 for the seminar and for the travel and the hotel expenses has been worth a multi-million dollar net worth to me today. And it came because I had the courage to spend money on a little-known, very unrespectable seminar. Since that time, I've gone to dozens of seminars, literally. And every one I've learned something because I've, I meet and rub shoulders with the doers who are out there. I must admit, frankly, that I didn't learn any of this in my MBA program. What they taught me to do in my MBA program was to get a job and to work for someone else for the rest of my life. Thank heaven I could get a job so that I could spend my life creating my own job. And that was very important to me at that time. We also teach a two-day seminar discussing the principles and the techniques of creating wealth. And I highly encourage you to take that. Not that I'm going to obtain an awful lot of money from it, but that I'm going to encourage you to become hooked on education as I have become hooked on education. Those who don't understand wealth are fond of saying, you can't take it with you. But I disagree. Just the opposite is true. You can take it with you. It is only the poverty-minded who tend to think that wealth resides solely in material things. Those who look upon wealth as thoughts and attitudes will not be disappointed in death, for they will be able to carry their wealth with them. My hope is that in creating the kind of wealth you can't take with you, you also create a generous portion of the kind of wealth that you can take with you. Good luck and Godspeed. Before we sign off, we want to invite you to send us your comments and suggestions for other programs you'd like to see. In return for writing us, we'll send you our latest catalog listing all of our materials. Just send your comments to Listen and Learn, P.O. Box 396, Old Greenwich, Connecticut, 06870. Thanks for listening. We'd be happy to listen to you, too.
Hi, this is Dennis Waitley. I'm excited about sharing the essence of my new book, The Seeds of Greatness, with you. You know, I used to think the seeds of greatness were special genes or inborn talents. But after 20 years of research and 50 years of first-hand knowledge, I've learned that the seeds of greatness are not dependent upon the gifted birth, the inherited bank account, the intellect, the skin-deep beauty, the race, the color, nor the status. The seeds of greatness are attitudes and beliefs. I think I've uncovered 10 of the most important character traits that are common to those individuals who become so uncommonly successful as human beings. As you and I explore the essence of each of these seeds of greatness, I'll reveal the key thought in each seed as one of the best kept secrets of total success. Welcome to this Listen and Learn program filled with useful information. This session is designed to sharply increase your awareness on the subject and give you ideas and knowledge that you can put to work right away. As with all Listen and Learn programs, you hear from the experts, people who have already been there and who have had success. Of course, we can't hope to present everything there is to know in a short session like this, but we will give you all the important highlights so that you'll have a good overview when you've completed the session. For more information, listen to the message at the end of this cassette. Okay? Let's begin. Listen, learn, and enjoy. Dr. Dennis Waitley is a national authority on high-level performance and personal development. He graduated from the United States Naval Academy and holds a doctorate in human behavior. He's also president of the La Jolla Clinic Research Foundation. Dr. Waitley has counseled leaders in every field, from management to Super Bowl and Olympic athletes to astronauts, and has worked with Vietnam POWs as well as the Iranian hostages. We're sure you'll find this program extremely interesting and motivating. Here again, Dr. Dennis Waitley. The first seed of greatness is the seed of self-esteem. And in my opinion, self-esteem is the single most important human quality in a successful person. It's amazing how delicate and fragile self-esteem really is for each of us. The fear of rejection can be traced to early criticisms that we receive from our parents, other members of our families, our teachers, our business associates, and our friends. It is the association of ourselves with our mistakes. Parents make the classic errors in raising their children by saying bad boy or naughty girl, shape up or ship out, cry baby, whiner puss, spoil brat, loud mouth, and clumsy. While we parents really mean for these labels to apply to our children's behavior, unfortunately the child takes them personally, unable to separate who he or she is from what he or she does. That's called confusing the doer with the deed. It's devastating to a child or to a subordinate in business. As children become of school age, they get it from parents and peers coming and going. Fatso, beaver teeth, buzzard beak, freckle face, bean pull, ugly, four eyes, stupid, motor mouth, metal mouth, sloppy, old unreliable, punker, gross, uncoordinated, and even turtle breath. You know, even when we're in college or professional life, it's not much different. They call it radical or dense or boring or square or straight or weird or bigot or establishment or uptight or wild or uninteresting or lazy or a loser. Individuals who become subjected to the environments full of put-downs and criticism often become critical adults with less than adequate self-esteem. The fear of rejection becomes the fear of change, and they tend to seek security in positions where you go with the system and you don't rock the boat. The fear of change translates into the fear of success, and the fear of success, in my estimation, is just about as strong as the fear of rejection. The fear of success syndrome, which paralyzes the majority in our society today, is really the fear of trying. Its manifestations are rationalization and procrastination. I hear it in conversation every day. You know, I can't imagine myself successful. Or, I can see it for you, but I can't see it for me. Most individuals realize that common people have become uncommonly productive by believing in their own worth. They have observed the biographies of individuals who have overcome enormous handicaps and roadblocks to become great, but they can't believe it can happen to themselves. They resign themselves to mediocrity and even failure, wishing and envying away their lives. They develop the habit of looking back at past problems, which I call failure reinforcement, and they imagine similar bad performances in the future. 
which I call failure forecasting, because they are controlled by rejection and acceptance standards set by others. They often set their sights unrealistically high, not really believing in the validity of their dreams and not preparing enough for their achievement. They fall short again and again. Failure becomes set as the standard of their self-esteem. And just when they seem to break through or get on top or make real progress, they blow it. In truth, the fear of success caused them to procrastinate the preparation and creative action necessary for success. And rationalization sets in to satisfy the subconscious feeling that you can't expect to get ahead when you've been through what I have. The first best-kept secret of total success is that we must feel love inside ourselves before we can give it to others. We must feel love inside ourselves before we can give it to others. Simple, isn't it? If there is no deep internalized feeling of value inside of us, then we have nothing to give to or share with others. Oh, sure, we can need them, we can be dependent upon them, we can look for security in them, we can indulge them, flatter them, and attempt to purchase them, but we cannot share or give an emotion to anyone else unless we first possess that emotion inside ourselves. Successful people believe in their own worth even when they have nothing but a dream to hang on to. Why? Because their own self-worth is stronger than the rejection or acceptance of their ideas by others. Material achievements are standards of excellence in products or projects that fill a need. However, there is just as much value in the inventor before his product is mass-produced as there is after he has made his fortune. And in so knowing, he or she has the courage to go forward. Walt Disney was said to have asked 10 people what they thought of a new idea. And if they were unanimous in their rejection of it, he would begin work on it immediately. Of course, he was used to being rejected. He was bankrupt when he went around Hollywood with his little Steamboat Willie cartoon idea. Can you imagine him trying to sell a talking mouse with a falsetto in silent movie days? Well, Walt dreamed the big dream, and children everywhere from Disney World in Japan to Epcot Center in Florida will be forever grateful. Was Walt Disney a better man while he was broke and still narrating the original voice of Mickey Mouse? Or after he made all those great movies? Or after he built Disneyland? Well, Walt Disney had the self-esteem to hang in there when the only reward was his belief in himself. He realized that value is in the doer, not the deed. The word esteem means to appreciate the value of. In the human being, I believe it is the beginning and the first seed to all success. It is the basis for our ability to love others and to try to accomplish a worthy goal without fear. Narcissistic self-gratification is a purely materialistic type of self-worship, but self-esteem is based upon the internalization of value and spiritual love. Self-acceptance as we are right now is the key to healthy self-esteem. Seeing ourselves as worthwhile, changing, imperfect, growing individuals, and knowing that although we are not born with equal mental and physical uniforms, we are born with the equal right to feel deserving of excellence according to our own internal standards. You are a masterpiece of creation, so always carry with you the secret. Love must be within us before it can be given. The second seed, the seed of creativity, is within each of us. Among all living organisms on the earth, only the human being was created without a built-in software program for successful living. Insects, animals, and birds know instinctively how they must behave and what they must do in order to survive. Humans also have survival instincts, but we also possess abilities much more marvelous and complex than any animal. The human being, with no pre-recorded computer program as a life guide, is blessed with a creative imagination. This is why healthy role models and positive value education are so important. Since we are not predestined as members of a wandering herd, victimized and imprisoned within a fixed environment, we need maps and charts to guide us. In successful individuals, role models and values become our maps and charts. In unsuccessful individuals, these become walls and reefs. All individuals are born without a sense of self. We are like tape recorders without the key message. Through observation and experience, we tape record our video, audio, and sensory cassettes of ourselves. This recorded self-concept or self-image, this mental picture of self, 
when nourished and cultivated, is the primary field in which happiness and success can grow and flourish. But this same mental self-concept, when undernourished or neglected, becomes a spawning pond for low achievement, deviant behavior, and unhappiness. You've heard the old cliché, you are what you eat. Well, I'd like to offer you a new one to share with colleagues and family members. You are what you watch and think. Unfortunately, too many people exist on a mental diet of television, motion pictures created to shock us, and slick publication designed to stimulate us, and cocktail parties designed to escape with. I consider most of what we have available as junk food that leads to mental malnutrition and poor emotional health. Television constantly exposes us to the antisocial behavior performed by the incompetent, the uncouth, and the insane. At the other extreme are the superheroes with unnatural strength and superhuman abilities who are beautiful and handsome. When average individuals compare themselves to their TV heroes, they usually see themselves as inadequate. We are growing up with television as our window to the world, and the TV world has become the basis for many of our beliefs and values. By the time we graduate from high school, most of us will have spent 50% more time in front of the TV set than in the classroom or having quality experiences with our families. We can't blame the television industry for the situation because the quality of programming is only a reflection of the character of our families in the American social scene. But let's remember, if a 60-second commercial by repeated viewing can sell us a product, then isn't it possible for a 60-minute soap opera by repeated viewing to sell us a lifestyle? Well, it's food for thought. Recent studies conducted by a Stanford University research team have revealed that what we watch does have an effect on our imaginations and our learning patterns and our behaviors. First, we are exposed to new behaviors and characters. Next, we learn to acquire these new behaviors. The last and most crucial step is that we adopt these behaviors as our own. One of the most critical aspects of human development that we need to understand is the influence of repeated viewing and repeated verbalizing and shaping our future. The information goes in harmlessly, almost unnoticed, on a daily basis, but we don't react to it until later, when we aren't able to realize the basis for our reactions. In other words, our value system is being formed without any conscious awareness on our part of what is happening. Wow! That's why it's so important to watch, listen to, and read creative material as a daily diet. What if you and I could switch TV channels to one inside of our own head, in which our minds were cameras instead of receivers? What if we actually scripted, produced, casted, rehearsed, and broadcast our own programs, and at the same time videotaped them for our own enjoyment and for future broadcasts? Well, we can and we do every day and night of our lives, and therein lies the second secret of total success. The second best-kept secret of total success is that our minds can't tell the difference between real experience and experience that is vividly and repeatedly imagined. Understanding this secret of the power of the imagined experience is the key to understanding human behavior. Many of our everyday decisions are based upon information about ourselves which have been stored as truth, but which is really a combination of hearsay from family, friends, and peers and actual past experiences and information that we read and listen to and view on television. During every moment of our lives, we program our imaginations, or we allow others to program them, to work for us or against us. I had the opportunity to interview and study a number of POWs when they returned from Vietnam, many of whom were pilots who had been shot down by Soviet-made SAM missiles. I also interviewed several of the former hostages after their release from the U.S. Embassy in Iran. It didn't take our POWs or hostages long to figure out the second best-kept secret. In the absence of any materials, tools, or comforts, they simply created them in their imaginations. They recalled most of the inspirational events and significant learning stored in their memories, which I refer to as instant replay, and they previewed coming attractions of Emmy Award-winning TV series in their imaginations. Every color, every smile, every touch, every word, every picture, every detail. This is what I call instant preplay, or the creative ability to fantasize where you plan to be in the future. The concentration on reinforcing positive, healthy experiences from the past 
and the simulation of a successful project or lifestyle as if it were actually happening in the present, this is the gift of creativity. Your mental picture of yourself is the key to your healthy development. You are the writer, director, and the star of either an Oscar-winning epic or a grade B movie. Who you see in your imagination will always rule your world. You also are your greatest critic. You can devastate your self-esteem with sarcastic and negative reviews of your daily performance. Or you can elevate your self-image with encouraging and positive feedback and previews of coming great attractions. Your self-talk is being monitored and recorded minute to minute by your self-image. So when you're talking to yourself, watch your language. My grandmother taught me a lot about the seeds of greatness while we were planting a victory garden in her yard during World War II. I especially remember her words on the third seed the seed of responsibility, which she quoted from Madame Chiang Kai-shek. If the past has taught us anything, it is that every cause brings its effect. Every action has a consequence. The Chinese have a saying, if a man plants melons, he will reap melons. If he sows beans, he will reap beans. And this is true of everyone's life. Good begets good and evil leads to evil. True enough, the sun shines on the saint and the sinner alike and too often it seems that the wicked prosper. But we can say with certainty that with the individual as with the nation, the flourishing of the wicked is an illusion, for unceasingly life keeps books on all of us. In the end, we are the sum total of our actions. Character cannot be counterfeited, nor can it be put on and cast off as if it were a garment to meet the whim of the moment. Like the markings on wood, which are ingrained in the very heart of the tree, Character requires time and nurturing for growth and development. Thus also, day by day, we write our own destiny, for inexorably we become what we do. The third best-kept secret of total success is that our rewards in life will depend on the quality and amount of contribution we make. We want freedom, but are we willing to pay that price anymore? Well, I believe that you and I are. Cause and effect is the secret taking responsibility today for tomorrow's results. The culprit standing in our way is disguised in a six-word slogan, relief is just to swallow away. The greatest single cause of what's ailing America, in my opinion, is the irresponsible obsession with immediate sensual gratification. We want sex without intimacy. We want love without commitment. We want benefit packages without production requirements. Pain, sacrifice, and effort are unacceptable. If it feels good right away, I'll try it. If I can't be certain to win, I won't enter. I want the American dream I saw on TV and in the movies and one my parents said I'd get because I'm so special, and I want it now. Perhaps the major factor responsible for the success of the Japanese in building greatness out of ashes is their willingness to look ahead to the future while putting in a maximum effort or work and sacrifice in the present. Japanese workers save an estimated 20% of their spendable incomes, more than triple that of Americans. In Japan, it's called discretionary income, which means there's a choice to spend it all or save some of it. In America, we call it disposable income, and when we get it, we hasten to dispose of it. It seems obvious to everyone but us as individuals that we Americans are disposing of our past rewards faster than we are replenishing our investment today for future harvesting. Instead of merely resting on our laurels, we may actually be pawning them. As a society, we protest for individual liberty and social order in the same breath. We strive for material wealth but hope for spiritual health as a byproduct. We plead for more protection from crime but demand less interference in our social habits. We want to cut taxes, take the great risk, and build our own destinies. And at the same time, we want more financial security and safety provided by our government. But we can't have it both ways. If we want results, we must pay the price. The way to build self-reliance is to recognize the number of alternative choices we have in a free society. When I interviewed our returning POWs and former hostages from Iran, the thing they said they missed most of all was their freedom of choice. There are two primary choices in life, one, to accept conditions as they exist, or two, to accept the responsibility for changing them. 
A recent University of California study indicates that the happiest, best-adjusted individuals are those who believe that they have a strong measure of control over their lives. They seem to choose more appropriate responses to what occurs and to stand up to inevitable changes with less apprehension. They learn from their past mistakes rather than replay them. They spend more time doing in the present rather than fearing what may happen. The opposite type of individuals believe in luck or fate or jinx or wrong time at the wrong place, astrological and biorhythm accuracy, and you can't fight City Hall. They are prone to give in to doubt and fear and suffer greater emotional and physical problems as a result. When we study the Japanese success, and when we learn of the thousands of boat people and immigrants who have come out of the ghetto into greatness in this country, we realize the truth. In abundant America, many victims of the system are actually volunteers who are cooperating in their own failure. To be self-reliant adults, we need to get some guidelines. Be different if it means higher personal and professional standards of behavior. Be different if it means being cleaner, neater, and better groomed than the group. It's always better to arrive for any function looking slightly better than looking slightly worse than the group. Be different if it means to put more time and effort into all you do. Be different if it means to take the calculated risk. The greatest risk in life is to wait for and depend upon others for your security. The greatest security is to plan and act and take the risk that will make you independent. You and I have learned that no one else can really rain on our parade. We have to choose to allow them to. We choose what concerns us from moment to moment, and you and I respond rather than react to others. What concerns us most is the joy of living. And we realize that we are responsible for causing our own effects in life. We tackle the toughest, most challenging assignments in our lives first, understanding that our gratification will come after we have made the effort to do the job right. We tell our employers what we are going to offer them before we ask them about the pay scale and benefit package. We are well aware that our true rewards in life will depend upon the quality and amount of contribution that we make. We know that by planting the seeds of great ideas early, we will become great individuals. Seed number four is the seed of wisdom. In ancient Rome, being a sculptor was a popular profession. You were not really considered to be in the mainstream if your home or place of work didn't have several statues of the gods adorning it. As with every industry, there was good and bad quality in the statue business. When upon occasion a sculptor would make a mistake in carving a particular statue, the crack or chipped area would be filled in with wax. Sculptors became so good at remodeling with wax that most people couldn't tell the difference in quality with the naked eye. So if anyone wanted an authentic statue of fine quality carved by someone who really took pride in his work, he would go to the artisan marketplace in the Quad in Rome and look for the signs at the booths that were marked Cena Sera without wax. In the Cena Sera shops, he would find the real thing. You know, in everything we do in life, we are looking for those items and for those individuals who represent the real thing. More than any other virtue we look for in people, we value sincerity without wax the most. In the previous seed, I described responsibility as understanding the great law of cause and effect. Well, this fourth seed is devoted to wisdom which is the combination of honesty and knowledge applied through experience. Wisdom is honest knowledge in action. There is no greater example of the law of cause and effect than that which is demonstrated in the results of a person's honesty or dishonesty. There can be no real success without honesty. Some way, some place, sometime, somehow, the person or house of wax will melt to reveal the fraud inside. Knowledge is the frontier of tomorrow. Brain is becoming more and more the master of brawn. Our struggle for physical survival may not be as crucial now and in the future as our ability to survive and coexist intellectually amid all of the fallout of our technological progress. One of the major problems we have in trying to work with each other toward mutually beneficial solutions to our problems lies in our ability or inability to express our thoughts in words. Frustration with this inability often results in physical violence. While violence has been increasing each year, the nation's vocabulary level has been decreasing approximately one percentage point each year over the same period. Regardless of education, 
Most people use only about 400 words in more than 80% of their everyday conversation. Although there are over 450,000 words in an unabridged English language dictionary, we use the same words over and over again. If we were to learn only 10 new words each day for one year, we could become among the most learned and well-spoken individuals in the world. A powerful secret of success came to me as a result of my research into aptitude testing, and it has real value in determining the success people experience in their everyday lives. Human engineering research over 50 years indicates that one of the most important aptitudes for success also is a mystery to 95% of the world's population. The fourth best-kept secret of total success is that a large vocabulary, which implies broad general knowledge, characterizes the more successful persons regardless of their occupations. And it should please you to know that reading and listening are the best ways to gain knowledge and a greater vocabulary. Only 5% of the people living in the United States will either buy or read a book or tape program this year or any year. As you continue to learn, you'll gain more knowledge about your natural talents and the skills you can develop to take advantage of them. As you read and listen, you will be able to express your ideas more clearly. You will identify and seek out the best role models to help accelerate your success. And the more education you receive, the happier you will become. As Thomas Wolfe summed it up in The Web and the Rock, if we have a talent and do not use it, we have failed. If we have a talent and use only half of it, we have partly failed. If we have a talent and learn somehow to use all of it, we have gloriously succeeded and won a satisfaction and triumph that few individuals ever know. You and I know that wisdom depends not so much on the number of words we know, but how we use them to express ourselves to others. It also depends upon the honest assessment of our talents and the determination to use them to the fullest. We apply this wisdom to our children and our associates. We live this wisdom every day, and we never stop reaching. The fifth seed of greatness is the seed of purpose. Remember in Alice in Wonderland when Alice comes to the junction in the road that leads in different directions, and she asks the Cheshire cat for direction? Oh, Cheshire Puss, would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? Well, that depends a good deal on where you want to go to, said the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. The grinning feline spoke words of truth, didn't he? If we really don't know where we want to go, then any road will take us there, and it really doesn't matter what we do in life. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, only three out of every 100 Americans reach age 65 with any degree of financial security. 97 out of 100 Americans who are 65 and over must depend upon their monthly Social Security checks to survive. Now, is this because the American dream has been shattered by world economic realities? Well, this is partially the cause, but there are deeper considerations. Would it surprise you to learn that only 5% of the Americans in the higher income professions, such as law and medicine, reach age 65 without having to depend upon Social Security? I was astounded to learn that so few individuals achieve any degree of financial success, regardless of their level of income during their most productive years. That's why I think this message is so important for you to review and to pass along to others close to you. Most people live their lives under the delusion that they're immortal in the body. They squander their money and their time and their minds with activities that are routine and tension relieving instead of goal achieving. Most people work to get through the week with enough extra money to spend on the weekend. Most people hope that the winds of fate will blow them into some rich and mysterious port of call. They look forward to when they can retire someday in the distant future and live on a fantasy island somewhere. I ask them how they'll accomplish this, and they respond, somehow. The fifth best-kept secret of total success is that the reason so many individuals fail to achieve their goals in life is that they never really set them in the first place. In all of my goal-setting seminars, it's obvious that the majority of people spend more time planning a Christmas party or vacation than they do planning their own lives. And by failing to plan, they're actually planning to fail by default. There is a power within, a driving mechanism that moves us toward our dominant thoughts. 
We've learned that our mind can't tell the difference between a real event that took place and one that was vividly imagined. So once the self-image receives a goal message with enough detail and frequency, that goal will become a habit that we accept as part of us. Have you ever stopped to think about your habits? How many do you have that you really don't want or that are not good for your mental or physical health? Smoking, drinking too much, overeating, being late, nail-biting, feeling depressed or cynical. These are all subconscious habits, most of which are learned by observation and then imitation and repetition. My own children are learning early about the visualization and the dream lists and the power within of goal setting. They don't completely understand the subconscious self-image, but they are tuned in completely on visualization of the dominant thought. I came down to breakfast one morning and stubbed my toe on a giant metal dish with lead weights in the bottom. I said, what's that landmine doing in the path of the refrigerator? My daughter Dana said, that's my dog's dish, Dad. And I growled, you don't have a dog and you aren't getting a dog and that's the end of that goal. But Dad, she came back, you said if you really set your mind on something and get all the information on it and imagine as if you already had it, that you'd get it. That's why I spent my allowance on my dog's dish. I interrupted her, as parents often do. I know what I said, but that was at the seminar and on the tapes. But we're home now in real life, and dads have to approve their kids' goals in advance. Obviously, she wasn't listening. She was focusing on her dog goal, because on Saturday I caught her walking down the street in front of the house, dragging a leash with nothing on it and talking to it. What are you doing talking to yourself with that empty chain, I asked. She replied sweetly that she was practicing taking him for a walk. I told her to practice in her room because the neighbors thought we were weird already watching me mow the lawn in my Navy jet flight suit. If you ever got a dog, I said, which you won't, what kind would it be, honey? I was curious now, and she complied eagerly. He's got a black fur coat with brown on his stomach and upper legs and a white diamond on his forehead and crystal clear blue eyes. She pulled out a little manual on the care and feeding of Malamute puppies. You'll learn to love Chemo, Dad. What do you mean, Chemo, I retorted. I've named him Chemo, she said, short for Chemosabi, which is Indian for good friend. You remember the Lone Ranger and Tano. The conversation was becoming impossible. Well, the next day was Father's Day. It had been a setup all along. When I came downstairs in my old bathrobe after sleeping in, I was going to have a bowl of four kinds of cereal, break open a six-pack, and watch every baseball game and old movie I could find on TV with no kids allowed in the house. But when I got downstairs, my kids were all dressed to go for an outing, and they gave me a card with a classified ad taped on the back. Last of the litter, one adorable AKC Malamute puppy, purebred paper shots, drive by today. Hurry, this one won't last. Don't you want to take your children for a drive on Father's Day? The little darlings all chimed in together. No, I don't, I said. I'm going to be a regular vidiot and glue myself to the TV all day. They came back at me with their own version of Harry Chapin's classic song, The Cats in the Cradle. Oh, that's okay, Dad, don't be blue, because we're going to grow up just like you. And someday when you're old and gray, you'll want us to visit you on Father's Day. And you'll say, come over, kids, and visit me. But we'll say, sorry, Dad, we're watching TV. Oh, well, that's okay, Dad. Don't be blue. We're going to grow up just like you. I said quietly, why don't we go for a drive then? I sat in the car while they visited the puppy in the kennel just to visit, not to buy. He came through their legs down to the car and rolled on his back to have his tummy scratched. And I think it was the blue eyes that did it. He licked my shoe. He knew who his master was. I said, come on, Chemo, get in the car and let's go home and watch the ball game. The dog cost $500. The fence cost $500, and he ate the lawn furniture and my best Adidas jogging shoes. He came through the screen door, which was locked, and he chewed a hole in my wife's new Persian rug, which had a mural of a Canadian snow goose woven in the middle, and Chemo thought it was a turkey and tried to eat it, and I grabbed him and made him spit out the yarn and wove every strand through the back trying to fix it. When my wife came home from the store, the kids and I were sitting quietly in the corner. What happened to my rug, she exclaimed, beginning to examine it. Oh, we were just roughhousing on it and got it a little dirty, and I shampooed it for you, I stammered. Best that you don't step on it just yet. Better wait a day or two until it dries. And while we were in the other room, my wife got out the vacuum cleaner and sucked the center out of the rug. Good heavens, she shrieked. What have you done to my beautiful rug? I tried to soothe her. 
It's probably one of those Iranian rugs and doesn't stand up well under normal environmental conditions. Your dog did this, she cried. It's not my dog, I protested. It's your daughter's dog. But you bought it, she said icily. But she thought it, I countered. And the air was rather cool around the house for the next week or two. Every time my wife walked past the spot where the rug used to lie, she muttered things about dogs and husbands as if they belonged together. She also said she wished lecturers would practice what they preached at seminars. And as for chemo, he grew up to be a fine family pet and a watchdog. And all of my kids believe in their dreams, and they realize how important it is to have someone to help you reach your goals. And the reason most people don't reach their goals is they don't define them, learn about them, or ever seriously consider them as believable or achievable. Remember, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. So you and I know where we're going, and we are living our lives on purpose. Now, please turn over the cassette to continue. The sixth seat of greatness is the seat of communication. Two basic aspects of communication that I believe are the most important are empathy and love. One of the best ways to begin to practice empathy is to be more open and sensitive to the needs and differences of others. Successful individuals look at relative viewpoints rather than absolutes. The prelude to empathy is realizing that each human being on earth is a person with equal rights to fulfill his or her own potential in life. It is understanding that skin color, birthplace, political beliefs, sex, financial status, and intelligence are not the measures of worth or worthiness. The path to communication is accepting the fact that every human being is a distinctly unique individual and thinking how good that is. No two people are alike, not even identical twins. Empathy is understanding that a busload of people riding home from work through the city will see the same scene from entirely different viewpoints. One will see the depressing, dilapidated buildings. Another will see an ideal site for a redevelopment project. Another, his face buried in his own problems, will see nothing. And still another person, her eyes eagerly scanning a textbook, will see a way out of the ghetto. It's important to try to view the world of others as they see it, rather than as we see it. And one way to do this is to look for the good in others regardless of how different their appearance, their lifestyle, and their particular beliefs are from our own. By looking for the good in others, you are communicating love, and love is the one message that we all need most. Valentines are love letters with simple statements of affection, and I'd like to give you a valentine to explain as fundamentally as possible what love really is. L is for listen. To love someone is to listen unconditionally to his or her values and needs without prejudice. O is for overlook. To love someone is to overlook the flaws and the faults in favor of looking for the good. V is for voice. To love someone is to voice your approval of him or her on a regular basis. There is no substitute for honest encouragement, positive strokes, and praise. E is for effort. To love someone is to make a constant effort to spend the time, to make the sacrifice, to go the extra mile to show your interest. In the first message on self-esteem, we talked about the need for independence and the ability to share ourselves with others out of choice, not out of different need. True love is that relationship formed by two individuals who have the ability of separately sustaining themselves. Only independent people are free to choose to stay in a relationship. People who are dependent remain in a relationship out of a necessity. Touch is the magic wand of intimacy. Love is keeping in touch. Intimacy, touching, communicating all take time. And the most precious moments you and I will ever spend with our children are those moments just before they go to sleep at night. Many activities are going on in the normal family in the early evening. There's dinner and homework and chores and video games and finances and meetings and television and phone calls and visitors and friends and pets just to name a few. 
Little wonder that the average American parent spend less than seven minutes each week alone with each child one-on-one -on -one, at a time when each one is receptive. Children spend more time watching television than they do communicating with their parents or acquiring an education. The sixth best-kept secret of total success is that a touch is worth a thousand words. As good communicators, you and I get in touch with strangers by extending our hands first knowing it is the time-proven courtesy for paying value to others. And along with a firm handshake, we use direct eye contact and a warm, open smile to project our interest in communication. We volunteer our own name first when meeting strangers, and we precede our name with good morning or good afternoon or good evening. This also holds true for telephone communication. Once you and I introduce ourselves, we become active listeners who listen for feelings with empathy. We understand that listeners learn a great deal, while talkers learn nothing. We look forward to new contacts and friends, and we talk easily with strangers. We look at people when we talk to them or listen to them, and we listen openly and carefully, even though we may disagree with what they are saying. We treat the other person as an equal. We listen to the seemingly dull and ignorant because they too have their story. We ask questions without imposing. We try to find special qualities in strangers and praise them sincerely. We draw strangers out by getting them to talk about themselves. We are easy to understand and easy to get along with. We don't assume what the other party's reaction will be to what we say, nor do we try to read his or her mind. We're confident in meeting strangers because we understand that no matter how secure other people may seem, almost everyone is eager to meet new people to gain a friendship or for personal development. We realize that almost everyone has a normal tendency to harbor a little fear of rejection or of exploitation. When you and I face a potential friend, a business prospect, or one of our own family members, our attitude is service-oriented, not self-oriented. Our concern is for the other person, not ourselves. When we have others' interests at heart, not just our own, they can sense it. They may not be able to put into words why they feel that way, but they do. And conversely, People get an uneasy feeling when they talk with people who have only their own self-interests in mind. It's the manifestation of nonverbal communication. What you are speaks so loudly that I can't hear what you're saying. The tongue can lie, but the body acts instinctively, subconsciously, and honestly. Our success in getting along with others and communicating effectively with them depends solely upon our ability to recognize their needs and help them fill those needs. Some people try to force their ideas upon others, but you and I use light to show the way. Remember the Aesop's fable in which the wind and the sun argued over which was the stronger? The wind said, Do you see that old man down there? I can make him take his coat off quicker than you can. And the sun agreed to go behind a cloud while the wind blew up a storm. However, the harder the wind blew, the firmer the old man wrapped his coat around him. Eventually, the wind gave up and the sun came out from behind the cloud and smiled kindly upon the old man. And before long, the old man mopped his brow, pulled off his coat, and strolled on his way. The sun knew the secret. Warmth, friendliness, and a gentle touch are always stronger than force and fury. The seventh great seed is the seed of faith, and it's one of the most powerful seeds of all. It was Saturday, November 1st, 1980, and Arnold Lemerand was taking a stroll. He heard some children screaming and hurried over to where they had been playing near a construction site. A massive cast-iron pipe had become dislodged and had rolled down on top of the children, pinning five-year-old Philip Toth against the earth. The boy's head was being forced into the dirt directly under the huge pipe, and certain suffocation appeared to be imminent. Arnold Lemerand looked around, but there was no one to help him in the attempted rescue. He did the only thing he could... He reached down and lifted the 1,800-pound cast-iron pipe off Philip's head. And after the incident, his grown sons tried to move it, but they couldn't even budge it an inch. In an interview later with the Associated Press, Mr. Lemerand, who was 56 at the time, said that he had suffered a major heart attack six years before. I tried to avoid heavy lifting, he smiled, with a young boy's arm around his neck. We hear about such miraculous power surges every so often, don't we? We hear of grandmothers lifting cars and firemen making impossible rescues in burning buildings, exhibiting superhuman strength.
Those kinds of stories used to sound rather tall to me, since I've always been one to check the source and document the advice that people give me as to its validity. But in recent years, I've become a real believer in the power of faith and what it can do. Faith is the key to unlock the door of success for every human being, or it is the lock that imprisons and keeps that human being from ever experiencing success at all. As a positive power, faith is the promise of the realization of things hoped for and unseen. As a negative power, it is the premonition of our deepest fears. There is no such thing as the absence or lack of faith. There is simply the replacement of faith with its opposite belief, despair. Much has been written through the ages and in recent years about the self-fulfilling prophecy. My old friend S.I. Hayakawa refers to the self-fulfilling prophecy as a statement that is neither true nor false, but is capable of becoming true if it is believed. We learned in the second message on creativity and the imagination that the mind can't distinguish between something that is real and something that is vividly imagined. That's why the concepts of faith and belief are so important. The seventh best-kept secret of total success is that life is a self-fulfilling prophecy. You won't necessarily get what you want in life, but in the long run, you will usually get what you expect. Although we have much to learn in understanding the mechanisms in the brain and the central nervous system, we are aware of the inextricable relationship between psyche and soma, mind and body. There is a definite reaction in the body as a result of the thoughts and concerns of the mind. What the mind harbors, the body manifests in some way. For example, when our fears and worries turn into anxiety, we suffer distress. This distress activates the endocrine system in our bodies and production of hormones and antibodies changes. Our natural immunity system is less active and our resistance levels are lowered. We become more vulnerable to outside bacteria and virus and other environmental hazards which are always present. Scientists have known for many years that hormones play an important part in regulating certain biological processes. Adrenaline, for example, is the hormone that enables us to fight or flee in the face of danger or in response to a call for peak physical performance, like the man who lifted the pipe off of the boy's head. Insulin regulates the sugar levels in our blood. During the past 10 years, discoveries are showing us that morphine-like hormones called endorphins, are being produced in our own bodies to block pain and give us a natural high. Well, if our thoughts can cause the brain to release adrenaline from the adrenal glands to help a 56-year-old heart patient lift an 1,800-pound pipe off a boy's head, and if our thoughts can produce natural pain relievers called endorphins that are 50 to 190 times as powerful as morphine, is it not possible for us to use this power of faith in our everyday life? with the only side effect being happiness? You bet it is. And when people look at you in awe and ask you why you're so pumped up and optimistically high on life, tell them you're on endorphins. They'll say, it figures, we knew you were on something. Here are some action steps to more optimism and faith. First, fly with the eagles. Don't run around with the turkeys and the henny pennies who are looking up, chanting the sky is falling. Optimism and realism go together. They're the problem-solving twins. Pessimism and cynicism are the two worst companions. As you help other people in your daily life, develop an inner circle of close associations in which the mutual attraction is not sharing problems or needs. The mutual attraction should be values and goals. Next, if you become depressed, visit any one of these four places, a children's hospital, a senior citizen's retirement home, the burn ward at a hospital, or an orphanage. If seeing people worse off than yourself depresses you more, take the positive approach. Take a walk by a playground or a park where children are playing and laughing. Sometimes just a change of scenery can change your outlook. Next, listen to upbeat, inspiring music. Scan the national section on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Resist the temptation to waste time reading the local and national papers about the sordid details of someone else's tragedies. If possible, have breakfast and lunch with an optimist. Instead of camping in front of the TV at night, spend some time listening to and being involved with those that you love. Another step, change your vocabulary. Instead of, I'm worn out, say, I'm ready to relax after an active day. Instead of, why don't they do something, try, I know what I'm going to do. And instead of, 
Why me, God? Make it try me, God. Next, get high on your thoughts and your goals. Instead of relief is just to swallow away, think of belief will help you follow the way. Get those endorphins going in your brain. Engage in positive recreation and education. Subscribe to cable TV programs specializing in the wonders of nature and in family health and cultural enrichment. And select the movies and TV you watch for their quality and the story value rather than their commercial appeal. Visualize, think, and speak well of your health. Use positive self-talk every day. And don't dwell on colds and headaches and cuts and bruises and minor ailments. If you pay too much attention to them, they'll reward you by becoming your best friends, coming often to pay their respects. Remember, what the mind harbors, the body manifests. And call, visit, or write someone in need every day of your life. Demonstrate your faith by passing it on to someone else. Seed number eight is the seed of adaptability. You know, these are troubled times. Many people bide their time and hope that the future will favor them with a brighter outlook. Others would gladly turn back the hands of time to the good old days when a haircut cost two bits, when the air was clean and when life was uncomplicated and enjoyable. Today, if you pick up the newspaper and turn to the editorial page, you might read something like this, which is a news item. The world is too big for us, too much going on, too many crimes, too much violence and excitement. Try as you will, you get behind in the race. It's an incessant strain to keep pace, and still you lose ground. Science empties its discoveries on you so fast that you stagger beneath them in hopeless bewilderment. Everything is high pressure. Human nature can endure much more. This sound familiar? Well, this newspaper editorial reads like it could have been written last week or last night but it actually appeared more than a century and a half ago on June 16, 1833, in the Atlantic Journal. That was back in the good old days. What does it mean to you and me? I believe that this simple, tattered editorial, 150 years old, teaches us one of the great secrets of success. The eighth best-kept secret of total success is that the good old days are here and now. And the main reason that the good old days are here and now is such a secret is that most people dwell on their current problems and remember the good times they had in the past. Another major reason it's such a well-kept secret is that most people don't learn from history that problems are normal. But the most important reason is that most people play up how awful conditions are today in order to justify their own lack of productivity and achievement. Every generation laments its position as the one that is living under the most pressing and difficult circumstances in history. By complaining about the cruel world and sticking their heads in the sand, they never really have to roll up their sleeves and solve their problems. They can blame their problems on their elders and on their children, or better still, on the government. And they can pursue society's favorite diversion, a scapegoat. A scapegoat is a game in which everyone runs and hides and tries to find someone else willing to be it. In all of my lectures and seminars for youth, I tell our leaders of tomorrow the truth that the so-called good old days are here and now, because these are the days of our lives, not some soap opera, but the Super Bowl every day. This is the only time in history in which we will be living, and this is our time. I tell them that the good old days at the turn of the century when the horses were dying of cholera in the streets of New York. I tell them of the great old days when we used to take baths in a huge pan with water heated over a wood stove, and that we were fifth in line using the same bath water after our uncle, and he was a pig farmer, and we got ring around the person instead of the collar. I tell our young leaders about the good old days in the early 40s and 50s, with polio and diphtheria and scarlet fever. I show them the headlines in the Boston Globe for November 12, 1857. The headlines read, Energy Crisis Looms, with the subhead, World to Go Dark, Whale Blubber Scarce. In the year 2020, our teenagers' kids will be driving liquid hydrogen-powered cars that will exhaust pure oxygen and steam into the atmosphere. They'll come home and say, you mean you used to drive those fossil remains burning cars back in the 80s and 90s? And their parents will retort, of course we did. Things were tough back then. We used to have to drive to school. You mean you went to school? The teenagers in 2020 will gasp in disbelief. You're darn right we did. Your grandparents walked to school. We drove to school. Now you sit home on your rear end with this Apple 30 and the AT&T orbiting library video text. We used to do that stuff in arcades back in the good old days. We called it Pac-Man and Frogger back then. Our sixth grade athletes today 
are breaking the Olympic world record set back during the 40s and 50s. And our young people are getting taller and stronger and healthier and smarter. I finish my lectures to the high schools of America by letting the students in on the location for their grandchildren's senior prom. In the 21st century, it will be common for proms to be held in foreign countries like Australia, which will be a popular choice for our kids. Australia will be a half-orbital shuttle run of 49 minutes with a shuttle busload of formerly attired space travelers enjoying the spectacular but brief panoramic view. They'll go to Australia for the prom, but they'll sneak over to Hong Kong for the after prom, telling us they were still in Australia with the chaperones the whole evening. Some things never change. We need to learn from that ancient Chinese definition of crisis that I use in all of my seminars. The Chinese symbols for crisis are identical to those for the word opportunity. Literally translated, it reads, crisis is an opportunity riding the dangerous wind. The best way to adapt to change and lead a successful life is to view crises as opportunities and to look at stumbling blocks in your path as stepping stones to the stars. Seed number nine is the seed of perseverance. The seed of perseverance is similar to faith, but it's different in that it is the test of faith. Perseverance is hanging in there when the odds stack up against you, but you know you're right. One of the most fundamental character traits common to all successful individuals whom I have studied is that they all believe in God. With this belief in the order and ongoing promise of the universe, they've been able to develop creative imaginations and self-esteem and wisdom and goals and a deep faith in their convictions and commitments. Their faith has been the strong root system that has allowed them to bend and grow with the winds of change without their spirits breaking. This ability to bend and spring back is demonstrated in their unusual adaptability and in their habit of looking at the bright side of even the darkest situation. Maybe that's why real success is such a well-kept secret. Everybody wants it. Most people spend countless days and years dreaming about it. Everyone talks, writes, visualizes it, and goes to meetings to hear more about it. And that's as far as it goes. Why? People say they're putting their faith in a miracle. But miracles have been proven to be faith in action. When someone says, what happened is a miracle, he usually follows in the next breath with, our prayers were answered, and we never gave up hope that if we just kept on working, we would see it through. The ninth best-kept secret of total success is that winners work at doing things the majority of the population are not willing to do. You'll notice that I said work at doing things that others are not willing to do. I did not say not able to do. I said not willing. An individual who will not read or learn or work is the real loser in the game of life. Those who cannot read or learn or work because of a disability or an oppressive environment are not losers. They are heroes and heroines in the struggle just to get to the starting line. The real losers in life are those who want to look like, earn like, dress like, take time off like, travel like, own like, retire like, and be like somebody else. They are losers by default rather than by defeat in the arena of life. In America, there is no excuse for default and despair because we throw out in our garbage every week what the people of the underdeveloped countries eat in a year. One Thanksgiving dinner for an American family of five would feed 20 starving citizens of one of the underdeveloped nations for a month. No socioeconomic condition in this country will disallow the planting and nurturing of the seeds of greatness. As the powerful character actor in the recent Rocky movie, Mr. T of Rocky III, puts it straight out on the table, I may have been raised in the ghetto, but there ain't no ghetto in me. Yes, there is poverty and discrimination and ignorance and bigotry and injustice and irony in this country. And yes, there is opportunity and determination and information and openness and justice and faith in this country. What is needed is this best-kept secret called perseverance. Show me someone who has succeeded in the face of incredible odds, and I will show you a person who knows that perseverance makes the difference. One afternoon, my wife and I were invited to the home of Ray Kroc, founder of the world-famed McDonald's hamburger chain. Although we chatted for only 30 minutes or so, I learned a lot about the man behind McDonald's. Two slogans of his say more than pages of history ever could. The first saying is one my grandmother used to repeat while we were working in her garden. As long as you're green, you're growing. 
As soon as you're ripe, you start to rot. Croc's second scene is my favorite, and it was also Vince Lombardi's favorite. Press on. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful individuals with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. Seed number 10 is perspective, putting it all together. When Lauren Isley wrote The Star Thrower, he must have had someone like me in mind. It's the story of a man my age who goes to the seashore to try to gain true perspective on the meaning of life. It reminds me in some ways of one of my favorite books, Gift from the Sea by Anne Morrow Lindbergh, which if you haven't read it, you really should treat yourself to a marvelous experience in self-dimension, written by the widow of the most famous American who ever lived, Charles Lindbergh. From the moment I read Isley's story that day on a secluded beach in Australia and considered its meaning, I decided that I must have been placed upon the earth to be a star thrower. The star thrower tells of a man in his prime who observes the shell collectors at the beach in the height of the tourist season, particularly after a storm, engaged in a kind of greedy madness to outcollect their less aggressive neighbors. He watches them scrambling along the beach at dawn with bundles of gathered starfish, hermit crabs, sea urchins, and other living shells. Arguing and toppling over each other, overburdened, they rush in a kind of frenzy to outdo each other for these fine specimens. The shell collectors then boil the shell houses, with occupants included, in outdoor kettles provided by the resort hotels as a service to guests, who will then show off their proud collections to envious relatives and friends back home. And I've met many people with the collector's morality and mentality. They're not unique to the seashore. They're in every country and every city and every hometown. They are the people who are trying to collect life and trying to own happiness. They are the consumers. As I became engrossed in Isley's book, I thought how easily I could have been the middle-aged man in this story. This man noticed a solitary human figure standing near the water's edge in the center of a rainbow caused by the sun-filled spray from the surf. The figure stooped over, then stood up, tossing an object out to sea beyond the breaking surf. The spectator, who could have been me, finally reached the older figure and asked him what he was doing. The old man with the bronzed, worn face answered softly, I'm a star thrower. Expecting to see a sand dollar or perhaps a flat rock, like the ones he used to sail across the water for fun, the younger man came closer for a better look. The old man, with a quick yet gentle movement, picked up another starfish and spun it gracefully far out to sea. It may live if the offshore pull is strong enough, the old man smiled. Here was a human being who was not a collector. He said he had decided to be part of life and had dedicated himself to helping give the starfish another day, another week, another year, another opportunity for living. The younger man silently reached down and skipped a still-living star across the water toward freedom. He felt like a gardener sowing the seeds of life. He looked back over his shoulder. Against the rainbow, the old star thrower stooped and flung once more. He understood the secret. The star thrower's secret is for all of us to know and live by. Life cannot be collected. Happiness cannot be traveled to or owned or earned or worn or consumed. Happiness is the experience of living every minute with love, grace, and gratitude. The gift of life is not a treasure hunt. You cannot look for success. The treasure is within you. It only needs to be uncovered and discovered. The secret is to turn a life of collection into a life of celebration. All the best-kept secrets of success involve your perspective, how you see life from within. The seeds of greatness are the responses or attitudes you develop as a result of seeing the world more clearly. When you see more clearly, you see yourself as valuable and your self-esteem grows strong. Seeing clearly enables your imagination to create and soar. Seeing more clearly gives you the understanding that you are responsible for learning as much and contributing as much as you can to life. When you see life from within, you see wisdom, purpose, and faith 
as cornerstones of your family's foundation. You see through the eyes of love and reach out and touch all those with whom you come in contact. Seeing from within is having the courage to adapt to and change and to persevere when the odds seem overwhelming. But you know you're right. Seeing from within is believing that beauty and goodness are worth planting every day. Perspective, seeing from within, is not only the tenth and final secret, it is the very essence of all that I have ever written and all that I have recorded and narrated in this audio cassette. How we see life makes all the difference. We need to seed and cultivate our gardens. The need to work in the garden never ends. It is never finished, never done. Plant apple seeds, and you get apple trees. Plant acorns, and you get great oak trees. Plant weeds, and you will harvest weeds. And plant the seeds of great ideas, and you will get great individuals. So go out and set the greatest success example you can by planting your own seeds of greatness. The seeds of greatness are within you. Before we sign off, we want to invite you to send us your comments and suggestions for other programs you'd like to see. In return for writing us, we'll send you our latest catalog listing all of our materials. Just send your comments to Listen and Learn, P.O. Box 396, Old Greenwich, Connecticut, 06870. Thanks for listening. We'd be happy to listen to you, too. Most innovation in major organizations is not the result of the lone genius or the lone inventor working by himself or herself, but is part of a collaborative process in which people from many fields contribute to implementing new ideas. The problem in most American organizations is not a dearth of good ideas, but a failure of the system permitting people to take the kinds of actions they need to implement their good ideas. Change masters help shake up their own and other people's thinking. They also build coalitions. Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. He didn't say, I have a few ideas and maybe some of them will work and maybe some of them won't. The corporations that will succeed and flourish in the times ahead will be those that have mastered the art of change. Welcome to this Listen and Learn program, filled with useful information. This session is designed to sharply increase your awareness on the subject and give you ideas and knowledge that you can put to work right away. As with all Listen and Learn programs, you hear from the experts, people who have already been there and who have had success. We've structured the program to run under 45 minutes, which our research shows is the optimal listening period so we won't take too much of your time. 
Of course, we can't hope to present everything there is to know in a short session like this, but we will give you all the important highlights so that you'll have a good overview when you've completed the session. For more information, listen to the message at the end of this cassette. Okay? Let's begin. Listen, learn, and enjoy. This is Tony White, publisher of Listen and Learn. I'm very pleased to introduce to you Rosabeth Moss Cantor, professor of sociology and organization management in the School of Management at Yale University. She's also chairman of an international management consulting firm and has authored seven books and numerous articles based on her recognition as a pioneer in the study of organizational change. Dr. Cantor is the author of The Change Masters and a very sought after speaker. Let's listen into Dr. Cantor live at a recent national meeting. My topic today is Mastering Change and Innovation, and I want to begin by telling you a rather literate story about innovation. It's a problem that a number of American companies and American organizations have around innovation that I have termed the roast pig problem. I named it after a classic essay in English literature by Charles Lamb called A Dissertation on Roast Pork, which some of you may remember reading in high school English classes. It's basically a fable about an innovation, the discovery of cooking. The story describes a time in ancient China that was very primitive. Food was not cooked, the animals lived among the people, and one day a son was left to guard his house by his father and accidentally set it afire. When he came back, the father was very concerned and started poking around in the ruins. And of course, a number of the family animals, including its pet pig, had been caught in the burning house. So in poking around in the ruins, the father accidentally put his finger on the pig that had burned there, was sitting there charred. And because it was hot, he put his fingers in his mouth, and it was delicious. They had thereby discovered cooking. And from that moment on, any time anybody in the village wanted cooked meat, they burned their house down. <laughs> the moral of the story is that if you don't understand why the pig gets cooked, you're doomed to waste an awful lot of houses. <laughs> and in American companies, particularly with our, our current predilection for copying practices of other companies or other countries or importing systems wholesale without understanding the fundamental principles that make organizations work, or that motivate people to perform, or that stimulate innovation, we're in danger of wasting the whole house every time all we want is a roast pork dinner. So I want to give you a few of those fundamentals or essentials about innovation and the mastery of change. Innovation is very important today, increasingly important in today's competitive international economic environment because it is our leading national competitive advantage. Where America still leads in world markets, it leads because of innovation. Computers, pharmaceuticals, certain sectors of the medical electronics business and so forth. If we can't compete as the low cost producer, we can compete as the idea people. And of course, ideas are one of the best stimuluses to economic growth that exists. And ideas only occur through people. As products mature, as companies age, as services become routine, clearly the domain for innovation shifts, maybe away from the breakthrough new invention or the breakthrough new service. But the need for innovation does not decline, no matter what the age of the organization or the age of the industry is. At Procter & Gamble, for example, a company long known for a strategy of continual product innovation over 10-year planning cycles, their domain for innovation increasingly is in their manufacturing systems and in their treatment of people in the manufacturing world. And in fact, that kind of early innovation in an internal system rather than in their products is standing them in good stead as they increasingly have to compete against generic products or unbranded products on a cost basis. So innovation is important to every aspect of an organization's functioning. It's not a task only for the research and development department, nor is it a task only for the chief executive or for a few creative geniuses. Everybody at every level of every organization can contribute to innovation, to staying ahead of change through new ideas effectively used. When I say staying ahead of change, 
I'm not saying that innovation has to be very far out in order to be effective. In fact, the story I like to tell was written by Woody Allen. I hope I have some Woody Allen fans here. He tells a story about UFOs in which he says that what worries him about an advanced civilization landing on Earth is not a civilization that's thousands of years ahead of us or even hundreds of years ahead of us. It's one that's just 15 minutes ahead because he said they'll always be first in line for the movies and they'll never be late for an appointment with the boss. <laughs> Fifteen minutes may be all the competitive advantage one needs. So in talking about innovation, I'm also not talking about things that are beyond the realm of what people currently active in our organizations can envision. It's also important to realize that most innovation in major organizations is not the result of the lone genius or the lone inventor working by himself or herself, but is part of a collaborative process in which people from many fields contribute to implementing new ideas. Again, requiring the active involvement of people in every field and every level. When I think about the kinds of new products, for example, that we've generated because of the lone genius or the lone inventor, it strikes me that they hit maybe 50% of the time, and that's not enough of a margin for most organizations. Think about two important new products. Both were developed because of the lone executive model, thinking it through and not consulting anybody else. One was the Sony Walkman. Evidently, the chairman of Sony thought it all up, didn't look at market research, said, this is a good idea and we're going to do it. And that took partly because he was tuned and sensitive to what people wanted and needed. So even in that case, it wasn't the lone genius or the lone inventor. It was someone sensitive to what other people wanted and needed. But in the other model, in a company that's otherwise very in innovative, Edwin Land invented a product called Polavision. How many of you have heard of Polavision? See what I mean? Polavision was a breakthrough in terms of technology, instant movies. The only problem was nobody needed it because we had videotape. Most successful innovations in American organizations are not the result of the lone genius or the lone inventor. They require collaboration, and generally collaboration across boundaries in which more than one department or more than one discipline is involved and consulted. And organizations that stimulate a great deal of innovation are less boundary conscious and less category conscious. They make it possible for people at all levels, in all domains, across racial, sexual, and other kinds of divisions between people to combine forces to innovate. The problem in most American organizations is not a dearth of good ideas, but a failure of the system permitting people to take the kinds of actions they need to implement their good ideas. What I've been looking at for the past several years are the people and companies that I call change masters, the ones that are good at anticipating the need for and leading productive change through innovation, innovations that people need that are going to help the organization attain a higher level of performance in any of its multiple systems. I'll tell you a little bit about the characteristics of the people who are change masters and then something about the organizational settings that permit them to flourish. Change masters are good at four particular things. First, they're very good at shaking up their own thinking and the thinking of other people and combining unusual elements drawn from many fields to develop a new application or a new idea that somebody's going to need. The first thing change masters tend to do when they have an assignment requiring innovation or an idea that they want to plant in the organization is to consult with people outside their field rather than in it, is to seek a multiplicity of perspectives that will shake up the conventional categories in which they had thought because those conventional categories are what locks us into the past rather than helps us anticipate what we do not yet know. One of the best examples to me, partly because it's so entertaining, of this shaking up of others' thinking occurred in a company, and it was the CEO here who was the change master helping people learn to innovate. 
um, occurred at a management conference of a company that started the way all of their top executive off-site conferences had begun. It started in a hotel room, and it began with a series of rather long-winded speeches, hopefully not like the one you're listening to today. And as the CEO was about an hour and a half into his recital of the last year's operating performance and the goals for the next year, all of a sudden the meeting was interrupted by a set of men who came in wearing the garb of prison guards who grabbed the executives out from their round tables at which they were thinking, led them out where a set of helicopters were waiting that flew them to another meeting location where the real meeting began. And that meeting was punctuated with a series of continuing surprises, including a parade of elephants down the beach. And the first elephant was a small elephant, and it had a numerical goal for the next five years that was a goal that was in line with what operating projections had been. But then the next elephant was a little bit bigger and had a bigger goal. And the third elephant was gigantic and had a gigantic goal. Now, naturally, this took place in California. I'm looking at the faces of some of the executives in the audience saying, first of all, you can't find elephants on a beach in Minnesota, but even if you could, would you really want to do it in the Midwest? I realize California is a little odd. But the point of the meeting was he was trying to shake people's thinking, to get them not to think in conventional categories, but to think big, to stretch limits, to go beyond what they already thought was possible to attain the impossible, and he succeeded. People came back with a different kind of projection and a different kind of stimulation to try things that were new and different. So change masters help shake up their own and other people's thinking. They also build coalitions. Change masters work through other people. Change masters know how to move around and across the organization, up levels, down levels, across departments, in order to assemble just the right team or just the right set of backers to carry out the project that the change master envisions. In fact, in some high-tech companies, this becomes so well known as a way to get things done that this process of buy-in has been elaborated with its own colorful language and vocabulary. At one high-tech company, for example, they talk about this process as tin cupping. A manager goes around the organization with his tin cup in hand and asks others whether they have something to chip in. Maybe it's a piece of budget, maybe it's some key information, maybe it's a staff member to loan, or maybe it's just the sense that they will be a supporter of this effort and this initiative. And tin cupping works. Of course, I mean, the idea of people going out and beg is also not palatable in a large number of companies, but it works in part because top executives are more likely to listen to ideas that come after the tin cup has been filled, after the coalition is in place, and ideas are more likely to work if they've had to be tested against, this company calls it sanity checks, tested against the people who are going to respond about whether they're going to chip in their little reserve of money or support or time to support this idea and support this project. So change masters are coalition builders. They know how to get their tin cups filled. And change masters, third, are people who know how to persist in the clarity of their own vision. I found that the difference between the successful and the unsuccessful innovations, and I looked at more than 300 innovations across about a dozen companies in depth, as well as looking at the 47 progressive companies in terms of general practices and systems. The innovations that succeeded compared with those that didn't often succeeded because the innovator persisted. Nearly any project looked like a failure at some point in its history. The difference between success and failure was not only the extent to which a coalition had been consulted and involved, but also the extent to which the change master was willing to persist. That clarity of vision, sense of rightness of this direction, sometimes against discouraging messages from the organization, and sometimes willing to bend a few rules, although naturally, especially on radio, I don't advocate breaking rules. But we all know that there are sometimes aspects of the system that have to be bent, acting as though there's been sign-off and approval because you have to get going, even though it's going to take two more weeks, or making a budgetary transfer that maybe, if they knew about it, wouldn't be a good idea. Taking risks, 
It's that ability to believe in the vision and to convey it with certainty to the other people who are being involved in the innovation. You know, I'm struck as I address audiences all over America how much we think inno of innovation as a positive thing today, and of course it is, in retrospect. And innovation is only a good idea after it's happened and it's worked. I mean, Orville, you're never going to get me up in one of those things. Innovations are always dangerous in anticipation. Even innovations in internal management systems, if they haven't yet been done in your organization, so that persistence and clarity of vision and certainty on the part of the change master is critical. I mean, Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. He didn't say, I have a few ideas and maybe some of them will work and maybe some of them won't. He had a vision. Brigham Young, when he led the Mormons to Utah, didn't say, well, we're going to try heading west, but if it doesn't work, maybe we'll go to North Carolina. I hear things are good there. He said, we're going west. Change masters are good at communicating a clear vision. They persist in their idea. And finally, they work through teams. They not only build coalitions of supporters who are helping them check the sanity of their idea. By the way, to me, peers are one of the best control systems that many companies have, better than the formal control systems. Peers are more likely to say, what a crummy idea and turn it down or help reshape it. So it's not only the coalition of supporters, it's also the ability to work through teams, to assemble the working team that actually implements the innovation and getting them to feel, even though there's a leader with a strong driving vision, getting the people in the team to feel that they've done it. That's a neat trick. You know, I found in American organizations that there is no incompatibility as we've been told recently, between American individualism and Japanese-style teamwork. First of all, teamwork is just as American as it is Japanese. I spoke to a Polaroid executive recently who said to me, you know, it's interesting. We were doing some of that Japanese-style stuff 20 years ago. I said to him, did you hear what you just said? If you were doing it 20 years ago, American companies can do it. So there is no tension between teamwork and individualism. Change masters are strong individuals with driving visions who know how to assemble and work through a team that feels ownership for the results. In fact, some of you may have read Tracy Kidder's account of an innovation at Data General, The Soul of a New Machine. It reads like a novel, even though it's a true story about the development of a new computer at Data General, one that fits my model beautifully, by the way, because he took risks and broke rules and argued for it and persisted and worked through teams. In fact, he said, the innovator, Tom West, behind this computer, said at the end, he said, you know, when this is over, the people who've worked on this are going to feel it's theirs. There are going to be officially 35 inventors of the Eagle machine. He said, that's all right, it's cheaper than money. Let them think they did it. But he did let them feel they do it. Well, cha individual change masters have these characteristics and do these things, but their job is made infinitely easier in companies that are organized so as to support innovation. In many organizations, you'll have some innovation no matter how discouraging the system is, but it will never come to fruition. Change masters benefit from organizational systems that are also masters of change, that are also designed to stimulate and support and provide tools for change masters to do their work. First, companies that are change masters make it very easy to cross boundaries. I said they're less category conscious, and I mean that in every dimension. They seem to be less discriminatory in terms of women and minorities. They seem to be less concerned about level homogeneity. You know, I speak to a lot of companies where I sometimes suggest that more than two levels of management at once sit in the same room and find that that's considered heresy. And those that manage three levels together in the same room are horrified at four or five all together at the same place. Well, the companies that are change masters make it easy to cross those boundaries of category, of level, of department, of function, they sometimes design it in through having overlapping territories so you couldn't be category conscious even if you wanted to because you only have half of the responsibility for the problem. They make it easy to get the necessary information 
to have new ideas, build teams, and take them through the system, and they make it easy to get the support and the resources to use idea power, the most potent economic stimulus of all. Now, please turn over the cassette to continue. Here are a few key features of those companies that support change mastering and innovation. They have, first of all, what's called open communication systems. Now, everybody in American industry says they have an open communication system. In fact, one employee told me about his company's open door policy. He said, sure, we have an open door policy. You go in and complain to your boss, and if he doesn't like it, the door's always open. So what open communication means in practice is another issue. By open communication in the high innovation places, it means that information flows to people who, might, who are not seen to need it based on what their current responsibilities or jobs are. People are engaged in information overload. They go to more meetings than they want to. We all complain about meetings, but let me tell you folks, it's the wave of the future and we'll get better at them because there's no way to stay ahead of change and remain competitive without occasions in which people transfer more information than is seen to be necessary for the task at hand. Because it's from those extra reserves of ideas popping up in unexpected places that change masters combine pieces of problems and pieces of solutions to innovate. I've seen it taken to extremes in some companies. My next example isn't going to be California, but it's going to be Boston, and to some people that's just the same. Wang Laboratories, for a while, a very innovative company making word processors, had a policy, at least a stated policy, in which anybody could theoretically attend any meeting. Luckily, most people are so over-meeting that they wouldn't take advantage of it. But was an attempt to articulate a principle that says, we need to be innovative, and we don't know who's going to need to know it or take advantage of that information. Hewlett-Packard, for a while, made its open communication in quote-unquote real time, that is live, system so meaningful for people that they had a paging system in one of the facilities. Not only did they have offices with just little partitions so everybody could see what was on everybody else's desk, but they also had a paging system so that people could be tracked down no matter where they were to be contacted at the moment, information needed to be transferred. Now, they did stop that because we definitely need to balance open communication with some limits and boundaries so that we can do our routine jobs. But it's a good example of how far some of the most progressive, profitable, and innovative companies have taken this idea, the necessity of open information flow, in order to continue to achieve and not just repeat past successes. They also have what I call cultures of pride. They're proud of their people, and it's clear in the ways in which they invest in their people that they're proud of them. Culture of pride is tremendously important in helping change masters do their work, because how do you assemble a team or a coalition or get support if everyone feels we're all turkeys around here and we never have any good ideas? And not only that, you might not last. It's impossible to create the kind of longer-range project necessary for innovation if people aren't proud of themselves and others' achievements and therefore willing to take the risk to back each other on those efforts and on those ventures. And a culture of pride is communicated in a variety of ways. Some of it is in official statements that we're the best and we hold to quality standards, and so all of the efforts today toward quality are also very important in terms of internal conditions for innovation. It's also conveyed in how much is spent on human resources 
as opposed to solving the problems created by not spending it later. I can contrast two companies that I work with well and know intimately. They end up spending about equal amounts on human resources, but the first spends it in training and long-term um, career development. The second spends it on having to replace all the people that leave because they don't spend on training and long-term career development. And they really end up spending equivalent amounts of money. But in the first case, it's spent in ways that make people feel we're important, they're proud of us, we're proud to work here. The companies that discourage innovation have a culture of inferiority or mediocrity in which the message to everybody in the system is, you're not capable of anything more than you're doing and you're not worth investing in. And so they do things like use outsiders every time there's a change problem. You see their top executive ranks turning over every five to six years predictably. In one of the companies I looked at in depth, six of their, new, of their nine top executives were new within two years. The message to people in the system is you're not capable of doing anything new or better or different. We have to get outsiders. And they use consultants heavily for trivia. I mean, I'm not against, don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm not against using consultants. But when the message to the people is you don't know anything inside, all knowledge, wisdom, and new ideas come from outside. These companies, by the way, also stay very, I mean, that are innovation producing, also stay very closely attuned to trends in the environment because that's one of the ways they know what to innovate about because it's important that somebody wants whatever they're innovating about. But they also value and support the wisdom and capacity of their people. And they show this in a variety of ways. They show this by having reward systems that I call investment-oriented rather than payoff oriented. They tend to put more emphasis in giving it to people in advance than after the fact. An interesting counterintuitive way to think about how you reward people and motivate them to produce. You have a pool of money that could be distributed in bonuses. Maybe you're better off taking a portion of that pool and making it available as internal venture capital. For projects, if employees have proposals that they want to make, they get a little budget. Instead of waiting three years later for the few that manage to get by the hurdles in the system and manage to get something done, then you hand it out to them afterwards. Thanks a lot, you know, when you don't need it. Evidently, um, Dr. Samuel Johnson once defined a patron in similar ways. He said, isn't a patron, my friend, someone who, when he sees a drowning man in the ocean, waits till he struggles his way out and then encumbers him with help. Getting it after you've already proven you can achieve is often not as meaningful to people as being given the opportunity to do it in the first place, to be invested in, whether that's giving people a job they're not quite ready for yet, so they stretch to live up to the job, as opposed to the Peter principle of waiting till they failed at the last job and then giving them a higher level position or whether it means making available the chance to do it, making available resources and support in advance, betting on potential. This again was captured nicely in Soul of a New Machine when the people who worked literally often 80 hours a week doing an impossible technological job of producing an entirely new breakthrough computer in a year were asked, what would you do it for? And the answer that came was pinball. Pinball. It's like playing pinball. If you win, you win a free game. It's the chance to do it that we like. Now, of course, a few stock options at the end don't hurt either. I'm not saying we shouldn't stop giving awards and stop compensating achievement appropriately, but to put more of our emphasis in that betting on potential is what stimulates innovation, and that's what change mastering companies do. In integrative environments, people pull together across boundaries to solve problems. People are not bound by their level or job or function in terms of what they can contribute to. When the company needs it, it can pull together ad hoc teams to solve problems. And problems that occur are not divided up, carved up into territories and handed in small pieces to a variety of territory experts. Instead, they're aggregated and looked at as bigger problems. Problems are accumulated as examples of what we need to do in the future to do better. Problems are warning signs 
not things to be handed to specialists to take care of so that we at the top don't have to be bothered with it. So integrative environments are team-oriented, anti-categorical, and flexible, compared to those places I call segmentalist, where work is carved up into segments, handed to specialists, careers occur through narrow specialist tracks, and segments don't communicate with other segments, except to give them results, maybe the money that the segment managed to produce. Those segmentalist environments stifle innovation and manage to snuff out those bits of creativity or new thinking that do exist in their people. Because as I said, I saw some beginnings of innovation, some innovation, even in the most discouraging kinds of environments. In fact, as you know, it's very fashionable at the moment to write corporate philosophies and tack the principles by which we operate up on the wall for everybody to see. Well, I imagined that segmentalist companies have a, corp a set of rules by which we operate too, that they tack up on the wall for top executives to live by, except the rules sound a little bit like this. They're the rules for stifling innovation. The first is, be suspicious of every new idea from below, because it's new, of course, and because it's from below. The second is, be sure that anybody who needs your approval to act has to go through many other levels of the organization first. That not only ensures that top executives won't be bothered because maybe they're knocked out of the game earlier, but it also means that people at the top in segmentalist companies can remain nice guys. They're never the ones that have to say no. Somebody else always has to do it. The third rule for stifling innovation is withhold praise, express criticism, and instill job insecurity. Because that keeps people on their toes. I mean, that shows you have standards. Well, as I've already indicated, it's places with cultures of pride where there's a great deal of praise to be had that are the ones that really show they have standards and manage to achieve at high levels. The fourth rule is change policies or reorganize unexpectedly. That also keeps people on their toes. And of course, that avoids all the anxiety that might be created if you let them know in advance that a change was impending. Well, of course, to do what change masters need to do, and that is to have a future vision and assemble a team of, of backers and a team of workers to carry it out, they need some stability. They need to know who they can count on. They need to know that today's players are here tomorrow. And any place racked with those kinds of surprises, innovation shuts down for at least a year after the surprise. Because everyone says, why bet on this? I'll just do my job. You might not be around. I might not be around. Our functions might be entirely different. But when people have warning, they can guide their innovations appropriately. The fifth rule is to be control conscious. Count everything that can be counted and as often as possible. And the sixth is to never forget that you, top management, already knows everything important there is to know about this business. If you operate by those six rules, innovation is likely to be stifled in the organization. You don't have to worry about managing change or deviations from steady state because steady state is all there'll be. The last rule is particularly interesting to me because when I looked at the companies that innovated versus those that didn't, it was as though there was a culture of age in the non-innovative companies and a culture of youth in the innovation-producing companies. And I don't mean by that chronological age, although sometimes that corresponded to the age of the industry, because people at older ages are just as capable of innovation, I saw in my research, as younger ages. However, in a company dominated by age assumptions, by a culture of age, it does say wisdom resides at the top. There's nothing new to be learned. We always have a precedent. I was very struck by something the former president of General Motors, Pete Estes, said to me in a conversation. He said, you know, in the 1920s, Kettering told us we had only 10 more years of oil. Then in the 1930s, they said 10 more years. And in the 40s, 10 more, and 50s, 10 more. And you know, we stopped listening. If there are enough precedents, that's the wisdom of maturity. You've seen it happen before. You don't get excited. You don't jump to trends. You don't create a crisis and get everybody out looking for new solutions. That's the wisdom of age 
and also its downfall. So companies that are highly innovation conscious have cultures of youth where they treat every trend and idea as though it were totally new, we hadn't seen it before, how do we have to respond? They do often learn from the young as well as the old. A manager at Wang told me that his executive training program was he hired a new MBA every year and asked him what he had learned in school. That was his executive development program. But there was a reaching down to people with newer ideas and newer wisdom for ideas. General Motors was touted in Fortune magazine a few years ago for its council of elders, that is, retired officers who are available to counsel current officers. And my question to them was, where is your council of youth? Well, I would like to conclude by reading you a passage from the Change Masters, which says that this new world that we're entering, one where there's more innovation and teamwork and coalition building and flexible systems, is not one that we need to be concerned about, not one that's so different from what we already know that we can't manage to live in it. Living with change need not imply insecurity, but rather developing new forms of security. In the traditional corporation, security was based on control. It was based on knowing where everyone and everything belonged, on having categories in which to place jobs, tidy boxes on organization charts, or people, woman's place, or events, guidance by precedent. In an innovating organization, in contrast, security will come not from domination, but from flexibility. It will come not from having everything under control, but from quick reaction time, being able to cut across categories to get the best combinations of people for the job. And for the people, security will come not from staying in the same field or department or area, but from identification with the whole organization, with its unity of effort. The new security will be based on pride in individuals and their talents, reawakening or reinforcing the spirit of enterprise in all employees at all organizational levels. The corporations that will succeed and flourish in the times ahead will be those that have mastered the art of change, creating a climate encouraging the introduction of new procedures and new possibilities encouraging, anticipating, and responding to external pressures, encouraging and listening to new ideas from inside the organization. And the individuals who will succeed and flourish will also be masters of change, adept at reorienting their own and others' activities in untried directions to bring about higher levels of achievement. They will be able to acquire and use power to produce innovation. What I've described then is not a series of techniques for stimulating innovation or ways to improve productivity through a one-shot campaign, but rather attention to every aspect of an organization, its structure and design, its job strategies, its ways of rewarding and deploying people, the ways in which it makes resources, information, and support available. It's the whole system that makes a difference in whether we have innovation. And that's why integrative systems produce more of it, because the pieces articulate and work together well. To return to the roast pig problem with which I began, there's a second moral to the roast pig story that I want to share with you today. And that is that if you want to keep on eating roast pork, You'd better go whole hog. Thank you. Before we sign off, we want to invite you to send us your comments and suggestions for other programs you'd like to see. In return for writing us, we'll send you our latest catalog listing all of our materials. Just send your comments to Listen and Learn, P.O. Box 396, Old Greenwich, Connecticut, 06870. Thanks for listening. We'd be happy to listen to you, too.
motivation is the incentive for action. It's the force that influences people to do things. Today, more than ever, people want to know how to influence other people. For example, managers want to know how to motivate their workers to be more productive. Wives want to motivate their husbands to spend more time with the children. And men have been trying to motivate women throughout history. Welcome to this Listen and Learn program filled with useful information. This session is designed to sharply increase your awareness on the subject and give you ideas and knowledge that you can put to work right away. As with all Listen and Learn programs, you hear from the experts, people who have already been there and who have had success. We've structured the program to run under 45 minutes, which our research shows is the optimal listening period. So we won't take too much of your time. Of course, we can't hope to present everything there is to know in a short session like this, but we will give you all the important highlights so that you'll have a good overview when you've completed the session. For more information, listen to the message at the end of this cassette. Okay? Let's begin. Listen, learn, and enjoy. Dr. David Merrill and his colleague Roger Reed head the Tracom Corporation in Denver. They are industrial psychologists and have developed psychological measures and training systems for many major organizations around the world. They've worked with thousands of people over the past 30 years. Interviewing Dr. Merrill and Mr. Reed is Tony White, chairman of Advanced Management Reports in New York, a leader in management education. Tony? Here's the problem. Motivation is an internal force. People motivate themselves. Other people really don't. It's clear that the path to answering the question, how do I motivate others, how do I turn them on, is to switch it around and say, how can I change my behavior to avoid turning them off? Well, there's tension in any personal relationship, but by controlling the discomfort we create in others by what we say and do, we can earn their respect. We can earn their cooperation. We can earn their motivation. We can learn to motivate. One key concept to help us deal with motivation is called versatility. This has been developed by Dr. David Merrill and Roger Reed. Dave, Roger, what gets in the way of motivation? What prevents us from motivating? We find other people get in the way of one's behavior activity, which is motivated by creating some kind of tension in the relationship, by uh, putting their needs first. They keep an individual from moving in that incentive-motivated way. I'm a motivated person, and I want to get the task done that we're working on together. Um, but you come into the relationship with really some other interest or some other agenda, and I can perceive that. You don't have to hit it very hard for me to say, heck, I don't want to go along with you anymore. I'm not motivated to work with you. Uh, I'll go away somewhere else and work by myself. I think that's an important point. Everybody is motivated to do what they want to do. As such, to uh, identify what that is with that individual and then channel it towards some common objective is what we're really talking about with motivation. Often when parents or supervisors say, Charlie or Susie isn't motivated, what they're really saying is, Charlie or Susie are not doing what I would want them to do. We're not getting the behavior out of other people that we would like to get. Yeah, it's, it's an objective. We have an objective for somebody else. I want you to do something that I want you to do. And very often, the way I achieve that is to tell you what to do. That's not motivating you. That's telling you what to do. And it's, it's how do you learn to cope with that other person in such a way that you can achieve a common goal with them without just having to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. So behavior is an important aspect. How do you define behavior? Behavior is what a person does or says. Uh, we get beyond that, you begin to make it a much more complex uh, issue than it really needs to be. And why do people uh, keep behaving in ways that demotivate other people? You know, the good part of that's habit. Motivating or working with someone so that their motivation is effective is largely a matter of identifying and directing their behavior uh, in a particular way to, to accomplish a particular purpose. But it also is allowing that person to use the behaviors and the habits that they already have that they're comfortable with so that they can be maximally effective. Not only do we interfere with the other person's motivated behavior by 
directing them in a way they don't want to go toward an objective they don't want to reach but a lot of times we interfere with their motivation by asking them to perform in a way that isn't their way it's our way right. supervisors very frequently say you know, joe isn't motivated and mary isn't motivated because she isn't doing it my way and when they go to all the trouble to try to correct that they really don't change the objective they'll change what they're going to get done they just make them do it in a different way and they're not very effective sometimes right. plus they're demotivated by the change mm -hmm. it seems that people find it very difficult to change other people's behavior but it is possible to change your own behavior to stimulate or motivate or influence other people positively if you can in any relationship with another person one-on-one -on -one, you can only control one half of that relationship. In my relationship with you, I can only control my side of the relationship. So I can control what I do. If I control what I do in such a way that it impacts you positively and gets you to move in a direction I would like to have you move in, I've done something to the relationship by controlling me that achieves a common objective. And again, most people think about motivation. How do I find the other person's hot button? How do I make you do something? I really can't make you do anything. But I certainly can control the relationship that we have in such a way that I can have you achieve some common goals that we share. What are the tools and techniques that you've perhaps okay. developed? What you come to the relationship with are a set of behaviors, things that you've habitually said and done in the past that I can observe that with you. And I say, all right, he has a style a way of managing relationships and if I understand what that style is rather than changing you and having you behave another way I capitalize on it I recognize how you're behaving what you're doing and saying okay I understand how you do these things in life I'm gonna let you do it your way I'm gonna negotiate some common objective with you in such a way that you don't get defensive about it with me and in that way capitalize on the relationship and have you be motivated towards that common goal. What are some of the styles that you've observed in the past, the differences among some of the styles that you've seen in the past? Well, our procedure really breaks style down into two major dimensions uh, in terms of what you can observe about the way a person behaves. Uh, one we call assertiveness it has to do with how fast and how forceful your behavior is as opposed to how slow and perhaps how cautious it is. Uh, that is a major dimension that you can recognize in almost anyone. In fact, I defy you to describe anyone that you know without using that dimension in one way or another. Categories. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a, a continuum. The other dimension we call responsiveness, and that has to do with your display of emotion. Uh, the extent to which you reveal to me the way you feel, the extent to which you are uh, responsive to my emotion, uh, we call responsiveness. The extent to which you play poker, uh, or you're cool and aloof and don't get involved, you're business-like, that's the other end of that scale. And all the styles we talk about are combinations of positions along those two scales. I take it by trying to understand where the other person's coming from and being able to communicate with him or her on those bases, that and being versatile and cognizant and perceptive of the other person's style, you can be more effective in influencing, communicating, and perhaps motivating those other people. If nothing more, Tony, the economy of that Dave mentioned earlier is very important. If I can observe the way in which you historically have behaved and are going to behave probably right now and tomorrow, uh, and work with that, it's very much like recognizing a tool. A tool has a particular use, and if I use it for that purpose, it's going to be a good tool. If I try to change it, if I try to make it do something else, it isn't going to be very effective. And we do the same thing with people's behaviors. If you do it my way, that's the right way. Uh -huh. And uh, obviously, what we want to do is accomplish the task or meet the objective rather than specify the way that it gets done. And people do it different ways, and if you can recognize they do it different ways, tolerate that, and then capitalize on it, there's where you get your motivation. You capitalize on what they already do very well, rather than trying to change people. It's, it's rather interesting how often you see people uh, in a business situation, in fact, also in a domestic situation, recognize the strength of someone, which is just in their behavior, in what we call their style.
and love them, hire them, reward them for that, but then turn right around and punish them, reject them, and try to change them so that they'll do something else. Something the other way. That's demotivating. You've mentioned style, and I've, in reviewing your book and in your articles that you've written and have been written about you, what are the social styles that you've identified along these two axes? If you have someone who's very assertive and yet displays limited warmth and emotion, that's a driving social style. I like to use TV characters that have been around for years that people can identify with. I like to use uh, Jack Lord from the show uh, Hawaii Five-O and the role McGarrett. Mm -hmm. You know, a very action-oriented, uh, dynamic kind of person who's telling other people what to do all the time, uh, but showing very little warmth or friendliness. As a matter of fact, uh, I think the only time I saw him have a love affair with a lady in that show some years back was he had to arrest her in the last scene, you know, and he, he wasn't very friendly even there. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you contrast that with, with a style that is still pushing hard and asserting a lot, but making fun and trying to be personal, I like to use uh, Johnny Carson, and uh, it, it, we classify that as an expressive style. You see, he's got some more warmth, the more friendliness. He's, he'll talk about his personal life on television, but he'll also dress up as a lady or bust a board over his head or do something to get a laugh. But he's still uh, quite assertive. I notice he never unbuttons his coat. Oh, and does he control the timing and pace of that show, right? If you look for someone who's less assertive but warm, I like to use Perry Como. Mr. Nice Guy, the amiable, the fellow you invite in your home at Christmas and, and, and uh, uh, Thanksgiving time and the family sits around the fire and it's kind of a leisurely, comfortable uh, setting and you can picture the amiableness about that. And then, um, although he's not regularly on television, he does specials all the time, uh, Eric Severide, mm -hmm. who's a less assertive person, but uh, kind of serious, doesn't smile very often when you see him on camera, uh, an analytical style. So you have four styles. That's the, the driving style, the, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, expressive, expressive the, the amiable, amiable and, and analytical. And analytical. Mm -hmm. Now, now for just, just to give you a contrast, what would happen if uh, on the Hawaii Five-O show, uh, Jack Lord retired and they wanted to replace McGarrett, what would happen to that show if they had elected to use Perry Como as a McGarrett? How would you like to watch the Tonight Show for 90 minutes with Eric Severide as your host? You know, your expectation isn't that behavior. And yet all of those people are successful and have been throughout their entire career. So success is not a matter of style. What are some of the characteristics that are related to the various styles? Let's take the driving style. What are some of the characteristics you associate with that style? Okay, the first characteristic is on that, uh, that uh, assertiveness scale. Uh, here's a person who's going to reach toward an objective very quickly, uh, establish the goal without an awful lot of forethought, but move toward it in an action-oriented kind of way. Um, in relation to other people, uh, very businesslike, uh, the task is the important thing, the relationships come later, perhaps earned if the task is accomplished. And in a sense, we're now talking about the whole subject here and the, the way in which a driver might move to work with other people. It's very impersonal. And on that basis, it could be demotivating or at least not motivating to someone who needs strokes right up front. Yeah. The driver understood, perhaps, a little more clearly that some of the other people he's dealing with have other styles. He could be more effective in getting his will across. Right. So that's the point. And that's the point of the book. That's uh, the point of our courses. Is that's to the point of it, knowing what your style is. All right. So if we have an idea of what our own style is and we try to figure out the respective styles of the people we're trying to influence and motivate, that's sort of the bottom line here. The bottom line is that the first bottom line, of course, like anything else, you add up results sure. as you go through something. But the first bottom line is for the individual to understand their own behavior and the effect they have upon others. Let's keep going along, and, and so that those who are with us will really understand the characteristics of these four styles. Uh, I interrupted you about the driver. Tell me some more about the driver. Many times the driver does not recognize that the speed at which they choose goals and the speed at which they 
push to reach goals uh, can be a problem for other people who aren't comfortable with maybe the decision in the first place and the pace that they have to follow in the second place. Uh, that impersonal characteristic can cause some people to think that the driver really doesn't care about them. Well, I know what's right. I've decided what we ought to do. Uh, let's go do it, troops. And uh, we know that people get demotivated by that kind of behavior. I'd like to have some ownership in the project. I'd like to feel that I had an idea that was pretty good and that the driver would accept that from me. The driver moves right out. I know what I want to do, what the objective is. Uh, let's go get it done, troops. Uh, much like Patton, definitely a driving style. We're going to take the hill. And, and I'll tell you how it's done, and uh, there's no question about it, I'm right. One of the most frequently heard comments or complaints, I think, about drivers is that with that speed and that independent decision, it looks like they're changing direction. In fact, indeed, they are because they're moving in a direction that they thought was right today, and two days later they make a correction. Meanwhile, someone else is thinking about it or started working on it, and they feel they wasted their effort. Mm -hmm. And without recognizing that, again, the driving people style... People are accused of changing priorities a lot. I, uh, yes. For, in, yeah. by, by others in their organizations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And insensitive to the effect that has on other people in the organization. Yeah, you know, from that driver's point of view, he's saying, well, I, I have seen a new light today, and let's move toward it without recognizing that there's some people still moving in that other direction, and then failing because, again, the lack of personal awareness of maybe taking the time to say, gee, I'm sorry I'm changing direction on you. Uh, I'm sorry that we maybe sort of wasted yesterday, but here's a better idea, and I appreciate your moving with me. Mm -hmm. Oh, we've gotten more information, and that's why we're the, the, the rationale. Driver just sort of expects the other person to understand by osmosis. What about the expressive style? Are there some characteristics related to the expressive style? The expressive style, style is still the action-oriented, uh, high pace kind of person, but the, it's full of feeling. It's full of relationships. It's, let's have fun. If you're not having fun doing your no. job, it's not worth it. And uh, it's more a matter of uh, getting into the relationship and, and using the relationship first before the task is accomplished. You know, if we get to know each other well, and this is what we want to do and we have fun doing it, that's really great. Again, those people, though, move fast and change yes. objectives fast, but usually they're related to who is going to be unhappy about the objective. Whose feelings are going to be hurt? Who do we need to care about? And uh, that caring about and being concerned with the feelings is, is ahead of the task now. We say the expressive is spontaneous, and the complaint here is less a matter of changing priorities in terms of the task. And the spontaneous thing, many times it, it's a change of relationship. Uh, a great deal of enthusiastic uh, relationship going on with, with person X. That and kind of brings person X into it, and they're motivated, you might say. But tomorrow, it's person Y. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's the contact in the relationship. And many times, rather than being criticized because they change priorities, they're criticized because they have superficial loyalties. In fact, they have deep loyalties, but the behavior again on top, which is what we're looking at, uh, is the what people go to. It's not really how people are, it's how they're perceived. That's the right. skillful, expressive in our culture is most often credited with being the motivator of people. That is the inspirational speaker from the platform. It's the inspirational person who, who puts stories together and tells stories about people and their successes and their relationships and, and tugs at your heartstrings and makes you feel the story. You cry or you laugh or you cheer or you clap or you wave a flag. That's what many people associate with the whole idea of motivation. Uh, usually those, those inspirational talks as fun as they are to experience them for the moment, don't take you anywhere except maybe uplift your attitude for the moment. But you may need another shot of that tomorrow or the next day or the next day to keep your attitude up. Uh, the history of the person will indeed tell you how that person was likely to behave tomorrow in terms of style. It's particularly predictable in situations where there is some tension. Uh, the, the need to uh, relieve that tension is going to cause that person to revert back to that style, that behavior, which has been effective well, in the what past. What causes tension in the, in the relationships between people? Well, I think there are two things there. One is the task that they achieve to 
together. Uh, there is some tension coming from that, and that's very positive and it's directed. And that's the sort of thing that we would like people to be pay attention to because that relates to the motivation we're talking about. But on the other hand, there can be tension between the styles just because the difference is there. As we've said, the Hebrew, the expressive, and the driver can be just as too fast for some people. Well, let's, let's contrast the expressive for a minute now, that That's inspirational good. person with my Eric Severide, who's the analytical person. And, and the Eric Severide is likely to watch that fast-moving, emotional talk about feelings and say, I'm not so sure about this person because they're doing something to my feelings that I'm not comfortable with and they're handling people relationships in a way that causes me to shun it and back away and you can almost see that expressive who might be dressed in a Johnny Carson suit and a colorful tie and alligator shoes walk into Eric Severide's office where he has a pinstripe suit on and, and, and a white shirt and very conservative tie and you almost can see him back away as the person comes through the door just the visual of watching that, that, that Johnny Carson appearance is scary. So the expressive for, perhaps could use uh, by saying, let's study this. What are the facts? Let's use tone down the way right. I approach strangers, mm -hmm. strangers until I understand something about how they like to be treated. Uh, rather than coming on too strong, too fast, doing my thing that pleases me, why don't I think about what is going to happen in this relationship and what can I do to me now, my side of the relationship, that might please the recipient of my message? And then I might tone down my suit a little bit and I might wear a pinstripe even though when I'm doing my thing on the weekend or when I'm calling on people that I know, uh, I might wear any kind of flashy clothes I'd like. There are four factors in there, and one of them is image, and it has to do with the way you do dress. Um, and you, you manage that. You know that when you get up on Monday morning and you're going to go visit the banker today that you should wear your three-piece pinstripe. On the other hand, you know that you're going to go to a pool party on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, you don't wear a pinstripe. You, you do wear the, the funny lobster pants and the t-shirts, you know, because <laughs> it's appropriate. Uh, that expresses we talked about earlier also then goes let's go to the next step image is the first part of what it takes to earn endorsement we say presentation is the second part the expressive needs to learn that when he walks in Eric Severide's office the analytical's office uh, he doesn't throw open the door and say hi it's great to see you slap him on the back because that's liable to put him off and Dave said you can almost see them back off. I get put off by those people who call you on the phone from brokerage houses and other places who, uh, without ever having met me before, use my first name and it seems like they're my best friend already and they're trying to sell me something. I, you know, I, I am offended by that and they have no appreciation for the fact that my style you, does not permit you to move in and get that close that fast with me on a first name basis. Now with some people, I'm sure with, with maybe a third or a fourth of the population they call, that techniques works. But for me, you just got your ear hurt because I'm going to bang the phone down on you. You just don't call me Dave and say, hi, how you doing today? I'm Charlie so-and-so with such and such a firm and isn't this a wonderful day? The next thing he needs to learn how to deal with is what we call the competence factor. Uh, there are cases where you, you wave your competence around and show it to people. You're a, you're a data processing uh, person or an engineer or something of that sort. Much of your endorsement's based on your competence. That's how uh, you communicate your competence too, Roger. The book is written in such a way that we are talking about, we're using our knowledge of people and human behavior and giving some stories and displaying them in such a way that the reader understands where they're coming from, how this can work. So you have to take your competence and deliver it in such a way that you talk in the language of your audience. Let's just contrast the expressive with the analytical for a minute. The analytical wants to move a little slower, wants to see the facts, uh, wants to have you leave some things behind that they can study. So if you're, you're selling that person, you prepare for that in advance. Whereas if you're selling the expressive, they want to see a little flash, a little flare, a little inspiration, something that's exciting and stimulating up front, and you prepare for that. You do both with both people, but it's how do you get into the relationship or how do you sequence that relationship to capitalize on what's going to happen. Very interesting. Now, you mentioned there are four 
uh, factors. And we've gone through image presentation, competence. What's the fourth? Fourth one is feedback. And that's kind of the ultimate skill that we're trying to teach people in using social style because you can, by observing behavior, uh, using what the other person does as information, uh, use that as feedback to yourself in terms of am I doing this right? Uh, do I know this person well enough in terms of style? Some of the tools and techniques that people who are competent in, in managing these styles use to get that kind of feedback? First off, they do just observe the way the other person behaves. Part of the, the clue that we teach them is to don't behave first. Let the other person do something. Put them on stage. Are you saying to me if I'm a salesperson, I'm not the first one to talk? Is that what you're telling me? Uh, that's what I'm saying beyond the, the ice-breaking stage where you say, good morning, hello, how are you, kind of thing. Uh, many salespeople make the mistake of jumping right into their pitch without finding to whom they are pitching. And yes, Which, which are the four Let me understand, Roger, how you might do that. One of, one of the things that we teach in our class, of course, is that the individual who should be learning something about the, un the other individual does what we call behavior interview. You begin to ask the other person some questions. Rather than pitching your product, you ask them some questions about themselves. You ask them some questions which will lead you to understand what they want from certainly the interview you're having now. But the important thing is to find out how they behave. Do they come on quickly? Uh, do they come on with a lot of open emotion and expression? Uh, are they very businesslike in their approach? Do they, do they ask for facts? These things are more important to you in terms of how you make your pitch many times than knowledge of your product. This is, uh, in negotiating, we'd call this a precondition. You'd almost say, what, what are the preconditions of the way I make my presentation? You see, what you do in a feedback loop is, is check the message you sent uh, after you send it and then you give the individual who received the message to, to ask any questions and verify the message that they're sending back. And you do that at a variety of levels. You do that at not only the knowledge level, did you understand, but you also do it at the feeling level. How well did you feel about the message I sent? And did you understand what my intent was? And it's, it's that looping back and forth and checking the communication as you go along uh, earlier I was trying to do that a little bit with Roger, yeah. you might have picked up on it. Are you really saying the salesperson shouldn't be the first one to talk? I was, I was trying to, to demonstrate that uh, what you're doing is, is going back and saying, did I hear you correctly? You see, what he did is he made me talk. I see. By asking, by using mm -hmm. the tool of asking rather than telling. Right, in and, and, and very powerful. Well, your best salespeople will all tell you that the, one of the most powerful techniques they have are asking questions. Another one of the most powerful techniques in closing a sale, when you understand you're ready to close a sale, is silence. And not doing anything. You know, allowing the person to have some space and some room. And uh, sometimes it seems forever, but they'll say something. Now, please turn over the cassette to continue. How would someone uh, who is interested in being more effective in communicating and being more effective in motivating uh, deal with the other three styles? Well, first, uh, I don't think we can overemphasize for any of the styles uh, the extent to which knowing the impact of your own style 
is important. Mm -hmm. Too many people will use information like this, ideas and concepts like these, to attempt to manipulate, to try to do something with the other person in a relationship without being fully aware of their own impact and the necessity to control their half of the relationship, as we put it. I think it's a very important concept to put in here somewhere. Now, with regard to the amiable specifically, the amiable's behavior is, is in comparison to the styles we've talked about, uh, a much slower person to get off the ground, much more cautious in their approach, uh, very less likely to be forceful about anything uh, early in the game, although they can be later on. Their emphasis of relationships is very important. Constantly looking for reinforcement for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Tell me I'm right. Tell me I'm a target. Tell me you are... are appreciate my yeah, worth. You're pleased with what Tell me I'm you're doing. pleased with the way I'm doing it. Uh, and so uh, they could be back uh, three or four times in the course of a day even on a given assignment checking to make sure that everything is still right. The word security is very important in understanding and amiable's needs that uh, are present in their motivated behavior. I would suspect these are the kind of people you find in the larger companies, for example. Uh, is that, well, is that, is it depends. That? You know, uh, I have a, a theory. I don't know, Roger, we've talked about this before. That first generation in a company is usually uh, uh, got a driving style associated with it. Uh, when we start looking at how a junior grows up in the company, very often the, the, the head of that company in the second generation is much more amiable in style. He's gone off to the best schools and he's kind of always pleased daddy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when you look at second generation, even in small companies, you find a very charming, delightful, easygoing uh, person who's uh, done some things quite different than the way daddy did them. Now, the, and again, the behavior of the amiable with the emphasis on relationships does frequently include a lot of joining and belonging. Mm -hmm. And within an organization, they tend to foster that belongingness there. You see a lot more of the group activity, the meetings and the team activities where amiables are... And again, are that being. can be very powerful. Uh, again, if you understand what your objectives are, can be very powerful to motivate a certain segment of the audience, but they can lose a segment now. Yeah, but, you know, they're so less likely to change direction than the two styles we talked about earlier. Uh, they can provide an element of stability in an organization. They're more likely to, to sit at a job and do it while all kinds of chaos goes on around them mm -hmm. uh, without getting involved in it as long as it doesn't affect their personal security because continuity means security to them. I think the other thing that might be helpful to recognize is that in Western culture, the United States particularly, but Western culture, that the, the macho stereotype of the, the aggressive, uh, dynamic, ongoing person is associated with our driving style. Mm -hmm. However, uh, I think we, when we look at other cultures, um, and even maybe specifically the, the uh, uh, Japanese culture, you know, you don't have to have that macho driving style to have an organization function. Uh, How that would you characterize that Japanese, uh, it's, the Japanese? It's closer towards our amiable model. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, uh, so that in Everyone our culture, to get together. ahead, you have to be a driver. Maybe in another culture, you do not have to be. Mm -hmm. Plus, recognizing that working together provides strength. And, uh, you know, they've demonstrated pretty significantly, I think, to us that they can make a very high-quality product and compete in the world marketplace, and they don't have any of the raw materials over there. They must be doing something. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's a little different from what we've considered to be the right way. Of course, they're to very motivate people. They're very cognizant of the way we like to be turned on too by oh, uh, offering just the right kind of products to our market. Do they know how to do that? And are they patient about it and careful about it? And do they work together in teams to get it done? Mm -hmm. And uh, do they capitalize on the relationship side, inside the company as well as out? I do think we might mention with regard to the amiable and the expressive, and that is that their sensitivities for other people can be a very valuable asset in any team corporate kind of effort. Uh, the people like the drivers and the analyticals who are looking at the task and the technology sometimes just and overlook uh, what, the, what the customers are about sometimes or some of the morale problems that are arising. So an amiable can be very, very useful because of the sensitivity they have. We would say the strongest organizations are the organizations that have a nice mix of all at, these four. Of the styles and appreciate the mix, capitalize on that mix, utilize it, rather than saying being driver or amiable or expressive or analytical is better. If you understand having that mix in the organization and you know how to use the resource, 
in the many, many companies you uh, deal with in, in trying to get these points across, what are some of the tools and techniques you use to make presentations to companies and getting some of these tools? Well, the first tool, of course, is, is running a social style profile, and, and that's unique in that instead of having the, the manager or the salesperson uh, fill out a form that they fill out, self-report, I think I'm this kind of a person, and I answer like, you send a checklist to uh, five of your friends. Uh, we usually say three inside the company, the any ones you want to pick that you work with, and a few outside the company. And they check off on the checklist adjectives like whether you're bold or quiet or forceful or easygoing. Uh, and uh, that's all fed into a computer, and what you get back in class is a picture of what other people see you doing. And that's the starting place. And it's a very powerful tool because I picked my five friends and now they're reporting back to me what they see me doing and how they see me behaving. And very often people are a little surprised. They say, son of a gun, uh, you know, I, I thought I was so-and-so. They had an expectation in their head. And technically, as a psychologist, it's been interesting to me to recognize that there's very little overlap between a person's self-report, what they will put down on paper about themselves, and what others say about them. They're it's really important to understand the perspective that, uh, and the perception that other people have about you. Very important. Matter of fact, if you're going to succeed with other people, it's more important to know what your audience thinks than what you think. And of course, people like actors uh, have a unique place in our culture. They, they get feedback immediately in the sense of applause. Right. And if, if they don't get or enough applause, or... they close the show, right? right? <laughs> uh, but, but the good ones come back time and time again because they're being reinforced for the way they're behaving. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're saying in our classes is understand who your audience is. If it's subordinates or children or students in a classroom, understand what they see. That's the starting place and then capitalize on what they see. Don't try to change it. Well, your habits are well established now. You can't change them very much. Well, when managers uh, don't uh, express concern about others, that does raise the tensions. and People really get defensive and can't be productive. In your uh, material, you have something you call the, pr the platinum rule. What, what's that all about? Now we're we're taking some liberties with the golden rule, which of course everyone's familiar with in terms of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, that leads to the kind of thing we were talking about earlier where the manager would say, do it my way. Uh, platinum rule is do unto others as they would have you do unto them. Uh, <laughs> work with them the way they like to be worked with. And again, we say learn their style, uh, learn their pace, learn their emotional preferences, and don't get in the way of that. Right. Use that as an asset in dealing with them. Recognize that most people's styles have developed over a number of years. We're working with adults, so we can say over 20 years or more in most cases. Uh, that's pretty well ingrained, and there's no point in but going against these, the grain. Where do these styles initially come from? Are they from heredity or environment? What have well, you? Uh, I think that's, a, you know, you don't know precisely the answer to that question. Obviously, it's both. You, how you come into the world with some kind of heredity and that, uh, that tends to set you off in a specific direction and then of course your environment and the way the parents respond to the child the child grows up uh, also influences it. I think we're pretty well convinced by the time you're five or six years old the pattern of how you handle relationships whether you tend to withdraw when there's tension or whether you tend to fight when there's tension those patterns are pretty well set early in life and although you find people experimenting when they get into their teenage years with different ways of behaving because they see some things work for their peers that they'd like to have work for them they tend ultimately to fall back to the patterns that were established long before they got into their teenage years so the pattern is well established early in life we talked before about the difference between the driving style and the expressive style and talked a little bit about analytical and amiable, but let's go into a little more about the analytical style and, and the amiable. All right, let's go back to the Eric Severide image in terms of the person who is less assertive, a kind of approaches things in a problem-solving, questioning, let's think about it and puzzle over it and have our facts straight without pushing too hard to tell you what you should or shouldn't do, we'll analyze it for you and help you understand and then say, well, choose what you want to do. So the analytical is a less assertive person 
a more uh, deliberate person in terms of processing facts, information, data, also withdrawn from the relationship. I'll kind of sit and be above the relationship and have my ideas stand on their own merit rather than having to inject emotion into them. So that what you physically see with an analytical is a rather poker face kind of person. Not much animation. And the vice president of finance personnel. Very, sort of. very often yeah, in no, corporations you find uh, analyticals who are in finance and accounting. You also find people in technical careers, engineers who mm -hmm. are, are high specialists in a very technical career. And there are a lot of engineers who are pretty expressive and a lot of artists who are pretty analytical. I think the, the major thing about dealing with an analytical is rather than uh, try to get them to move in a particular direction or try to get them to display a kind of a relationship sort of thing, uh, the need in working with them is to have them understand. There is great need to think through the problem and have an understanding of it before they will be comfortable doing anything about it. I remember I used to uh, have an executive vice president who was probably an analytical, and whenever I would make notes on the back of an envelope and say, here's the solution, he would go crazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, the when fact I, that you could do it that fast, and you hadn't thought about it. Now, if you'd go, even if you had the solution immediately, if you'd said, you know, boss, I want to think about that, tomorrow I'll get back to you. And if you'd gone home and just jotted down your conclusion on a piece of paper and then put a whole stack of backup information underneath it that really led to that fast conclusion you had and set it on his desk the next morning, he would have really been impressed with your behavior because you were now treating him the way he would like to be treated. You're, you're understanding that in the relationship and you're processing your behavior. See so what you controlled? You controlled you and brought back information that would please him and, and that makes your behavior more credible to him. You've motivated him. Once I began observing this reaction to my uh, quick decision, he came in one day and he posed a problem. And rather than giving him a quick answer, I said, I think we ought to study that for three or oh, four days. Is, and his eyes opened up like he, he finally got to the point where he said, oh, I understand now how to do it. You, you yeah. have gotten well. You've been sick for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever style a person has, driving, expressive, analytical, amiable, um, we all have to do the same things. As managers, we have to plan, organize, direct control, and so on. Uh, as salespeople, we have to make contact and persuade. Uh, the what we do in a job is probably pretty well described by the job. The way we do it, however, is very much dependent upon the behavior, habits, the style that we've developed over the years. The way that we then need to get better is recognize that and recognize there are other people and it isn't right for them. And when we behave our way, we create attention with probably three out of four people every day because our behavior is different. Is this the whole basis of the versatility idea? And sure. Uh, versatility starts with understanding what is the impact I have on other people. And then it moves to do I care about that impact? And then it moves to do, am I able to do something about it? You know, will I control me in some way? So that the fact that I care about the impact I have, I'm doing something about it kind of thing. And if you get to that point, then you are able to say, all right, I'm going to treat you in such a way that minimizes the likelihood you will get defensive with me. Because if you get defensive, you're going to fight me or run away from me. Uh, the relationship will be destroyed and the objective won't be met. So I'm going to think about that in advance and say, how can I treat you in such a way that you're not going to be offended by my behavior? This is the practice of that platinum rule. How do I work with you the way you would like to be worked with so that we can then both focus our attention on the job that has to be done instead of how to jockey with each other? And all the barriers have been removed. Well, not all. <laughs> That's going a little too far. And, and temporarily, too. We, we well, how can we remove most of them? Okay. I think the important thing is to get started on the right foot. 
Uh, as we said earlier in our discussion about how to approach a sales relationship, uh, if, if you walk into my office and you slap me on the back and grab me by the hand and twist it off, uh, you got off to a bad start and you probably are never even going to get into your presentation. Even if you have the good product. Because I suddenly found another appointment that's going to interfere with this sales call today. Uh, so you get off on the right foot is a very important first step. Once we then recognize the other person's style, do some of the right things, so the tension between us is not eliminated but minimized, uh, then we can perhaps just both of us relax. Now, that doesn't mean the tension isn't going to always be there. And rising and falling is you have your way for a while and I have my way for a while. But if we're both exercising the skills we're talking about, we're reading the feedback. It's amazing how often a salesperson, for example, will watch someone across the table begin to tap his foot. Or look in the corner yeah, of the room. Anyway, I'm, I'm right. ready to move it's on. Over. To the next time. Yeah. yeah, either uh, that or you you just lost me, fella. And so frequently the salesman's reaction is panic, and that tension he feels and it causes him to revert back to his presentation, and he leans a little harder and just pushes that person farther away. What we would say he should do is stop right there, recognize what's happening, observe it, and say something like, "Am I moving too fast for you?" Yeah. Or do you, you know, I'm going to ask for feedback. I want to know. I'm sending a message, and I see your pencil tapping. Uh, tell me what that is. Is that tapping? Do you have another appointment? Is it timely? Uh, do you have to get on to something else? You ask for permission to move back, and the person invariably will tell you. And it's just a matter of stopping and saying, you're, you're really saying, these are not the words now, you're really saying, I recognize there's some tension there. I see it. I want to deal with it. How can I help? Mm -hmm. You see, it's, it's there all the time, but you want to manage it. As the, as the relationship progresses, you can see it go up and down. It's just kind of like a scale, a balance wheel. You have to have a little tension to motivate people, but you don't want the tension so great that it gets in the way of the objective. So you're, you're trying to balance it as the relationship moves, and you're watching what's happening in the relationship and saying, what can I do to be helpful? Frequently, people will push back from the table and fold their arms, which uh, oh, sometimes good. indicates I'm pulling down the shade. I'm, mm -hmm. um, I'm really not participating in this conversation anymore. By asking the person to get back into the conversation, by asking them to participate, by well, how do you feel about it, uh, can accomplish that same objective. Or you watch a person frown, and you might pick up on that and just stop and say, I noticed you nodding your head or I noticed you frowning was there a question about something I just said you just now stopped what you were doing and asked for feedback so you could say am I on track am I off track can I somehow or other facilitate this communication so we can move towards that common objective because something just happened it's so important to stay at that behavioral level and say, I noticed a change or, or ask a question about where you are at this particular time. It would be so easy, as you indicated there, to interpret that you have stopped listening and you're no longer interested. Uh, proper interpretation might be you have all the information you need and the salesman made. If I just stop right now and find out. So by staying at the behavioral level and getting that feedback loop going, uh, you can make a lot more progress many times than making false interpretations. That old, that old saying, uh, stop selling once you've gotten the order. That's yes, the that could and be the focus. And something else, which we, we mention in our book and, and hit in class, don't read into other people's behavior. Don't assume you understand their motives or what they're feeling or thinking. Maybe they're leaning back and sitting up because they ate something for lunch that's giving them a little indigestion. It doesn't go back to their early childhood. <laughs> and it doesn't go back to deep-seated needs or feelings and may not have anything to do with the relationship in the room. Uh, I think sometimes we get too involved in saying, what am I doing right or wrong? And they try to analyze relationships and attach motives to it. We're saying stay on the outside of people's heads, watch their face, their eyes, their frowns, their nods, their hands, their leaning back, leaning forward, but don't attribute anything to what they're doing. Just ask. Mm -hmm. Just guess for some feedback. What are you feeling? What are you thinking? Thinking. You see, we almost have a sequence of things that we're teaching people when we are trying to get them to increase their versatility. Uh, first, by being attentive to themselves. Uh, they aren't going to create as much tension in the relationship as they might if they just blundered along doing some wrong things. The second part is then shifting to doing things for the other person. 
They've done something to themselves temporarily to get the relationship off on the right foot. Then they do something for the other person by first knowing what that other person requires, using style as a clue to that. Uh, after they've played that along for a little while, keeping the tension under their managed control, uh, then they can start working on the objective. Uh, it doesn't take as long as we're talking about. Many times this kind of thing can be going in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, but just then, by being perceptive to By just steps. being perceptive. Uh, the sequence probably concludes somewhere in the person who's trying to earn endorsement doing something that's very hard to do because he has to keep that level of interaction going and, and not lose it mm -hmm. when the other person creates tension for them. Let them have a chance to, to express feeling content in that message. And then you reflect it back and say, I understand that what you just said was so-and-so. Is that right? And how do you feel about it? And how do you feel about it? So one of those skills is just the whole skill of being able to listen correctly and keep that communication loop going. And that is, is helped quite a bit by the development of tolerance for style. One of the first things we see happen in a workshop uh, is awareness that, yeah, you're different, but you're all right. Your style is different from mine, but there are some strengths in that. In fact, we frequently find that analytic will look and expressive and wish she had some of that. He's so stimulating, and yet the analytic will... When they're contributing to the workshop, the expressive can look across and say, you know, I wish I'd thought of it or thought it through that carefully. And if you can put that team together in the work environment where one can be stimulating and, and fast-paced and exciting to the audience, but the other can be sure that everything that's communicated is right and been thought through, you have a powerful team. Mm -hmm. If it's a matter I don't like you because you're different or I can't communicate with you for some reason, then the team falls apart. Mm -hmm. Once I have the tolerance to see for the other style, it's much easier to use those tools of versatility. Once I recognize that, that maybe you are a little bit different from me, but you probably have some pretty good ideas, and that your feelings are genuine, then it's easier for me to do some listening, and pay attention, and find out where you come from. Well, Dave and Roger, we've talked about the four styles, driving, uh, the expressive style, the amiable style, the analytical style. We've talked about the four parts of versatility, uh, taking into consideration your image, the presentation, the competence factor, the feedback loop. I'd like to maybe uh, reemphasize a point that I made just a moment ago, but to uh, generalize on it a little bit. We do find that all styles have their strengths. All styles have their weaknesses. Uh, we have no reason from volumes of data now to believe that one style is better than another. Uh, a little bit surprising to us originally because we had our stereotypes too in terms of how different styles fit into different job categories. But generally we find as long as the individual is sensitive and has those characteristics, or I should say those skills, that uh, we find leads to versatility, uh, then they can probably succeed anywhere they go. We do find that versatility as a measurement of one's ability to earn endorsement uh, is also highly related to their ability to succeed in almost any position that requires interpersonal skills and competence. I guess I, uh, for years, told a little story about trying to raise corn in my backyard, and uh, if I don't know how to do that, it's kind of like you asking me how to motivate somebody. I will know how to raise corn, so I'd call you up, Tony, and I'd say, Tony, tell me how to raise corn. You'd say, well, put it out in your backyard, Dave. It'll grow in Colorado. So I go out in the back porch and throw it out in the backyard, and five minutes, a bird eats it, and I call you back. I say, hey, Tony, that wasn't a very good idea. I put it out in the yard, and the bird ate it, and you say, Merrill, you're not very smart. Uh, why don't you uh, put it in the ground? I say, oh, that's great, Tony. I'll put it in the ground. So I dig a hole three foot deep, and I throw the corn in there, and I pile the dirt on top of it and very patiently wait all year for it to grow. Nothing happens. I call you back at the end of the year, and you say to you, Tony, the corn didn't grow, and you ask a few questions, and you say, three foot deep? You say, Merrill, you're not too smart. Let me show you. So you take me by the hand into the backyard where there's a sunny spot and we turn over the dirt and we build little mounds and we put kernels of corn and fertilizer and you put me on a watering schedule. And sure enough, the corn grows and I harvest it. Now, when I finally harvest the corn, can I say I made it grow? Not really. The first kernels I threw out there had potential for growth. The second kernels had potential for growth. I just treated them wrong. 
what you have to recognize in motivating human behavior is you can't make them grow. You can't make them do what you want them to do. Recognize what it is you're dealing with, the kernel that's there, the behavior that's there. Accept it for what it is, and then be a good gardener. Provide the right sun and the right moisture and the right light. And, you know, there has to be enough heat for the kernel to, to grow so they land it at the right depth. So you take people and treat them the same way. You, you say, okay, it's got to be enough heat to make you grow. You've got to have an objective. We know what you have to accomplish and put it in the right climate. So by controlling climate, and I say the most important thing in anyone's climate, is the gardener. And every manager, every supervisor, every parent is a gardener. To the extent you garden better, by behaving in a way that's appropriate to the seeds you've planted, you motivate behavior. Before we sign off, we want to invite you to send us your comments and suggestions for other programs you'd like to see. In return for writing us, we'll send you our latest catalog listing all of our materials. Just send your comments to Listen and Learn, P.O. Box 396, Old Greenwich, Connecticut, 06870. Thanks for listening. We'd be happy to listen to you, too.